This boy is being sent on a mission to enter enemy lines, but the catch is the enemy are all girls. He's stuck in a world where men live in one nation, while the women live on the other half of the continent. Currently, the girls actually rule the world and are stronger, where they call themselves foxes, while the guys call themselves the wolves. Regardless, this boy's mission is to resupply one of the strongest special teams of the wolves, rumored to have a winning record against the foxes. It's then revealed that if the foxes catches any strong men, then they'll be punished with a rice cake smashing to extract seas before being finished off. Out of 100, maybe only two get to experience the special treatment, but the rest just gets annihilated. Upon making it to the halfway point, the group encounter a town with no men on guard, so they begin to be on high alert, scared that the foxes might be nearby. The squadron then take a closer look, only to realize that most of the boys are already knocked unconscious. So the leader spurs into action as he motions two squads to search the area, while one squad looks for anyone still somehow conscious. Our boy then checks multiple people knocked out, where he discovers that everyone is still breathing, confirming the rumors that the foxes do not harm regular men or weak men. Nonetheless, his buddy got no brains, but at least he's super brave, so he starts running into rooms, yelling for the girls to come out. Eventually, they find a special member of a tot unit, so they attempt to help him to see if they can do anything. But as they check on the guy, light begins to pour out of a mysterious room after a body suddenly gets thrown out of the window. Simultaneously, the guy they were trying to help looks up, murmuring to them to get the heck out, as these boys have no chance against the enemy. He then smirks, revealing to them that they're still here, the legendary Crimson Foxes. We then learn that the boy's name is Herring, and unfortunately for him, his bonehead friend wants to see a girl for the first time. Being a virgin will do this to someone, so he rushes on, hoping to be strong enough to get captured, just so he can experience the rice cake smashing himself. Herring then tries to use logic to reason with him to no avail, as his friend never got to experience the stage like clarity after exploding. With no other choice, Herring follows his friend, probably because he wants to experience the rice cake as well, not wanting to be deprived of the opportunity. Upon heading outside the building, they get shocked as they witness everyone, including the leader, is on the ground, unconscious without them even getting to hear any commotion. Suddenly, a girl with insane speed comes out of nowhere, trying to ambush the two as we discover her to be a crimson fox. In literally one second, he gets clapped and knocked out, but at least he got to look at what a girl looks like. Unfortunately, the one girl he got to look at isn't even a pretty one since she looks like somebody from the Twilight movies. While knocked out in the dream dimension, Herring begins to recall a moment he had with his father. He then recalls the memory with his father where he warns him that if he ever encounters the legendary Crimson Foxes, he must do one thing. The one thing? He must use a special move to turn his face into a sussy baker capable of lowering the attack of the foxes. Now remember the special move he gains consciousness, but he finds himself confused, wondering why a bag is over his head. A girl then whispers to him, telling him that he's finally awake so she also removes the bag from his head. He then looks up to see the girl, but he can only see the outlines of her as she orders him to cooperate or the girls outside will punish him harshly. Upon closer look, she gets smitten by his attractiveness, so she takes a moment to take it all in. But our boy didn't forget his one special move, so he activates it without hesitation. Somehow, it seems to actually work as the girl's heart begins to pound just like my heart when I eat anything fatty. Herring then gets startled, as he hears someone making weird sounds to his right, so he investigates. Upon taking a closer look, his world gets shattered, as his bonehead friend is currently on a scenic bike ride with a crimson girl. He always hoped that the rice cake attacks were not just rumors, so right in front of his eyes, one of his dreams are proven true. His friend then looks lifeless, as one of the crimson foxes attempts to extract every siege he can from the banana plantation. Afterwards, he looks away flustered, but like a true Sigma male, he stares straight at the girl in front of him. But she only stares back, busy thinking to herself what to do, as her partner in crime on the other hand is busy going ham, as if she's sucking the soul out of him. Eventually, she finally says something, so she mentions how they don't really have much time, thus, she must get on with it. She then reveals to him that she knows it's obviously both of their first time, but since she's stronger, she takes the lead and puts on the pants in the relationship. As if he's a banana, she rips off the banana peel and continues to urge him to stay calm the entire time, warning him that he might get hurt if he doesn't. Upon ripping off the banana peel, the girl thinks to herself that the rumors are true, the wolves actually don't wear any undies exactly like what a true savage would do. She then wonders why the banana plantation isn't grown yet, since his friend had a fully grown plantation before they even got to do anything. So to make it fair, she does the same banana peeling to herself, just to help the plantation get started as they are running out of time. And just like that, as he gets to see a real rice cake and more, the banana plantation begins to react as if it's a spaceship ready to blast off into space. A flashback then occurred, 
back to the times of Herring's grandpa. There, he told the story of a boy who got captured by the Crimson Foxes within one month of joining the supply group, but they found him two days after, with his life sucked out, making him never the same. It then turns out that after they extract the seeds, they turn back into their childlike forms, stuck there, forever. Back to the present, with the girl showcasing everything she has, Herring calls her twin dragons beautiful, even though he knows his life is basically over with his plantation turning into a rocket. She then gets shocked, as if her eyes were deceiving her, totally not expecting a behemoth to appear. Meanwhile, off in the distance, a mysterious man shrouded in black appears with a sword, looking like he's a grown-up Kirito. He then looks on from afar, ready to complete his mission by himself, while Herring gets ready to start clapping. However, he notices a white flash not too far from him, and only one person in the world could be that fast, and that is Aria herself, the strongest female warrior. Now with his eyes on the prize, he gets ready to attack, as he only wants one thing out of this entire ordeal. Back at the town, another crimson fox begins to count up all their successful rice cake extractions, where she makes fun of the boys, claiming that they aren't the same anymore, since they keep lasting shorter every time. Miss Alita Battle Angel then turns around asking to see if the two new guys are any better than the rest. But the blonde girl gives the unsurprising bad news that they are all still the same. Alita then wants to leave since she's bored, but the blonde says to give the two girls inside more time, since it'll be hard to track them down, even if it's the elite Karim squad chasing them down. The girls then talk about Aria, where they reveal that she's the current reincarnation of the girl that took down the leader of all men centuries ago. Anyways, back to the action, Herring learns from the girl that her name is Danby, where she whispers to him to never forget her name. After telling her name, she proceeds to straddle the bike so she can finally start her mission of extraction. But apparently the banana tree could not fit inside the garden since it was too grown to handle. So she decides to water the tree real quick, since there's no way it's going in without any help. As such, she starts to water his banana plantation, quickly irrigating the tree's surroundings to make sure it's slippery wet. Apparently, this was such a rare and forbidden maneuver that Herring has never ever heard of the special honey tiak slurping. Meanwhile, his bonehead friend literally passes out after the girl is able to extract his soul, so she gets mad that he can't continue. So she abruptly stops and slaps him awake, where he starts to gasp for air. She then looks at him in disgust, asking if he's really already done, since this is the only time in their lives that both will ever get to experience the rice cake and hot dog combining. But he doesn't answer, as his pride is already depleted, so she begins yelling at him, unable to believe she waited 20 years just for everything to last just a few seconds. She then threatens him that she will punish him if his tree doesn't grow back ASAP, so she tells him that she'll give him one more chance if he can come back to his senses. But then she gets distracted as she notices Herring's tree getting irrigated with a mouth extension calling Danby a sly little dog. But Danby doesn't care as she just wants to complete the mission, so Herring just sits there, busy thinking about whether this is all worth it in exchange for his life. Since Herring's friend is fully fried and exhausted, Danby's superior comes over to watch, busy wanting a turn at the behemoth, but Danby shoes her off. However, she smiles and roots for her, telling her that he won't disturb her, so she decides to leave. Right before she gets to the exit, she reminds Danby that if she can't handle it, then she can take his place as she can easily take over for her. Danby then turns to Herring, grabbing his face, telling him to focus super hard. How about just get on with it? Danby continues on by telling Herring that this is the most important moment in her life, but she doesn't realize that it is also the same for Herring. She then finally goes for it, and so hearts begin to appear in the surrounding area as the rocket blasts off into her space. She's instantly mesmerized as if something got awakened in her, so she musters up all her strength to keep attacking such a massive behemoth. Unlike his friend, he's able to actually continue further than 10 seconds, proving to everyone that he can actually handle a crimson fox. Everyone then starts to watch surprised, unsure how Herring is able to dominate, even though he looks like such a weak boy. Meanwhile, the mysterious man fast approaches the hideout as he swiftly cuts through the air. A few moments later, he makes it to the hideout, but the girls notice right in time. So they quickly head to their defensive positions to meet the intruder head-on. But it turns out the mysterious man is actually Levi from Attack on Titan taking a break as he slices through the air like nothing. Without any hesitation, he slashes forward, taking on multiple crimson foxes by himself. Levi then jumps into the air, easily avoiding every attack as his mission is to deal with someone else. He then changes his gaze towards Aria, off at the edge of a cliff. The story continues with Aria unfazed at the sight of Karim, since she's the strongest female warrior on the planet. But Karim only wants one thing, and it's her, the legendary reincarnation of the battle goddess. Meanwhile, a love explosion occurs as the girls buy time for the two crimson foxes to finish extracting some seeds. 
But Danby has started to hit her limit, as Herring is able to withstand every rice kick attack that Danby is able to throw at him. Eventually, she transcends the realm of mere mortals as a crimson fox for the first time in a very long time is able to reach the climax of the mountain during a bike ride. Danby then mutters to him to wait, but Herring is confused, since he's the one not moving, so he keeps his eyes closed as if he's scared of ghosts. But then it dawned on him why she stopped, it turns out that she's unable to deliver any more rice cake attacks as she needs time to recover from completion. However, since he's new at this, he tells her that he hasn't reached the climax of the mountain, as he thinks playtime is now over. Suddenly, a peeping Levi appears, looking mad as heck, probably wishing that Mikasa was here so she can witness him being a weirdo again. Nevertheless, he whips out his sword in front of him. A second after, the window blows open, much to Herring's dismay as the poor boy still hasn't experienced the stage like clarity after blowing the truckload. So Karim walks in unopposed, but he just stares at Herring and the boneheaded friend, standing there, as if he's the step bro ready to do some laundry. But then Naria comes to save the day, flying in like Mikasa on mobility gear, so she attempts to slice him down. However, Karim easily parries without even having to look behind him, showcasing his true masterful swordsmanship. So the two started to dance around while fighting, but the two crimson foxes trying to extract the seeds are unable to continue riding their bikes. But Aria has a big brain, so to buy some time for the crimson foxes, she starts insulting Karim. She continues by calling him a weeb, where she also tells him to stop being a simp for her, since he's not strong enough. But Karim is just that one friend who never gives up, no matter how many times he gets rejected, since he's a chad with no care at all. So he wicks out his sword again, pointing at her collar, ordering her to give it to him, since he wants only her, since no one else comes close to her power. Now to be clear, if the fox gives you their collar, it means you become the chosen one to destroy their rice cake anytime you want, so they confuse to make strong children. As Arya distracts Karim, Alita Battle Angel attempts to grab Danby by putting her cloak on, as they attempt to escape. But Danby refuses to leave as she's captivated by Herring's behemoth banana plantation, so she tries to hold on by grabbing on a Herring. Luckily for the Crimson Foxes, the blondes are able to swiftly leave, but so did the art style every couple frames. With time running out, Alita has no choice but to literally force her out of the banana plantation, so Danby begins to cry, looking a little like Red Riding Hood. Tears then began to stream down her face as she reveals to everyone that she didn't even get to extract the legendary seeds from the behemoth. As Danby gets taken away, Arya gets Gubsmack surprised as it's been a long time a random wolf was able to survive a rice cake siege. Even Karim's face starts to look like mine when someone steals my ace on purpose as he too cannot fathom a supply member was able to withstand a crimson fox. It's then an introvert's nightmare as the entire gazes of the room shifts towards him. But Herring has no clue on what to do since he's still chained to the chair. So Aria looks at him intently, maybe she's about to jump on him for a bike ride right in front of Karim to test the waters. But instead, the greatest warrior walks up to Herring, where she reveals her name is actually Ara, the current reincarnation of the goddess Aria. Meanwhile, Karim doesn't move as he stares at Ara, instead watching her every move perplexed. With the turntables turning, she removed her own collar and placed it on Herring, proclaiming to the entire world that Herring is her chosen banana plantation. As such, Levi looks like he's about to call upon the powers of the founding titan, since he's about to call the rumbling as her girl picks someone else. Karim then turns to Ara, unable to shout, as his rage started to exude outside his body. With a faceless expression, she looks back at him, as if she's trying her hardest to stop herself from giggling, since she's secretly a troll. But before Karim is able to do anything, she escapes away, but she flashes a cake that Karim will never ever get to experience now. Fast forward to the next morning, where we find Herring back at his place, unable to really get out of bed, as he has severe soreness from everything that has happened to him. He also reveals that he got interrogated by the elite special forces last night, where they couldn't believe that he didn't explode. Nevertheless, he keeps daydreaming about the Crimson Fox Danby, as he cannot forget the special experience the two shared together. But he tries to forget about her, as he knows he will never see her again, but at least he got to experience her rice cakes. Suddenly, his bedroom door swings wide open, as his dad barges in, looking like he's ready to beat him back to his senses. Instead, he proudly smiles, telling Herring that it's time to wake up since it's supper time already. Herring then discovers from his father that the entire country is in panic, due to what happened between him and Ara yesterday. A mysterious man then appeared inside their house as they tried to go to the kitchen, claiming that things won't simmer down anytime soon. The man then alerts them telling them that he's here without any official authorization from the top brass, but he somehow knows everyone's name. Herring's father instantly recognizes him though, so he offers him some supper if he would like. But he declines, so he introduces himself to Herring, revealing that his name is Moo, like the cow, 
and is part of the kingdom's shadow ops group. Mu then tells Herring that today will be his last day as private of his support crew, since the shadow ops will take care of him from now on. Mu also urges him to quickly adapt, claiming that every agency in the world will be keeping a close eye on him for receiving a Ra's collar. Herring then cries, knowing he can't play Roblox anymore as he'll be too busy getting trained behind the scenes. In the end, Mu reminds him that he has no choice, so Mu will be expecting him at sundown. Later on in the day, he gets a surprise punch to the face while he was just busy minding his own business. It turns out to be his friends and crew from the squad as they want to know more from what happened the night before, super eager to know more details about rice cake smashing. As they pester him to spill the beans, the entire squad began to round up as Herring's about to tell the story of the first-hand account of rice cake sieges. Herring starts off by calling them all rookies, insulting them by claiming that they will never experience or imagine what he went through, as they are too weak. Regardless, he began telling the story, and as he continues, more people joined in the circle, intently listening as if he's the teacher of forbidden powers. The boys then started to get scared as they only heard rumors beforehand, never an actual first-hand experience. But then they got flustered as Herring moved to excruciating details of sweet honey tiak slurping and much more. Eventually, he motioned how the banana plantation instantly transformed into a rocket when Danby was helping him out. So in the end, everyone passed out from the story as they couldn't handle the sounds he was making when Herring was busy reenacting the swishing and slurping sounds. It took a whole night to finish the story, so everyone went to bed. Before Herring is able to go to sleep, he has one-on-one -on -one time with his dad as Herring is getting ready to grab some milk from the store to never come back again. But before he leaves, his dad imparts some secret special knowledge, like how first-class warriors are given a license for rice cake destroying anytime they want. But then his dad became a sussy backup, asking Herring if he was a loser, wanting to know more about his first encounter in extreme detail. His dad then gets surprised when Herring reveals the detail of how he knows Danby's name, as foxes are never allowed to reveal their identity, as the wolves can track them down. So he gets up, ordering Herring to never reveal that detail to anyone else. But he begins to giggle, as if he's remembering someone from the past. His dad then reminds him of what he always says, claiming that Herring is destined to be king, but Herring has never believed his father. The next morning, Herring looks back, feeling at peace with himself, as he leaves everything behind, unable to really choose his destiny. As he lays down during the journey, he finally thought to himself how his father could know every single top secret intelligence, even though he's just a normal man in a small town. He shrugs it off though, as he reveals that he really hasn't asked his father about what he did before Herring was born, so it never really came to mind. Regardless, he arrives in front of the gates of the special headquarters, so he takes a deep breath before stepping forward. Someone then yells his name, telling him that he's 21 minutes early, but I can't tell if the person is a girl or a dude. What do you guys think? I'm going to assume he's a guy, since he's part of the men-only nation. No matter, the boy's name is revealed to be Magi, so Magi takes him on a tour around the headquarters. They then take a moment to stop at a nearby training facility, so Magi opens the doors to the mysterious building. Upon entering, all he could hear are people grunting, but he gets confused even more when someone yells out to use their hips better. With his eyes finally adjusting to the room, he finally realized they were practicing specific positions for every member, found fake foxes. Now I have seen a lot of things, but man, this was such a weird scene, and it looks like Herring agrees with me as well. Magi then interrupts the leader in charge of the exam, asking if anyone is worth looking into, but he just lets him know everyone is still just bang average. Meanwhile, as Magi introduces Herring to the leader in charge, Herring notices that they are all practicing on dolls that his father made. Magi then reveals that Herring is the one that Ira chose, causing everyone in the room to stop everything they were doing, to just glare at him. But Herring is not scared at the display of the entire group, probably because he knows he landed some nice vanilla cake to eat over and over. Afterwards, Magi brings him over to the most important area of the headquarters, as the one in charge wants to meet him personally. As he calls him over, Herring meets the fat old man in charge of everyone making sure their banana plantations grow well to meet the standards of the foxes. He then gets up, asking why the hell would Ara pick him. The story continues with Mr. Baldy reluctantly taking a closer look at Herring, frustrated that the goddess reincarnation picks such a weakling. Rumpy Baldy is then forced to reveal a secret that only the special forces of the female only and men only nation know. Herring discovers that there's a mini city called Prushil where the Chosen Ones congregate to do rice cake smashing. It's the most luxurious place on the planet, as only the top warriors from both nations are ever allowed in, even if they are constantly at war. At Prushil, anything they want is given to them, as the sole purpose of the place is to make sure the boys destroy the rice cake, while the girls extract the seeds. The old man continues by explaining that if a man and woman ever steps foot into a room, 
they aren't allowed to leave until a day has passed. But to get in, he needs the golden ticket, which just happens to be a collar from a fox. As such, he whips out the collar of the strongest warrior on the planet, the one that Ura has given to the weak herring. Upon hearing the clarification, our boy instantly gets his banana plantation excited, as he starts to lose focus by day dreaming about the legendary goddess reincarnation. Herring then zones out, finding himself a little bit scared since as of a few days ago he's never seen a girl, and now he's tasked to conquer the strongest. The man in charge then leaves the room, reminding him that he has one month to prepare, and that he needs to notify Ara of the date. He then reveals to Herring that there is one catch, and that is he needs to actually be accepted into the elite squad before he can notify her. Luckily, Herring is motivated as he wants Ara really bad since she probably has the best vanilla cake, due always destroying every man on the battlefield. As the old man leaves the room, he yells that maybe there is hope for Herring, as Herring discovers that everyone somehow knows his father, a man that goes by the name of Mukbum. Meanwhile, at the Crimson Fox territory of Borderlands City, two very notable members of the Crimson Foxes are busy drinking Slurpees from each other. The Blondie finds herself loving the taste of the rainbow, since for her, the same flavors happens to get stale eventually. On the other end is Martina, where we discover that the two have been trying to fuse themselves, so they become an Oreo cookie. Anyways, as the two cosplay some scissors, Tana asks the blondie about the news of Ra, wanting to know more about the man that she has finally chosen to eat the cake. So the blondie lets her know that it wasn't even a man, it was a puppy of a random supply group and not part of the special forces for the wolves. As such, the entire planet was thrown into chaos as the number one warrior did not pick the second strongest, which happens to be Karim, the mega simp that always gets denied. Nevertheless, the blue-haired goddess finds herself wandering around the Fox Special Headquarters, but she notices some commotion at the end of the hallway. She overhears Alita Battle Angel worriedly talking about Dambi, as she's apparently been skipping every meal and refusing to drink anything. The girls think it's a form of love sickness as she never got to extract the seeds from Herring's behemoth when he got captured. Unfortunately for her, if she keeps up the antics, she'll get punished by the Queen of the Foxes, even though she got it bad enough as someone else you want her man. As we meet more of the Crimson Foxes, every single one starts to think that Era might be onto something as Herring might be more powerful than he seems. But, as girls do, they leave to join an episode of Gossip Girls, as the girls pester Alita about information on the so-called behemoth. So she reenacted what happened when Herring's banana plantation transformed into a rocket, which Danby tried to explode it over and over. Even Alita was feeling flustered just from her telling the story, even though she was busy fighting off Levi most of the time. Nevertheless, the trio came to a conclusion as to why Era chose a puppy, claiming that she chose Herring just because of his tree trunk size. Alita then made a good point as she points out what Herring's thingy did to Danby, something they haven't really seen in a long, long time. Afterwards, the girls find the squad leader, so they try to gank her, asking where the hell she's been, but understandably, she's been interrogated all night. Suddenly, everyone's attention shifts towards the room of the blondie earlier where we discover her name to be Biol, as they hear some really weird and loud noises coming from the room. So the girls try to sneak in as their curiosities get the better of them, wanting to know more about what's causing Biol to be really loud. Much to their astonishment or disgust, you decide they realize what she's been up to, so they keep watching on exactly like you sussy Becca's watching our recaps. However, during the ordeal, Biol becomes a chad, as she whips out a herring banana plantation lifelike replica, as the two talk about the rumors of herring only the size of a prince, Anyways, just like every single video, the girls are glued to the scene, not realizing that they are secretly loving every single moment. As such, more and more decide to crowd the door as they stared on perplexed, wondering if they should close the browser when their family walks in. But then the door burst open due to too many foxes watching the amazing show they have never seen before, so make sure to subscribe. Regardless, the girls ask if the rumors are true, wondering if Herring actually has a weapon of mass destruction hidden inside his banana plantation. Although it's top secret information, Bile decides to let it rip, just like my farts, leaking to everyone that his size is indeed of a prince. At that very moment, every crimson fox became mesmerized without even seeing it themselves, so they began charging towards the replica, wanting more. Meanwhile, Herring feels a sudden chill on his spine, as his ultra instinct is probably kicking in, somehow knowing that dozens of girls are clamoring for him without them even seeing his face. The next day at the Wolves' headquarters, every single official becomes shocked as they inspect Herring for his otherworldly features in front of everyone. Everyone is in utter disbelief, even the old grumpy Baldy is left speechless, as they witness Herring's banana plantation with their very own eyes. Eventually, the top officials agree that our boy literally is a prince, due to the behemoth of sword that he is carrying. 
Now imagine being Herring right now, since I'm surprised he's able to get the banana tree growing in front of only dudes. Nonetheless, it's revealed that Herring's ultimate ability places him rank 1 middle class. With the insane revelation, every single leader almost chokes on their own spit, unable to fathom how a puppy is basically a hidden titan. So with the onset of the new information, every single squad commanders began to try and recruit him. In mere seconds, everyone in the ultra-top secret room began fighting one another, as they all want Herring to join their elite team. But just like with the random drops in quality, Herring is left unamused as he didn't expect anything to unfold exactly like this. But Moo Man smartly interjects, reminding every commander in the room that it's a Ra, the legendary 1000 steps, that has targeted Herring for her vanilla cake to get destroyed. So everyone began to simmer down as they all got brought back to their senses, remembering how intricate the situation is with Ra involved. As such, Mr. Baldi stands up, claiming that although it is quite surprising, the Council still needs to cover one of the most important information. That is, to be specific, his basic power level. With his unknown power level, the entire Council erupts as every single one volunteered to observe the following power level test, wanting to know more about this prince. As the day continued to drag on and on for Herring, he finally had time for a small break. However, it just coincided with Sussy Becca Levi appearing at the compound, still looked mad as hell. So he finds Herring and turns his back on him, where he murmurs to Herring how much he wished he could destroy his life right now. But instead, he points his sword at him, telling him that he'll get eaten by red foxes anyways, so he asks if he's ever swung a sword before. Karim then continues by ordering Herring to go ahead, and show him what he's truly capable of doing. So like a true Sigma male, he decides to use the fake training sword, causing Karim to be instantly frustrated. As Karim is unable to control his anger, the top brass looks on from afar, laughing at how a random boy could make the legendary warrior lose his cool. Even members of the top Garibi force began to look on, claiming how they have never seen their captain get so heated up before, especially in front of such a weakling. So the elite Garibi team started to chuckle, wondering if Karim might actually slice and dash the boy in front of everyone. But Karim just stands there, face palming as even the old man is getting excited at seeing Karim get all up in his emotions as the simp is still unable to believe he lost a Ra to the weak pup. So Moo, like a true gentleman, whips out some caramel popcorn for everyone, as the show is about to go on. Fast forward to the Black Castle, where the Wolves King resides in isolation from the continent. The current king of all men is named Buxib Barum, where he sits on his throne, with captured foxes at his mercy. He fiercely orders the fox under him, to make sure she doesn't waste any of the honey that the king is giving her, since bro is a menace to society. Nonetheless, he can't get enough from the foxes he has captured, so he glistens at the thought of Ra's vanilla cake, since it's the bomb as every man wants it. Anyways, bro is revealed to be like a villain from Vinland Saga as he literally has dozens of captured foxes that he claps with his hand every day. After attacking every single rice cake in front of him daily, he finds a new one hiding in a corner, asking the fox what she's afraid of. So he reaches out to her with his hand, and the rest was history for her, as it is now her daily routine. He then sieges the rice cake with no holding back as if they are just a sleeve to him. After the king leaves the room of destruction, a random man asks what level of satisfaction would he rate his experience today. But the king is agitated at the question, as every experiment brought to him to elevate his experience has always been bang average, with no noteworthy standouts. So the king asks the man if he could bring better products, but he reveals to the king that he can't, as they need to capture top-class products. As such, the king orders the man to hurry up and get him a working top-class elixir to enhance his rice cake experience, as he wants to test it out on a raw. We then discover that the king is secretly attempting to mass-produce potions that will entice every fox to want their rice cake destroyed, regardless of any collar or procedure. Meanwhile, back at the special headquarters, every man is glued to duel between Herring and Karim. Either Mr. Baldi spits out his popcorn, as everyone witnesses Herring almost slice Karim with a plastic training sword. Even more so now, Karim is absolutely full of rage as he almost gets embarrassed in front of his leaders and his own elite squad. As such, Karim finally takes him seriously, so activates his battle stance as he swipes away Herring into the distance. Shortly after, he swiftly counterattacks without warning, disappearing with blistering speed as if he was just lightning. Surprisingly, Herring is actually able to block the attack last second, surprising Karim himself, as not a lot of people on the planet can react that quick. With the show off to an insane pilot episode, everyone began cheering as they watched Karim not hold back a single inch. So Levi continued his relentless attacks, where he is able to get in position for his final blow to finish off Herring. But somehow, Herring is able to dodge with absolute pinpoint accuracy, confirming to everyone that he is indeed the real deal. 
Meanwhile, Mu started collecting his winnings as he knew what Herring was capable of, so the old man turns to Mu, telling him how he can't believe Wookbum has been hiding his son the entire time. Mu retorts that he totally expected Bum to raise his son the proper way, but EQ can't believe Herring has surpassed his own expectations. With Herring still standing, Mu claims he needs to forcefully stop the power level dual test as Karim might want to actually end him. So before Karim has a chance to do so, Mu steps in, proclaiming that the test is now over. Simultaneously, he mentions how the world has been so boring lately, subtly telling him not to accidentally destroy the new mushroom and fun guy that can change the world. Afterwards, Mu pipes up, notifying Herring that his rank is now erased as the Shadow Corps, now acknowledges powers for passing the special tests. With full synchronization mode activated, the entire council agreed at the same time, welcoming him into the Garimbi Elite Squad. From now on, he's part of the special forces, but Herring still has no idea why everyone seemingly knows his father. The story continues with Herring realizing that the wolves' strongest swordsman has left him alone. On his first ever mission with the Elite Squad, he finds himself lost in enemy territory, while rain pours down heavily. So Herring stands still, unable to figure out a solution as most of his gift went straight to his third leg instead of his brain. But then, out of the ordinary, a fire fox comes out to greet him wearing my favorite color of all time. Luckily for Herring, she doesn't instantly destroy him as the plus-size warrior beckons him to come over instead, seemingly looking like she's actually friendly. It's then revealed that Herring's reputation exceeds him, as all the women now know about his special gift, so it turns out his behemoth serves him better than unlimited knowledge. So like a weak boy he is, he just says nice to meet you, probably awestruck, since you never find someone her size in anime. A flashback then occurs, back to exactly two hours ago, where the Garimbi squad heads back to headquarters. On a ride there, Herang gets introduced to the rest of the squad, where we meet Surin Maru, the nerd, then Bao Eden, a guy that looks like he loves pork buns, then Ho Wong, the hipster with two earrings, and of course, Captain of the Garimbi, the legendary Karim. It turns out there's also a sixth member, but he's currently on a secret mission, so the mystery man will be revealed later. However, while busy minding his own business, Maru the nerd suddenly attempts to kick him in the face, but Herring dodges, as if he's Neo from the Matrix. Maru then starts giggling like a little girl, happy that Herring is able to dodge his surprise attack as it proves to him he isn't some random smuck. So he continues his attack, this time trying to cosplay one me man instead, but Herring uses the help of Port Bun's head to swiftly dodge. Eventually, Herring gets enough so he counterattacks, quickly able to land a hit on Maru's face, causing his glasses to fly off into the sunset. The hit serves him right as our nerd is probably jealous that Herring has a better banana plantation than he does. Regardless, both Wong and Eden are amused at what just unfolded, so they try their hardest to widen their eyes open. Unfortunately, Herring made a fatal mistake as he accidentally dodges out of the caravan, and the squad didn't stop to pick him up. But Levi helps him out by throwing a training sword and a scroll to help his journey back home. Maru the bottom fragger also looks on, yelling at him saying that if he survives his journey back home, they'll throw him in a massive welcome party. Back in the present, Herring introduces his real name to the Fire Fox, somewhat perturbed that a random girl is calling him Prince Banana Tree. But the fox doesn't care as she's too busy thinking to herself how lucky she must be to run into the Legend 27 himself. She then sheathes her sword, telling the anxious Herring to relax as she isn't going to call for backup from the Fire Fox Squad. But then the sussy nation attacked as the Fire Fox can only look on, as if Herring is some kind of ice cream cake as she doesn't want to share it with anyone. She then introduces herself as Hyangri Yangji, part of the squad called Pebbles from the Red Foxes. And just like Danby, she tells him to make sure to remember her name as if Rice Cake Mission is about to ensue. Nonetheless, Herring stays in combat position as Yangji is busy wondering why the prince has such a loose form, equipped with only a measly fake sword. So she thinks to herself that he must be bait, as he's alone with no backup, yet she doesn't care if there's a trap card about to be activated. She claims that she would even give up playing Roblox just to experience the gift that Herring has as she's ready for his mythical fruit. And so she charges forward, but even I would be scared, as the ground beneath her starts to shake from her every step. But Herring stands firm, ready to slash down the first boss he's encountered, waiting for the perfect time to counter. With just a blink of the eye, the battle is over, as Herring is able to deflect her attack, so he proceeded to trip her to the ground. She then crashes like the Titanic hitting an iceberg, and all you can hear is Mayday Mayday, target down. Youngji is left shocked as she finds a sword right beside her, basically forcing her to yield. Herring then appears in front of her, smiling as he claims that he won, giving her the advice that she only lost because she let her guard down. Herring then makes his best facial impression of the overly attached girlfriend as he nicely asks for her collar. 
Although Yeonji is initially stunned at his request, she gives in after Herring continually orders her to give him her collar. As such, a red fox finally admits defeat, so the Garimbi elite squad once again keeps their winning record. Upon receiving her collar, Herring retorts to himself that this is his second, including the one with the goddess, but it could have been his third if Gambi gave hers. Nevertheless, we discover that Herring is actually into plus-size warriors, so he demands for the ritual to occur, right here, right now. So as with tradition, they prepare for rice cake destroying as Herring's motto is, if they move, they're good. But luckily for Yeonji, Herring is a gentleman, so he wicks out his cloak as a makeshift blanket, so that there will be no grass stains for either of them. As Yeonji uses an invisibility potion, Herring's eyes start to cosplay Gollum, as he looks at his precious from afar. Eventually, he attacks and perseveres, where we discover that Yeonji is actually short as heck, so it's actually kind of funny. As the rice cake ritual continues on, Yeonju wonders how Herring could be so skilled, and why does it seem like Herring is full of honey? Anyways, long story short, Herring unveils the behemoth, sending Yeonji into another dimension, just like he did with Danby from weeks earlier. Meanwhile, the rest of her squad searches for her, and it's a very peculiar experience for Yeonji to just disappear without notice. As if Herring is now some kind of god, their faces light up when they start talking about Prince Banana Tree, helping relieve them of the misery searching in the rain. It then dawned on one of the girls that there is one future, out of 14,605 at Yeonji is keeping Herring all to herself right now. But then, a mystery man is revealed, stalking the other two members on top of the trees. Back at the rice cake area, Herring makes Yeonji promise to take care of his future children properly, so she begins to cry, unable to believe a black wolf could be so nice. With the encounter now finished, he waddles out into the forest as Yeonju watches on, claiming how he was a gentleman to the end. She then falls to her knees with no one around, hugging her sword tightly as she reminisces about the battle, causing her to be unable to really move. Regardless, as Herring continues his trek towards home base, female archers begin to shadow his every move. One of the girls end up mentioning how they can't believe Yeonju lost to such a weakling, so she aims her arrow right at his legs. She claims that if he can't move, then he'll be able to drink the mythical Prince Slurpee without him perishing. But before she could fire the arrow at the defenseless herring, the mysterious man from earlier appears from behind, ordering her to not make a single sound. He then whispers to her to quietly follow him or else she will find a surprise third leg out of nowhere. Upon catching a glimpse of his face, she realizes that it's Garimbi's legendary Hook Sharong, the second strongest after Levi the Simp. Fast forward to a few hours later, as the darkness begins to envelope the night sky, herring starts to wonder if he'll actually make it home today. It's then revealed that he actually made it, still fully intact, much to the surprise of everyone in the squad. Upon arriving, people are already quick to make fun of him, due to how he apparently looks like a very unmanly boy. But to his surprise, Maru interferes, telling everyone to chill out, revealing to them how he went head-to-head -head with Karim. As such, even the Street Fighter lookalikes were unable to fathom how someone who looks like Herring could do such a thing. Nevertheless, Maru guides him away from the noobs, bringing him straight to the commander of the Garimbi elite. The commander is surprised to see the new member with limbs still attached, as most don't survive the journey to the headquarters. He then notes how quick he was able to find his way home, so he dismisses him after welcoming him, urging him to get some rest. Stamaru leads him to his brand new room, while simultaneously letting him know that he can drop his guard, as he's one of them now. Once arriving at his new room, Herring discovers that he gets to room with the hipster, but that should be okay, right guys? Wong instantly orders him to wash up, as he doesn't want to smell any stinky armpits. However, without Herring noticing, Maru looks like he's sending a sneaky signal to Wong, so Herring heads off to take a shower. Wong then volunteers to help him heat up the bath, so he chills by the furnace, chopping wood like a chad with one finger. But he smirks at the end, as if him and Maru have something planned for the night. Inside the bath-like area, Herring washes off, enjoying how hot the water is. Unfortunately, his solo peacetime gets invaded by the man making fun of him earlier, busy talking about how hot the room is. When Herring isn't looking, he Ferrari peeks the corner, finally understand what they meant about the prince behemoth that he was given as a gift. But then, the man looks on in horror, almost as if he wants to scream, as he watches the banana plantation expand like a speedy rocket. Now to clarify, the rocket turned its boosters on, not because of the dude, but because he started thinking about what happened earlier. With the man now witnessing what true prince behemoth is like, he hurries to the other corner of the room, as Herring unknowingly shampoos his hair. The story continues the next morning during sunrise. The commander holds Yeonji's collar, unable to believe that Herring was able to achieve such a mighty feat. With disbelief sewn on his face, he repeats himself again out loud, claiming how high angry Yeonji is the type to accidentally trip, causing an entire earthquake, with magnitude 69 to occur. 
So he asks the second strongest swordsman, Black Serene, to confirm his achievement, which he does. As such, the commander instantly asks if he was able to shoot his banana seed, to which Herring embarrassingly verifies. So the elite members are astonished a scrawny boy like Herring was able to conquer the beast that is Yongji, since she's basically an ox reincarnated into a woman's body. Meanwhile, the commander shoves his fist into the air congratulating Herring as he reveals that no man has been able to come out of that ordeal without a single scratch. It also turns out that Yumji is actually a raider captain, just like Karim or Ra, so she's pretty well known by the elite squads. She's so strong that when she makes a single sound, every animal in the forest starts to run, and she also detests the wolves with all her heart. So our boy is lucky as it seems like the kingdom of girls are going crazy at the thought of the prince behemoth as every single one will risk their life for the mythical banana. And so, with the addition of Herring, the commander warns the squad that the Black Wolves will probably be giving them another procurement mission. Although super wary at the thought of their mission's difficulty being elevated more, the commander tells them they have no choice, as it's an imperial order. As such, the trio give Herring a death stare, probably jealous he's a prince behemoth, while they're busy being world average. After the briefing, the commander takes Karim to the side, urging him to take good care of the youngest one. Now imagine being forced to mentor someone that stole your girl, no wonder his facial expressions always looks like Levi from Attack on Titan. Meanwhile, Wong slaps Herring's shoulder, telling him to not get so nervous. Since the hipster claims that no matter what happens, as long as he's around, his roommate will always be there for him, although he feels very suspect. However, as the squad leaves the briefing room, Herring counters, telling the rest he's not nervous, unlike the rest of them. The next morning, the ground find themselves beyond the defenses of the Nation of Men. Four of them sit perched on top of a mountain, overlooking a valley as they pester Herring, wondering what he thinks as it's his first real field mission. But Herring looks on in absolute awe, as if he's closed beta testing the real world, since he's always busy playing Roblox frontlines, claiming it's better than COD. They say he's crazy, but the nerd closes in, arguing that COD is better, claiming that if he looks on, the graphics is so much better. Anyways, they call them anew, making fun of how Herring is taking in the view, unable to truly believe the world he's living in. However, his dreamlike state gets shattered, as he hears Eden talk about how this soul is going to be taken today. Bro's face then shrivels into what looks like something you can't describe on YouTube, so he yells how he hates Eden, calling him a teenage mutant ninja turtle. Nevertheless, they continue on their mission, where Herring discovers that they are searching for some kind of flower and that they call the Blue Columbine. Wong then goes on a rant about how an ordinary citizen with no powers would never know what it looks like, but Herring is like, who asked? Anyways, Wong whips out a medieval contraption to scale down the mountain, since they got no rocket boosters. After brute forcing the item straight to the ground with one fell swoop, the squad instantly jumps down with no hesitation, as Wong's strength level is 99. Suddenly, Karim comes out of nowhere, and instead of taking the rope down the mountain, he just jumps off so Herring could only look on. Simultaneously, the Black Serang ganks Herring, pushing him off the mid lane so he could drop down to bot lane, since he's had enough of diddle daddling. Now that's one way to get the mission going as Harry is sent flying off, causing him to scream the entire time as a rope tangles around his waist. Meanwhile, at the Nation of Women, the girls from the elite squads within the headquarters begin to gather round. A voice then yells at them, ordering them to go quickly and to put on all their armor. Mira then barges in the strategy room, clearly wearing basically no armor, but she yells at Ara, claiming that the wolves have started to make their move. Arad is caught by surprise with the onset of the news, so she stops drinking milk as she doesn't want to have an accident in her pants during battle, since she's lactose. She then looks on, humming yum as the strongest swordsman can't wait to destroy everyone, although she has some chocolate toast crunch left on her face. But then Ra channels her inner me as she refuses to move, since she's busy digesting food, so Mira has to drag her over to the strategy room. Afterwards, we discover Yumji with no armor on being interrogated by the top brass as news began to spread like wildfire. One of the top brass is revealed to be Heyang Seolhi, part of the Black Thorn, who repeatedly grills her questions, refusing to believe that a wolf would be so kind. But the rest of the Black Thorn members begin to get flustered, including Yumji as she confirms everything they are asking. Prince Behemoth has now achieved Ultra Sigma Male status, as the Black Thorn discover he made Yumji explode three times, something that has never happened. As such, even more, every girl wants a piece of Prince Behemoth, wanting to trade lives just for the heavenly experience. Unfortunately, our fiery Yumji has her flames extinguished, as Sioli strips her of command, ending the investigation right there. He then orders her to join the med team as they are now ready to care for her, since making sure the banana seed sprouts is now her ultimate mission in life. From fearsome earthquake destroyer to now just a merely citizen, 
forced to wait nine months to continue action. Back outside the girls' special forces headquarters, everyone begins to vacate as they are all ordered to return to main headquarters. But Miss Alita Battle Angel and the special Blondie find themselves still on foot, as their captain is still not ready to leave. While the rest of the girls of the Crimson Foxes congregate, Ara is still nowhere to be found. It's revealed that Ara is actually on the toilet, so she's literally me as she sits there for over half an hour, probably scrolling Reddit the entire time. But Mira gets enough of her antics, so she probably yelled at her, accidentally making Ara finish her daily ritual before battle. As the two head out, Ara catches a glimpse of Yamji with no armor or weapons on, accompanied by a black thorn. But finally, the captain springs into action as she shoves Mira away, fiercely walking straight at Yamji. She then grabs Yamji's face, and instead of destroying her for going after her man, she just stares at her. Nonetheless, as she cosplays Komi, she whispers, asking Yeonji how the experience was in relation to finally extracting a seed. Yeonji replies by saying it was great having a rocket lock onto her, as she didn't know it was possible to experience such an otherworldly thing. In the end, Ara walks out ready to rumble, while also telling Yeonji to take good care of herself as she's proud of her. Unfortunately, before she's able to step out of the room, the commander of the special forces grabs her hair, reprimanding her for being so late. So she turns to Mira with a ear-screwed face, ordering her to make sure that the Garimbi squad gets totally tormented into defeat. She then finally lets go of Ara, ordering the strongest woman on the planet to make sure she gets as much information from Prince Behemoth as she can. After letting go of her hair, she blames the entire attack on Ara, threatening her that if Herring is found not worthy of her power, then she'll destroy him herself. Seoli also reminds her that she has one month to prepare for her duel at Puzel, so she needs to make sure she's actually made up her mind. Yamju then interferes, telling Ara to make sure she doesn't underestimate Herring, but I know for a fact she'll be staring at something soon. She needs to hurry to her man as every fish in the ocean hurriedly Naruto runs to make sure they get to Prince Behemoth first. As of now, every elite squad from the Nation of Girls has been dispatched, all to stop the Garimbi, but mostly because they want a piece of the prince. You can then hear hundreds of girls begin to laugh simultaneously, as they all chant Prince Behemoth, claiming they won't allow him to rest or breathe if they get their hands on him. Meanwhile, Herring looks into the sky, wondering why he's hearing the sounds of birds laughing over and over, but he shrugs it off, not realizing what's on the horizon. Fast forward to the Imperial Palace of the Kingdom of Girls, some old geezers talk about their declining birth rates. We then finally meet the current queen of the girls-only nation as she stands there, listening to her cabinet discuss ongoing problems. Her name is Hume Garam, wearing an half-hired fit for the Queen of the Red Foxes. Her Majesty then excuses herself out the room, claiming she has urgent business to attend to. Upon leaving the room, the cabinet turns to the royal captain of the guards, asking about Prince Behemoth himself. Regardless, Edo Naren deflects the questions about Prince Behemoth as she instead debriefs them about how the wolves have been utterly obsessed with collecting blue columbines. Although they have been putting their all in their investigation, she still has no idea why they won the flower, but she knows it does not bode well for the kingdom. So for now, she's focusing on the preparations for the upcoming Gomage. It's then revealed that the Gomage is named after the gods, where it's an event to help control the population of both nations. Basically, long story short, every couple years a truce is signed, just so every girl and man on the planet can experience rice cake destroying a specific place for an entire day. Even the queen is looking forward to it, as she's busy thinking about Prince Behemoth herself. Nevertheless, the queen motions for her black thorn guards to leave the room, as she's busy preparing to do some sussy becca things. She then changes into a robe, frustrated at the thought of a Ra wanting to claim her throne. So she decides to relieve some of her stress. And to do so, she enters a gigantic bath, greeted by what seems like captured wolves, calling the queen her majesty. After sitting down, she motions for one of the captured boys to come near her. And so her face disappears, signaling to us that we are entering Sussy Street as we discover this is her first ever time as the cherry tree blossoms. The story continues with the queen of the girl-only nation finally wanting to experience what the hype is all about. So with two captured wolves summoned before her, she tasks them to give her the utmost royal experience or else face dire punishment. Meanwhile, the elite Crimson Foxes continue their ongoing mission to retrieve Prince Behemoth, but Mira starts to learn some secrets. It's revealed that Ara, the strongest swordsman on the planet, wants to install the Prince Behemoth as the rightful king of the wolves. Our Komi lookalike also adds on that she plans to become queen, as she's preparing to challenge the queen for the throne. Now guys, don't complain about the art suddenly pulling a black clover often, since this is basically like those old anime, the only difference? Rice cakes. Anyways, back at the palace, two wolves are still busy entertaining the queen, and if at any point they accidentally explode the tree, then it's game over. 
Garam then sits there, starting to really figure out why the girls love the rice cake extraction missions. So she decides to level up a wolf, allowing a lowly rank to enter the premises of the queen, as if he's cosplaying a battering ram entering the gates of the kingdom. And enter he goes, finally letting Garam's cherry tree blossom to fully mature, as it's the first time the queen gets to witness and experience such a thing. But then, one of the boys looks like he's in trouble, as he knows his life is in danger if he fails to hold his banana plantation seeds from exploding. And within just a few seconds, his worst fears have come to fruition, as he was not able to fully control the banana tree. After a brief sage-like encounter, he knew he was screwed, so he began begging for mercy before the queen. She then opened her mouth, muttering to the Black Thorn guards to remove the scoundrel as he only had one simple job. In an instant, the Black Thorn appeared behind him, quickly closing the gap to dispose of the dirty wolf. Unfortunately, he better learn to fly soon as the queen orders for the wolf boy to be thrown off the cliff. Afterwards, the queen diverted her attention back to the other wolf, but somehow, this guy is still able to be exactly like the rock, when in reality, he should be more like mashed potato. Regardless, she threatens him to make sure to do a good job or else face the same consequence of his old friend. And so he continues with his life on the line, trying to channel his utmost inner farmer, to make sure his banana tree plantation does not accidentally leak. In the end, the queen actually stops being a savage, as she lets the wolf actually rest, and even lets him explode like lava cake. But there is a catch, as she orders him to make sure the banana tree grows in exactly five minutes, as she's busy thinking she needs the Prince Behemoth experience now. She then claims that Ara will never ever achieve her dreams, as she's never even been with a man before, so how can she handle the harrowing experience? Nevertheless, Ara discovers from Mira that almost everyone actually expects Ara to become the next queen, since it's pretty obvious from how she's the strongest on the planet. But Mira wants to know her plan on how she's going to install Herring as the next king of the wolves, since the current king is an absolute menace to both societies. We then learn that Buxabaram is so strong that he's been king for 15 whole years due to him easily dismantling his opponents. The only person that comes even close nowadays is Karim, but even the legendary swordsman took years until the king acknowledged him. As such, Mira comes to the conclusion that she's deluded only because her heart started beating at the sight of such a behemoth of a prince. But our white vampire refuses to reply, keeping that stone cold face, as if she looks like she's hiding the fact she needs to go to the bathroom. Nonetheless, one of the elite crimson foxes interrupt the two, as she spots the Garimbi elite from afar. At the same time, the Garimbi elite are overjoyed at finally finding the sacred mushrooms needed for the mission. As Wong begins to collect some of the blue columbines, he starts lecturing Herring about the role of the most elite squad in the Wolves Nation. He also explains that these flowers have an intense fragrance that only the higher class are allowed to use, so it's in very high demand. Unfortunately, the flowers only grow in enemy territory, so the only way to procure them is to send the elite special forces in, as no normies can handle the job. As they run out of flowers to collect in the area, the two roommates look on as they find themselves looking at a historical gorge. The place is named Jurujam, an area typically looking like a place you encounter the Demon King or Demon Queen in anime, for the first time. Wong then tells the old tale of the Valley of Hell, where it's apparently connected to a fire giant's footprint. However, Wong reveals information about the fog encompassing the area, warning him to not expose himself too long or else risk losing his entire mind. So he reminds Herring to not wander endlessly or else he will never get to go back home to play Minecraft and Roblox ever again. Unfortunately, the entire squad has to venture deep into the valley, as the further you go, the better quality of columbines will be found. As such, Wong throws a mask over to Herring exactly what you will need when you enter the bathroom right after me. Anyways, the rest of the group catch up, where Maru excitedly yells that it's time for the group to get rich, as the reward for the mission is the highest ever. Poor Bun Lover jumps in the fray as well, threatening Herring that if he even slows them down, they'll just throw him to the pack of foxes behind them. He also finally opens his eyes, telling Herring to stop replying formally and to stop holding back. And so he drops all formalities as Herring yells how much he likes plump people like Eden, especially with his half-closed eyes all the time. He continues insulting him as he smiles, telling him to rub his belly more often, since bro is only like 18, but he's already rocking a dad bod just like my boy, Luka Doncic. Afterwards, after putting Eden in his place, he turns to the other two, asking if they also want him to let it rip, just like my Beyblades, but they instantly nope out. Nevertheless, the group continues on forward as they leave the captain Karim behind as he's too busy eating chicken from Jollibee. But Herring does not want to leave the captain on his own, but Maru tells him it's fine, since he's overpowered. Maru then tells him to not worry about him as he can handle himself, plus, if the group ever gets in trouble, he'll always show up, just like when he got captured. 
Suddenly, as if it's like a bad omen smoke, they realize they are getting flanked already, as the fog leaves them wide open. Wong then confirms the arrival, as he listens in closely, able to hear the sounds of furious women running straight towards Prince Behemoth. The trees behind them begin to topple, as if the girls heard there's a 50% off sale at Luluman, ready to seize and grab their target. Sussy Wong then enters his battle stance fully flustered, as he starts talking about how he missed seeing girls in person. Then, out of nowhere, Mira comes slashing through the bushes, as if she's watched some bleacher runs. As Herring blinks, Mira has already struck right at Wong, but he's able to stand his ground, while our boy yells in the background. Wong then attempts to compliment Mira, but unfortunately for him, Mira in into guise so that's some tough luck, buddy. Shortly after, Miss Alita Angel comes bursting through, moving faster than I can fart, swiftly cutting through the air. She then goes straight for Herring, but our author knows what he's doing with some of these angles, as if he's mastered the art of cake trigonometry. While still levitating from the ground, she combos straight into an uppercut, but Herring is able to dodge with ease. This confuses Alita, as she instead accidentally allowed Herring to have a free sample of her armpit scent, since his dodges are literally accurate to the millimeter. But the girls don't stop there as more and more from the elite squad begin to flood in, although they start to complement his battle prowess from every single dodge. Herring is even able to dodge a combo attack from two simultaneous directions, but he's still unable to draw his sword due to pressure from every single direction. With no ability to counterattack yet, he finds himself with his back turned to a cliff, as his situation has started to become a little bit sticky. But then, out of the corner of his eye, he spots the girl that every man wants, the one and only blue-haired Kristen Stewart. The girls then stop attacking as someone yells out for the noob to grab his sword and use it to protect his face. Arrows then begin to pelt him from afar, but he's able to successfully deflect and stop them with his sword, thanks to the person warning him. The black serang then appears from atop the trees, yelling at Herring that more rounds are coming, but this time, they are aiming at his leg. However, he's unable to react in time as one of the arrows actually penetrate through his non-existent armor. After smelling my fart, he accidentally falls backwards down a cliff, as he has trouble balancing himself with an injured leg. Herring then closes his eyes as he falls as his life begins to flash before him, wishing he at least had another rice cake smashing before his demise. But then, a speedy Gonzalez appears as a flash of lightning begins to ping-pong left and right down the hill. It turns out to be the Black Serang again as he's now basically tasked to be the babysitter of our golden boy. To save Herring, he had to leave behind the boys battling for their lives as Karim orders him to go after Herring. Although initially stopped in his tracks by a Ra, Karim steps in to duel her, allowing the Black Serang the chance to save Herring. Karim then instantly demands Era to explain why he chose a dweeb over his Sigma male status, since he's still unable to get over it. So she mentions that she's going to become queen, not exactly explaining her reasons why, until she asks about what he wants in the future. Karim then claims that he also wants to be king, but she retorts that if he indeed became king, he'll be exactly like the rest of his predecessors, unlike Herring. As such, the simp overlord erupts in anger due to another rejection, yelling at her that he actually only wanted to siege her rice cake, since she's useless anyways. But Ura is not even slightly affected by his words, as she knows he's way too weak to handle her. Eventually, Karim charges forward, aiming straight for Ura's twin dragons, totally engulfed in jealousy and madness. And so the two begin to battle, as Ura is able to easily match all his attacks, as if she's just toying with the strongest male swordsman. Meanwhile, we discover that Herring has somehow survived the fall, even though the Black Serang is nowhere to be found. As he attempts to nurture his legs, some kind of entity appears beyond the fog as if it's some kind of monster. Herring finds himself surprised as he realizes that the entity is coming straight at him. As the entity closes the distance between the two, Herring freaks out as he's never seen something look like this in his entire life. Herring then remembers the rumors of Beneath the Depths, where people claim that an evil spirit exists at the bottom, ready to devour his soul and body. Out of nowhere, Herring hears a sound, telling him to stop looking at him like some kind of evil spirit, so he tries to wipe his eyes. The story continues with Herring attempting to rub his eyes to make sure he's not seeing things. As he double-checks again, he realizes that there's now a new girl entering the fray, although the evil spirit is still coming straight at him. The girl then shows up with only the twin dragons protected, introducing herself as Cho, a member of the Elite 1000 Step Squad. She then claims that she's the reason Herring finds himself in 2011 again, so that's why he took an arrow to the knee. Regardless, Herring takes his time to introduce himself, as he's probably pulling a big brain move, so he can buy time for the evil spirit to close in on the girl from behind. However, unlike other girls from the girl-only nation, she's not as intrigued about his Prince Behemoth, so she whips out her weapon, ready to fire another arrow. 
But before she's able to attempt a shot, Herring instantly slings forward, faster than any guy can slide into a girl's DMs. As if possessed by a sussy Baka, he accidentally gets distracted by the twin dragons, so he's slower off the mark than usual. It also doesn't help that his injured leg is affecting his agility and balance, so he stutters a little bit. Nonetheless, his swift attack gets blocked, but the shockwaves from his attack will leave Chou wanting some hits in another special place later. It's then revealed that Herring was actually only using the back of his blade, otherwise he would have cut cleanly through, as if it was tofu. And so Cho's face does not change, although she's absolutely infuriated with the thought of a wolf going easy on her. As such, she launches her counter-attack, where Herring discovers that her speed can rival any one pump champions, as she's able to land a glancing hit straight into an arrow shot. But our boy is not too shabby himself as he's able to deflect two arrows while he's busy mid-blink. Eventually, Herring realizes he can't compete with her speed with his injury, so he yells to Cho that he'll be right back, claiming he just needs to buy some milk from the grocery store. As Herring cowardly runs, our cow lady knows that he isn't coming back as she's heard that before from her own dad. And so she chases after him, this time vowing to make sure that the men will always come back, hunting down men one at a time. Now, anyone else thinking what the heck happened to the purple spirit, because that's me right now. Anyway, shortly after, the Black Serang finally arrives at the location of the previous battle, where he's able to start tracking down Herang, due to the footprints he's left behind. As Kaolidi chases down Herang, she's dumbfounded that the boy would deliberately go deeper into the fog as he isn't wearing even some kind of mask. It also dawns on her that she didn't bring one either, so she needs to hurry up, or else she'll be screwed at any moment. Suddenly, she hears movement nearby her, so she instantly turns around and fires off a shot. But she misses, as the shadow looks like it's Herring, blaming her miss on the fog as Herring plays around with her third sense. This causes her to mentally snap as she changes her mind in capturing him alive. Instead, she claims she will only bring back the dead Prince Behemoth. Unfortunately, out of nowhere, she starts to feel super dizzy, as if her surroundings feel like they are closing in on her, while simultaneously looking all blurry. At the same time, she starts to lose her balance as well, but it was at this moment that she knew she screwed up. A mere second later, the legendary cow lady abruptly falls to the ground, ready to take a nap, but she still holds on tightly to her weapons. As she lays on the ground, the only thing she's able to see is the faint outline of Herring, standing over her. Her body trembles, knowing she lost, but her nightmare comes true. As the last thing she witnesses before passing out is Herring outbraining her with a mask given to him by his roommate earlier. Cho then finds herself waking up in the fog, where she feels like she's in some kind of alternate reality. She thinks to herself that this must be some kind of hallucination, and she gets surrounded by dozens of weird tree-looking monsters, as if all the evil spirits have become men. As they frighteningly scurry towards Cow Lady, a deep fear sets in her, as she witnesses something somewhat familiar. Upon getting a closer look, she stands there unable to move, as she realizes that the evil spirit of Jurujam is right in front of her. Eventually, she's able to vanquish the fear that was set deep within her soul, so she switches to her battle stance, ready to fight off her hallucination. But then I had to double-check the genre we were in, as what looks like tree branches start to grab hold of her from all directions. Now, good thing that these are just tree branches and nothing else is restricting her movement, so basically the hallucination could be real. Unfortunately for Cow Lady, I give her a small chance of winning against unlimited tree branches as our editor claims that everyone always loses to tree branches. Nonetheless, things take an even bigger turn, as the branches turn purple, signaling to us that it is absolutely game over for Chu. Now it wasn't just us that knew it was game over for her, as her own eyes is filled with a look of defeat. And so we declare the evil spirit tree the winner over Cow Lady with a score of 69 to 0. Luckily for tree branch haters, it turns out to be all just a crazy dream, due to the fog taking over her brain. As she regains her consciousness, she attempts to smack the dream out of her head, Unable to believe she just dreamt of tree branches taking over the cow. Regardless, after taking a moment to clear her frustration, she finds Herang sitting near her, taking watch as he waits for backup to find him. She then reaches for her collar, trying to see if Herang retrieved it from her, while knocked unconscious, but our boy is too much of a man to do that. As a token of appreciation, she decides to gank him from behind, amazed at how Herang is able to sleep soundly, even though he's dreaming of the evil spirit. And so, after the gank, she's able to help him get warm, as the two are kind of stuck in a sticky situation, deep inside the forest of evil. Eventually, Cow Lady finally warms up to the idea of the Prince Behemoth, as she subtly brings up how both of them need to keep each other warm during the night. But since Herring is a Sigma male, he doesn't even need to say anything as the Cow Lady finally starts to inch closer and closer. Cow Lady then brings up her collar as both of them know some rice cake destroying is up for grabs as long as he asks for them. 
So Harry does ask, allowing Chu to quickly hand her collar to him. While claiming how so many wolves have failed to win her collar. Regardless, as Harry receives the collar, Chu hints that she wants to go for the rice cake siege now, instead of the rice cake siege later at Puzzle. So to comply to her wishes as a gentleman, he decides now is the time as he can't keep the banana plantation hidden forever. Meanwhile, Herring smiles as he finds out how strong the banana tree is today, since it's able to withstand the extreme cold using no effort at all. Now I know that her facial expressions barely change, but trust me, she got scared, when she finally witnessed what a true banana tree behemoth actually looks like. Eventually, she cosplays a starfish on the ground, ready to accept her destiny as a seed extractor. She then closes her eyes as she slowly plants herself into the banana plantation for the first time, finally able to experience an attack aimed at the gates of the cow. However, Chu yells she's having some trouble with the tree plantation, as the door allowing the extraction was not large enough. But with every single problem comes a solution, so he turned on her sprinklers, allowing the banana tree to pass through, due to excess water seeping out the soil. Nevertheless, as the two continue the rice cake evolution, Herring sits there being chilling, while Cho tries her hardest to make sure her stomach doesn't explode. Meanwhile, we discover that Wong is still battling Mira all this time, with neither losing or giving up yet. But since it's taking forever, Mira attempts a forbidden move as she flashes a single dragon at Wong, causing him to get distracted. With the onset of the forbidden tactic, Wong's face makes direct contact with a slashing elbow from Mira. She then follows up with a combo attack, allowing Mira to pin him straight to the ground, where she declares herself winner. As Wong lays on his back defeated, Mira hands him a consolation prize using her hands as she helps scale Wong's own banana tree. After giving him a quick taste of the consolation prize, she reveals to him that the gomage is going to take place soon. As she takes her leave, she reminds Wong to make sure he takes care of his body until the next time they meet at the gomage. Meanwhile, Maru also learns of the gomage, so his energy gets replenished with a second wind as blood comes rushing from his plantation. With the sudden increase of energy levels, he tries to clap back at Miss Alita Angel, but she's able to match his every attack. Unlike Mira and Wong, Maru and Alita stop fighting as they instead sit down to take a break, hurling insults at each other instead. Afterwards, the girl looking like she's from Hunter x Hunter stops as well, worried that Cho has not returned after an entire day. She then starts feeling flustered as she thinks back to how unique Herang's movement was, so she starts wondering if Herang is currently taking her rice cake. As Pink Girl continues day dreaming of her friend being besieged by Prince Behemoth, she eventually snaps out of it, quickly leaving the area to search for him. Back with the cow and the wolf, it's revealed that the two are still going at it, as if it's now turned into some kind of competition. But Chu is like that one friend that always loses, but they always ask for a rematch, sweating their hardest to try and win just once. As Chu loses over and over, we discover that Ara and Karim is still fighting as well. Unfortunately for Captain Karim, he was only able to land a single hit on her, but at least it was aimed at a very nice spot. On the other hand, it looks like that the strongest swordsman of wolves is unable to handle just one single girl, as he looks much worse off. Herring also lives rent-free in Karim's head, as the only insults he can hurl at Ara is how he can't see Herring ever becoming king. And so Ara has had enough, although she doesn't want to destroy his soul, she charges in for the final blow. But don't worry guys, as Herring is also going for the final blow, as he charges forward one final time with the mythical tree. In the end, Herring wins the battle easily, as he once again conquered another member of the elite Crimson Foxes. On the other hand, Karim is unable to land any more hits, even though he's fully powered up as Ara decides she will finally try. As such, with the blink of an eye, Karim finds himself utterly defeated, as our girl finally stopped trolling as a smurf, revealing to the world she's Radiant Rank 1. The story continues with the battle ending between the two legendary swordsmen of all time. To no surprise, the chosen captain of the men-only nation lost, since his simp can never overcome his queen. After being fed up of Karim's antics, Ara starts to ponder about whether or not she should finally destroy him, since he's now just an annoying nuisance to her. Just as she's about to decide, her third eye activates, allowing her to detect an enemy aiming at her, as if she's Wraith from Apex Legends. As such, she turns towards the direction of the threat, only to discover that the Black Serang has reappeared as backup for the fallen elite captain. But just as the boys thought they finally have the upper hand, the Black Serang noticed some strong energy flowing from behind. With him quickly checking behind him, he sees the girl from Hunter x Hunter, asking him how long he thinks it would take for her to instantly appear behind him. But with a stone-cold face, he claps back, claiming that she's probably not as fast as his fingers, but it feels like the two are talking about something else. Nevertheless, the pink-haired girl gets the last laugh as she questions him if he's ever landed a shot on a raw using his fingers. 
Of course she hasn't, as literally no man can stand up to the power of the future queen. So she instead insists on the two exchanging information instead. Now the true reason she's here is not because Ara needed help, but because she's still looking for Prince Behemoth and Cow Lady, as they are still missing. And so the wolves and crimson foxes procure a temporary truce as the group discovers that the two have not returned from Eagle Canyon. As Ara gets briefed on their last location, Karim lays on the ground as he witnesses the girl he loves instantly rush off to simp for Herring. This is basically the age-old tale of unrequited love, so remember to move on guys and girls or else you'll find yourself a forever simp like this guy. Anyways, he goes crazy like a Discord mod as he watches Ara zoom off into the distance, as if he's a tier 3 sub of Amaranth, finally finding out she has a husband. Meanwhile, back to the two lovebirds deep within the foggy forest, we discover Herring laying on the ground, looking like his soul has been literally sucked out of him. On the other hand, Chu looks better than usual, so it's literally like real life as girls always notice when another girl is getting some good rice cake sieges in her life. Regardless, right before Chu leaves the cave the two were stuck in, she tells him that she can't wait to see him again, since she might get lucky at the go mage. With the thought of being able to get more rice cake destroying in the future, Herring instantly recovers his energy, so he gives him the thumbs up sign. But then he collapses right after, unable to believe that she was able to withstand the Prince Banana Plantation for so long. Nonetheless, Chu finally leaves, and as she flies off to head back to headquarters, she cosplays Kakashi as she covers her other eye just for good looks. As Cow Lady tracks back the way to the main headquarters of the Crimson Foxes, she realizes that Herring pulled off the impossible as he carried her while injured up an insane mountain. Now that's not too shabby for someone she looked down on for a long time, right before he was able to set his rocket boosters on max force inside her property. Eventually, after resting a bit more, Herring replenishes enough energy, allowing him to attempt an escape from the hostile territory. As he treads carefully in uncharted areas, his eye catches a flashing light from deep down the gorge. At first, he didn't pay much attention to it, but over time, he became fixated on the flashing blue light. Could the blue light be some kind of eel ghost, or could it be the rarest ever blue columbine to be found as quality indeed increases exponentially the further you go? Regardless, our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle finally makes an appearance, as he's stuck hiding behind his shield due to constant attacks flying in. It's then revealed that the attacks are coming from another elite Crimson Fox member, the same one that Mira has a sussy relationship with. Anyways, as the Blondie continues with an onslaught of attacks, all the turtle does is camp and defend, since that's exactly his specialty. Unfortunately, the battle between the two is literally just a snore fest, since it's a duel between an unstoppable force versus an immovable object. But out of nowhere, Ara comes speeding through from behind, catching our turtle boy by surprise. However, she doesn't deliver a finishing blow to the wolf, since she used his head as a trampoline instead, helping her push further on ahead. As she passes by, she exchanges eye contact with her own member, but our author has combined cake trigonometry with twin dragon derivatives. A true masterpiece indeed, as even her own subordinate is surprised to see Ara moving faster than the speed of light, just so she can rescue the Prince Behemoth. If anyone ever says size does not matter, just remember, you can have your own mega simp if you become as gigantic as our Prince Behemoth. In the end, Narblani pulls out the typical stereotype as it took her a couple minutes to realize she's heading straight towards Jurujan. Meanwhile, Eden feels absolutely humiliated after not being able to react fast enough, as Irai used him exactly like how Mario would use a mushroom to jump higher. Luckily for our plump boy, for some unknown reason, the Blondie decides to give him her collar as if she's hanging it over him as a consolation prize. She then waves it in front of his face like a treat for a dog, asking Eden if he's even slightly curious that Prince Behemoth will be facing off against the future queen of the entire female race at Puzzle. He ignores the question, but he closes his eyes to turn into a savage, so he tells Blondie that although she's not exactly his type, he will accept her offer anyways. Unfortunately, his hardball attempt fails as Blondie sends him flying into the sky like Teen Rocket blasting off again. On the other hand, a black figure appears from afar but you can only see one eye open. With a single blink, Ara closes the gap with no hesitation, only to find an absolutely puzzled Chu staring right at her. But before Cow Lady is able to move, Ara quickly grabs her face, noting that her skin is more tight and shiny than usual, so you know for a fact that girls can tell from a mile away. Ara also discovers that Cho's collar is missing, so she is absolutely flustered as her captain questions her about what happened to her collar. Nevertheless, she changes the subject and asks if Harry is okay, only for Chu to reveal that he's still located back at the Forbidden Forest. And with the onset of the updated information, she continues her sip run to Herring even after she's learned that three of her own comrades have already done the rice cake fusion with our boy. 
Now this is the power of the Prince Behemoth as no girl cares that Herring is made for the streets. Herring's Prince Behemoth is so overpowered, that he unknowingly made Ira risk her life by causing her to jump into the Forbidden Void, just so she could make sure she can secure a future rice cake attack. Even Cho is helplessly forced to watch her squad captain take the most dangerous route down as it's the fastest way for her to reach her prince. Meanwhile, Herring struggles climbing up, but he trudges on towards what he thinks is the correct direction out of the area. Luckily for our boy, his educated guess was right as he ends up encountering a welcome surprise. As he looks up, he realizes that the boots he initially saw belonged to none other than Ara herself. She then finally smiles as her worried look escapes away, happy to see that Herring is still in one piece. He then clings onto the edge of the cliff, unsure on what to do, as Ira doesn't even lend a helping hand and she just stands there staring at him. Instead, she takes the moment to take a good look at Herring, complimenting his face, telling him that she finds his face fun. Eventually, she finally lends a hand, and as she does, she tells Herring to not worry since she won't eat him, although she probably wants him to do the opposite with her. Nevertheless, after an entire day, Herring is able to rest, as he has finally escaped the evil forest with the help of a crimson fox. However, as he rests, he notices that Era is just sitting next to him, busy staring at him, almost looking like she's seen a boy for the first time. Herring says nothing to break the silence, so she ends up smiling, as if she's having a solo conversation in her head. But Herring gets a little bit scared as he ends up wondering if the reason why she's being super creepy is because she's getting ready to capture him. However, she does not deny or confirm his suspicions, but the future queen is starting to look like the crazy type, but at least they can make your head go super hazy. Nonetheless, Ara explains the old tradition of how warriors should not attempt to fight an enemy that just recently finished a battle, so she continues to tell him to not worry too much. But then, out of nowhere, she dropped a nuclear bomb, asking if Herring wants to try and become king. In an instant, Herring's face transforms into what looks like a fried banana, as he didn't expect Ara to ever ask that question. Regardless of his current facial reaction, she keeps staring him down, telling him that she will help her the best she can, so he should give it a shot. It was at this moment that Herring started to have flashbacks to the time his father always told him that he's destined to become king one day. He even remembers a time where his dad told him to give it a shot of attempting to become king, as his dad claims that he too will help him, so maybe Ara is actually his dad in disguise. Maybe that's why Herring still has not experienced the rice cake of Ara, since she's going to transform into his father soon. But isn't April Fools anymore, so Herring decides to actually entertain the idea of becoming king since she's repeating the same things that his father always said. It's then revealed that the reason why Ara wants him to become king is because she's trying to reunite the two separated nations back to a unified front where it belongs. With all the unification talks, Herring feels a little bit uneasy, as he starts to think she should ask Karim instead, since he's stronger. However, she explains that when it comes to women or men in this world, Everything boils down to their face and Karim does not have the face of a king. And so Herring shyly asks if she thinks he has the face of the king, but she doesn't reply. Instead, she changes the subject and tells him that she can't wait to have fun with him at Puzel, so she's looking forward to the next time they meet. After the two exchange their goodbyes, Ara just flies off into the horizon, leaving Herring behind, barely even helping him at all. So he just sits there, until a hand randomly reaches out from nowhere. His wish of wanting to fly is swiftly granted, as the boys have come to finally rescue him. And for the first time, Herring witnesses Wung's smile as the boys are proud of him surviving the Forbidden Forest. In the end, Herring passes out while Wong carries him back home to headquarters with Maru, but the two elite Garimbi members are busy making fun of the new. As they continue to make fun of a passed out Herring, Maru starts to complain about how heavy Herring's bag is, but something is seen glowing inside the bag. With the group making their way back home slowly, Neither veteran members realize that Herring has actually done it, he retrieved the blue light from beyond the depths. The story continues with the top elite squad from both nations withdrawing from the battle. The only people left are those deemed to be second class, exactly like those diamond players with the ego of a pro player. Luckily for the second class men with their skills not up to par, they still get allowed to enjoy some rice cake attacks, as the girls still need to extract seeds. However, for the girls, they expected a chance to experience the Prince Behemoth, but they came a day late, so all they receive is the reward of disappointment. Meanwhile, Herring finally wakes up inside the Garimbia Lee caravan, only to find the King Simp staring him down. You might feel bad for Karim since Bro lost another duel against his one true love, but then she left him on the floor just so she could go simp for Herring. Regardless of Karim's unending stare, Herring decides to pretend to sleep since he can't handle the awkwardness. Luckily for our boy though, he woke up near the end of the journey, as the caravan is almost all the way back at home headquarters. 
As the first elite squad returning home after the invasion of the Crimson Fox territory, Kareem is forced to complete an after-action report to detail what occurred. Eventually, the commander of the Garimbi elite learns of the fact that Herring has dominated another elite Crimson Fox whom happens to be a famed sniper of the 1000 Steps. In just a couple days, Herring has already destroyed the rice cakes of two of the most powerful within the Crimson Foxes, and he did so all on his own. Not only that, but both Foxes wanted the rice cake explosion right there and then, instead of the usual duel at Puzel. Now eager to learn more, our sussy commander decides to ask for excruciating detail on what happened, but Kareem tells him to ask Herring himself, since that ain't his business. And so the commander snaps back to reality, thus he asks for the results of the mission, as the entire point of the invasion was to steal some flowers. Originally, the mission was going to be a failure as they mostly wanted high-quality blue columbines, but the commander discovers that Herring was also the one that was able to retrieve the highest quality of them all. Not only was Herring able to send his rocket to help Chua experience another world, but he also single-handedly carried the mission for the entire nation of men. The quality of the blue columbine is so insane that you can see it literally glow from over a mile away, as if it's some kind of blinking runway. Nevertheless, the head analyst of the wolves revealed to the commander that this columbine is literally the greatest of all, but my goat is Team Solomid. Anyways, on the other end of the spectrum is the Elite 1000 Step Squad also returning back to home headquarters. This time, the girls reveal to their Black Thorn that Shu actually completed the Sussy Sussy with Prince Behemoth, much to the surprise of everyone. Cho was literally the one least enthralled about a Prince Behemoth, so it's basically like your feminist friend being the first one to jump on to get their rice cake destroyed. With the revelation that Chu lost to a noob like the Prince Behemoth, the Black Thorn member could not believe her ears, so she kept on repeating her questions. Eventually, she stopped pestering Mira, so she asked for Ra to come in instead, but her orders are coupled with her seemingly going crazy with a hysterical laugh. Nevertheless, Ra reports to their Black Thorn leader as requested, only to be interrogated with the same questions. After some time, she finally started to believe Ara, so she changed the subject to whether or not she was able to win against the King Simp again. Of course, she says since Ara is literally the strongest on the planet, and she would never lose to a tier 3 sub of hers. Suddenly, the turntables turn, as the lady notifies Ara that Herring has confirmed the date of the rice cake duel at Puzel, where it will take place exactly three days from now. As such, she orders Ara to make sure she's thoroughly prepared, since Prince Behemoth might have something up his sleeve, since he's been undefeated ever since he got discovered. Nonetheless, Ara confirms to her superior that she will be super ready for that day, and so she leaves the room only for Ara to get caught smiling for the first time. Fast forward to later in the afternoon, we find that Chu is undergoing an exam as her rice cake was able to succeed in its mission. Yeah, so like, this is exactly what you think it is, and they basically used it on Chu during the exam. Now that's something pretty weird, but then again, we are in very cultured territory. Regardless, as the exam finishes, Chuo had to stick some kind of contraption within the rice cake, just so they could collect some of Herring's banana tree seed samples. And as Chuo suits back up, the lady doing the exam starts going on a rant about how, due to her unfortunate genes, she will probably never get to experience a rice cake smashing in her life. Luckily for her, Chuo decides to ask her if she wants to be recommended to the upcoming Gomage since she might be able to pull some strings. With the shocking revelation that Chu would actually do something so considerate, the lady gets overjoyed as she's never thought the day would come. As such, she sends Chuo her best wishes, hoping that she does get the chance to get pregnant, just like Youngji. With the unexpected reveal that Youngji is actually confirmed to have successfully completed her life mission, Chu is left stunned, unable to fathom that Herring's C is super effective. Now speak of the devil, Herring finds himself back in his room resting, busy dreaming about Ara and the chance to destroy the strongest rice cake in just a few days. As he continually dreams about her, he accidentally starts sleep talking, but this time Wong is sitting there, watching him the entire time. Wong then smiles, happy to hear that other people also get called having a funny looking face, so he starts talking to Herring in his sleep. Upon hearing Wong talk, Herring wakes up from his dreams, absolutely petrified to see Wong since Herring has a massive morning banana tree up due to his dreams. But hipster Wong doesn't even notice, as he's too preoccupied talking about how girls tell him his face looks funny. However, he reveals to Herring that people from the royal palace are here to see him. He then threatens Herring to make sure he never goes after Mira, as he calls dibs on her rice cake. But Herring can't really help it if an entire nation of girls are desperate to have him. So he asks what happens if Mira is the one that hands her collar over to him. And with a hypothetical question, Wong answers by claiming that he will probably destroy him if she does. Nevertheless, with his own roommate now aware of how strong Herring is, our boy heads out, ready to meet some higher-ups from the palace. 
However, as he walks out of his room, the entire place goes quiet and all eyes start to drift towards him. While not looking, Herring's Ultra Instincts activates as he instantly dodges a surprise attack from one of the second class members. And like a true Sigma male, Herring just keeps walking on as if nothing even happened, leaving the rest dismayed that Herring is actually some kind of Super S rank member. Unfortunately for the guy who threw the knife, the Black Serang saw everything, so he warned him to never attempt anything like that again, or face utter destruction. It then turns out that most of the second class members are super jealous of Herring as he's now evolved into Mr. Steal Your Girl, even though he doesn't even try. Afterwards, Herring finds himself in a room with his commander, and two Imperial Palace intelligence officers. One of the members happens to be Sam's son, who looks like some kind of lizard man. The other looks like some kind of Viking, turned into medieval spy named Gangpo Hammon. They then disclose to Herring that the two have been apparently stalking him for a long time now, when only recently has he been noteworthy. But Sun claims that the only reason they were tasked to spy on him is because he was raised by the legendary Mukbun. And now the time has come for the two to cheer him on at Puzel, as the wolves have decided the time Herring will be battling Ara. In exactly three days, Herring must get ready, and these two officers will be the ones accompanying him on his way to Puzel. Heyman also tells Herring that even the King of the Wolves is super interested in what happens to him at Puzel, so he asks Herring to not let the wolves down. Now imagine being Corinne right now as everyone in the entire world is talking about Ara's rice cake, meeting his banana plantation in three days. If you think about it, the only thing that could get worse for Karim is if he had to sit there and watch Ara meet Prince Behemoth for the first time. Regardless, back at the elite Crimson Fox's headquarters, the Blondie has picked out a dress for Ara to wear for the upcoming battle at Puzel. Ara then tries it on, where she then finds herself wanting to keep twirling like a ballerina. But the Blondie is super great with things like these, so she reminds Ara to always pump her twin dragons out as that's one of the main points of the dress. It was at this moment that the rest of the girls started scrubbing their eyes, unable to believe that they are actually witnessing a Ra wearing something other than combat clothes. From always destroying every man she encounters, and now she's trying to look pretty like a princess, since she knows she's up against Prince Behemoth next. Meanwhile, back at the Black Wolves' castle, everyone is still fixated on the one Columbine that Herring was able to bring back. But it turns out that these guys are actually up to no good, as they start developing potions from the Columbines, so now they actually have enough for a single trial run. And so the two mysterious men in white made their way to the opposite end of the castle, where it's revealed that they have stationary guards for a special place. We then discover that inside the special place is actually the previous strongest person on the planet, the old rank one in all the Crimson Foxes elite, captured in a dark corner. The story continues with the evil bad anime men arming themselves with a mysterious test potion, planning to use it on the old rank 1 swordsman of the Crimson Fox's elite. Afterwards, we discover that her name is actually Green Nare, and the only reason she's chained and in a pickle right now is because the current queen of the foxes betrayed her. Nare now finds herself in a very compromising position, placed in a corner of a dark room, as one of the bad men comes closer, eager to test the potion on an S-rank elite member. To activate the potion, he lights it up in front of her, and the man explains that the potion will make her deeply crave a banana plantation inside her walls. And so, it turns out to be some kind of screwed-up love potion, created to make sure any girl in the world will start begging for battering rams to attack. It's also revealed that Nare has been able to withstand every potion up to this day, but thanks to Herang, they now have a potion with maximum possible quality achieved. Unfortunately for her, she actually failed to resist this quality, allowing for some ugly man to make quick use of his banana plantation into the captured fox. As such, she was able to experience reaching the top of the mountain for the first time in over a decade, allowing the men to declare the former rank one as utterly defeated. Upon finishing the trials, the head bad guy in charge of creating the potion made his way to the Black Wolves King to report on his success. Eager to learn more, he instantly asks if he succeeded, since the king is a sussy backa after all. With the former rank one unable to withstand the power of the Blue Dew, the man claims that no female in the world will be able to resist the power of the potion. As such, the Black Wolf King can now break out of Shell, as his ultimate plan is starting to take hold. He then grins as he starts proclaiming that they are perfectly right on time, as Herang will soon battle Ara for the first time at Puzel. However, the King has no trust in a rookie properly using the Blue Dew, so he orders a covert mission to be prepared, just so they could actually test the effects in a real battle. It's also revealed that the King plans to attack during this year's special Gomage Festival, so I bet the boys are going to get disappointed when they learn their rice cake attacks will be interrupted. Regardless, the king summoned every Black Ops captain of the wolves, but surprisingly, he initially asked them to attempt destroying him. 
But the man has the supervillain overpowered plot armor in anime, so there's no way the Black Ops has any chance. Nonetheless, every single captain charged forward at the king only for him to start hysterically laughing like a maniac. Meanwhile, back at the Wolves' special headquarters, Maru gives advice to Herring as our boy is busy trying on clothes as if he's going to prom for the first time. Maru then starts teaching Herring how to be a Sigma male, as he needs to be ready, that is, if he actually wants pound cake at the Gomage. As such, Herring stops being a slouch and attempts to look like a noble wolf ready to pounce at some perfectly fine rice cakes. Maru also lets Herang know that at Puzel, they won't be actually dueling through combat, but instead, it's all about the special skills they learn using their rockets. And so, Maru threatens Herang to not let the nation of men down, as they are all counting on him to tame the legendary Ara, as every single one of them dreamed of eating that special rice cake. Fast forward to the evening, where Herring learns that he has a surprise visitor waiting to meet him in person. So Herring hurries to make his way to the main hall, but he has no idea on who the visitor could be, since he literally became part of the Gurimbi less than a week ago. Maybe it's just a prank bro, as he finds no one waiting for him at the public hall. Suddenly, Herring feels cold air flowing down his spine, as if his ultra instincts are tingling due to a ghost waiting to appear. But then he finally realized that there's actually a man waiting right beside him looking like a wannabe male version of Yor. In an instant, male Yor Forger goes for a quick knee to his face. But our boy is from the Matrix, so he's able to somehow dodge the surprise knee attack. But the man combos into another side spike kick. Luckily, Herring is able to dodge again, as if he leveled up his evasion stats to 99. However, the visitor is ruthless, as he gives Herring no time to relax, so he continues charging at him with multiple hits. Eventually, Herring gets a good look at the man's face, allowing him to notice that he has a very nice mustache, almost as nice as Pedro Pascal's mustache. As the Mandalorian attempts another hit, Herring realizes that it's actually his dad in disguise, confused as to why he's attacking him right now. With him finally exposed as a cool father, he stops attacking, and instead, he starts telling Herring how he's super happy to see him all healthy still. But then his father screams it's just a prank, so he starts attacking again, attempting to get a good hit at his own son. Mukbom even started cosplaying John Cena, as he repeatedly started yelling the champ is here, while also chanting you can't see me over and over. Now Mukbom is a true dad, since he basically gave Herring the gift of becoming the Prince Behemoth, while training him into an ultimate monster able to dodge any attack from anyone. Eventually, Herring gets enough of his antics, so he frustratingly parries an attack and proceeds to take him down by grabbing hold of his leg. He then smacks him so hard that Mukbom's mustache and dignity flew far away into the distance, allowing Herring to get even more riled up. But then he channeled his inner Karen, asking Herring how cruel must he be to punch an old man, telling him that it's not okay to mistreat your elders. Unfortunately, Herring's father's guilt tripping does not work on him as he claps back, asking what kind of father tries to destroy his own son. In the end, the two stop battling as Muk reveals he brought over some delicious marinated beef for Herring to eat. As two began to sat down to watch Herring eat some amazing Korean food, Herring asks why he's trying to cosplay some kind of K-pop star stuck in the military. But Muk denies having an ulterior motive other than wanting to just see his son, to make sure he's okay after being uprooted into the life of the elite. Out of nowhere, Herring starts hearing voices of people he's not familiar with, busy talking about delivering some products. At the same time, one of the unknown voices came knocking at the dining hall, where Muk orders them that it's time they take a break. As such, Herring gets disappointed when he learns that his dad is actually not just here for him specifically, but it's because he's here for business. It's then revealed that Mook's business is super suspect as he's out here delivering perfectly real-life replicas of women as training dolls for the special forces. Upon further inspection, the dolls literally look like their real-life counterparts, as these specifically are the newest versions from the legendary man. The boys then go wild at the sight of the dolls as most have never even seen a girl in their lifetimes. With the onslaught of men cheering at the sight of Mukbum's new masterpieces, the commander quickly appears, wanting to join in on the fun. As Herring's father gets ready to leave, the commander makes a side note remark of how it's a shame he's so talented, it decides to give up on the special forces in pursuit of creating dolls. Even though he's a god at creating them, the commander reveals that the Shadow Ops try their hardest to keep him from retiring. Meanwhile, the two intelligence officers in charge of keeping eye on Herring watches on in secret, as they spy on their target for more information. They even continue their conversation, talking about how it's a pity Wookbaum decided to pursue dolls instead of pursuing greatness. We also discover that the higher-ups dreamed of him challenging the king for the throne, since he was actually the strong, but he never did. Nonetheless, as he leaves, he tells Herring that he needs him here with the big boys and proceeds to tell him to keep up the good work. 
He then reminds Herring to always remember what he said, that Herring is destined to become king. As Mokbom leaves, he encounters Karim on his way out, but he takes a moment to stare at him, telling him that throughout all this time, he still has the same old dull face. But then, the turntables turn as Karim reveals he only showed up to ask the legendary Mook a chance for a duel. Karim then claims that the reason he wants to challenge him is because he's the closest in power relative to the king. Since his goal is to become king one day, he needs to overthrow the current one. However, as Herring minds his own business, he starts attempting to direct Karim to duel Herring instead, telling Karim that the strongest woman on the planet chose to give her collar to Herring for a reason. He then shouts at Karim, telling him to not underestimate his son, as his genes were passed down to him, maybe hinting that Mook also has a prince behemoth himself. Regardless, Mook continues to leave while Karim begs him for a chance to duel, only for Mook to ask Karim to make sure he takes care of his son. But bro is stubborn as heck asking for Mook to just give him a few seconds, since that's how long he will last if Ara gave him the chance to enter her gates. However, the atmosphere instantly changes after Mook gets annoyed with Karim asking for a few more seconds, as if he's a final boss entering his rage phase. With the sudden change in atmosphere, Karim whips out his sword, quickly entering his battle stance as he thinks he accidentally provoked the bear. With Mook now turned to Karim, the clouds around him begin to turn black as if he's about to deliver a thundering punch like One Punch Man. But instead, he trolls Karim as he begins cosplaying an old Naruto, telling him to make sure that both of them get along together. Finally, the old man leaves as he waves them on, but he acts as if he called Karim his son as well, telling them both to have some sweet dreams. Now imagine if these two are actually brothers, and the younger brother accidentally stole the older brother's girl, but then she turned out to be their sister. And that is what we would call a real plot twist. Nevertheless, back at the Society of Women Only, the girls find themselves fighting each other as they attempt to teach Era some sussy moves since she's a first-timer. Meanwhile, the girl from Hunter x Hunter watches on nervously as the girls try to pin down Era, but instead of joining them, she starts eating some snacks since she looks like a first-timer as well. The first to give up on teaching Era how to handle a rocket is Alita Battle Angel, so she starts eating some sausages. In the end, all the other girls give up as well, so they start having some gossip girl moments as they begin talking about how crazy Era is for wanting her first time to be with the biggest rocket on the planet. As the girls continue to gossip, Era continues to eat, but Blondie starts doing weird things to the food as she stares at Era. As such, Era decides to go to sleep as everyone is making such a big deal out of her being a first-timer, claiming she needs lots of sleep or else she gains zits. And so they let her go, as the girls realize that Ira wants the first rice cake experience to be as natural as possible. The story continues with all the anime girls dispersing, so Mira decides to do a quick workout before heading to bed. As she pumps some iron, we figure out why the girls' only nation is stronger than the men, since they can't even squat as much as her. Regardless, Mira gets distracted as she hears someone walk by, only to discover an unusual sight as Chu is without her combat gear. Now, she just looks like a usual civilian instead of the feared sniper with her signature weapon and cow-like clothes. However, the Crimson Foxes now need to get used to Cho on maintenance leave after Herring destroyed her with his rice cake attack. As such, she's now responsible for helping the human race continue on, since the girls are the only ones that can reproduce. Meanwhile, a blurry Ara getting ready for bed, hears two quick knocks on her door, although she's not expecting anyone to visit her during this hour. It's then revealed that the surprise visitor is actually Chu. Now that would be pretty weird if you ask me, since these girls are all sharing the same prince behemoth. Nevertheless, Ara opens the door for her and like a true menace, starts eating chocolate right after she brushed her teeth. Ara then offers to share a piece exactly just like them sharing herring, but Chu refuses, telling her she ain't want no cavities. Chu then starts lecturing Ara about not snacking right before bed, but she doesn't care at all, as food is the only thing that might separate her from experiencing the prince behemoth. And so, Komen decides to change the subject, wanting to know why she decided to visit her late at night, right before her pusal duel. Without sugarcoating it, Chu reveals that Youngji is confirmed to be pregnant after experiencing the Prince Behemoth explode, shocking Ara. The future queen also learns that Chu received her information from a trusted source, so she starts explaining that if Youngji could get pregnant, then so could she. Chu continues on by warning her, that if both the elite members succumb to Herring's powers, then it's highly likely that it'll be Ara's turn next. However, Ara responds by asking her why she's being so serious right now, since it's pretty obvious what could happen. But it turns out that Chu is trying to be a good friend, as she wants Ara to know that the higher-ups are keeping it a secret about Youngji. Since Ara wants to be queen one day, Chu starts questioning the intentions of the Rank 1 swordsman on the planet, as her plans will get ruined if she becomes pregnant. 
But out of nowhere, a Ra interrupts her, revealing the true reason why she chose Herring. So she uses her hands to explain how Herring is way above national average in regards to average banana tree size. Unfortunately, her joke doesn't resonate with Cho as she has first-hand experience in battle with a prince behemoth as thick as Herring. In the end, Ra cuts all formalities as she tells the truth, claiming that Herring is the man for her, since he makes her smile without him even trying. And so our queen gives us a valuable lesson to all boys out there, reminding you guys to just have a huge banana plantation going and you'll be set for life. Nonetheless, after hearing the experience Chu had with Herring, Ara is more confident than ever that Herring is the man, since even she was surprised herself when she gave him her collar. In the end, Ara wishes Chu the best, as we discover that Cow Lady always dreamed of having a child, and now she might get the chance to fulfill her dream and retire from the special forces. As Shua leaves the room, she still can't shake the feeling that Era is walking into a trap. She then reveals that the legendary green Nere was betrayed by the higher-ups, having the exact same circumstances as Ara, due to her challenging the queen for the throne, while also successfully extracting a seed from an elite wolf. Regardless, it seems as if Chuo has turned into a simp for Herring, as her inner true self wants to keep Herring from any danger he didn't sign up for. Meanwhile, Ara starts outside her bedroom window as she cuddles with a real-life fox, where she tells herself that she's at peace with her decision. Fast forward the next morning, Herring's name echoes through the elite headquarters, telling our boy to hurry up. And so he swiftly runs out of his room looking better than usual, as today is a day every man marks on their calendar, since it's time for some legendary rice cake destroying. To Herring's surprise, even the Ninja Turtle has somehow scored a duel at Puzzle, but seriously, who's the mysterious girl willing to risk it all with this mad lad? Nevertheless, the chosen elite to destroy rice cakes for the day all line up outside headquarters as they all will arrive together at the promised land. Right before everyone departs, Beck Mu appears, revealing to the unit that he's the one spearheading the mission of palace intelligence and others will also accompany them in case things go wrong. However, all the higher-ups start making fun of Herring, begging him to remove his scarf since it's apparently not manly, but he refuses to do so, explaining that it's his good luck charm. Meanwhile, Maru the nerd and the sussy hipster looks on from behind, unable to believe their rookie and the round boy Eden get to go to Puzzle, while they have to stay back. Things then take a turn as the two start discussing rumors that the wolves have something planned for this special occasion, so the duo is unable to be happy for their squad mates due to an uneasy aura about the event. But truth be told, the boys are probably just jealous that a brand new noob is sweeping every rice cake around day by day without trying. Anyways, as they continue their journey to the promised land, not a single person talks on the caravan, so it's awkward as heck. Like real introverts, both Herring and Eden try their hardest to not make eye contact with anyone, just to make sure they don't have to make some small talk. Unfortunately, Herring messes up as he catches the gaze of one of them, so he starts laughing at him, causing Herring's mouth to transform into the forbidden other hole. With the two Shadow Ops members laughing hysterically, Mu turns around to look at Herring, telling him no pressure. But then he tells him that the entire pride of the wolves are on the line. With the failed attempt to ease the rookie's feelings, he just nods on as he attempts to shrug off the weight of the entire male population as they want him to win the duel instead of him exploding first. Upon finally arriving at the gates of their destination, one of the men on guard make a remark about how they thought the Prince Behemoth would look more rugged. Regardless, they open the gates, allowing them in, but that's why you never judge a book by its cover, since it could be hiding something huge. The caravan then slowly continued on with no one in sight, other than a huge valley overlooking the palace of Puzzle. As they get closer to the esteemed arena built for rice cake destroying, Herring gets awestruck, as he didn't realize it was so huge, and it even had a waterfall underneath. Eventually, Herring is able to take his first steps outside the doors of Puzzle, only for Mu to reveal that this place actually used to be the headquarters for the Crimson Foxes. Mu then gets interrupted as the boys stop paying attention, due to them noticing the timely arrival of the elite foxes, on the opposite end of the road. Now for the first time ever, Ara dons a dress of crimson color in front of a man, stunning every man within vicinity, due to her finally not looking like Elle from Death Note. She actually looks great in color, so no wonder Karim is such an ultimate simp for this girl. Regardless, Ara makes her way in front of the steps of Puzo with sword in hand, facing her future rice cake destroyer, with Mu and the Black Thorn leader watching. After staring at each other for quite some time, the future queen finally opens her mouth, but she only says hi, causing Herring to accidentally let it slip with him saying she's so beautiful. Unfortunately, Herring receives no compliment back as Arab just says he looks okay, since what really matters is what you're packing, I mean, your heart. Luckily for Herring, his embarrassment gets some relief as the black thorn steps in, ordering him to hurry up, since she's a grumpy oldie. 
However, Mu tells her to stop being so uptight, since today is a rare occasion with the main course being two first-timers. But his attempt at easing tensions fails, so Mu ends up going through with tradition, introducing everyone, including the main man, Herring, member of the Garimbia elite. He also introduces Eden, causing the Blackthorn guards to laugh in the background, unable to fathom how these two boys are the best the wolves can conjure up. After Mu finishes, Blackthorn leader Hang Yanhi does the same and starts introducing everyone accompanying her today. However, the wolves' shadow ops are shocked to learn the Crimson Foxes brought along administrative heads, letting them know that the foxes ain't messing around. Regardless, we finally find out who's the one that chose Eden, as it turns out to be none other than Blondie herself. But she's literally a wild card, so I should have seen that coming. Anyways, let's cut to the chase, as we've been waiting 11 straight episodes just for this moment. After hearing hands over his weapon to the girl and Ara handing over her weapon to Mu, they allow the two to finally get ready for the epic duel. Meanwhile, Blondie tries to bribe the Black Thorn to let her in early as she just wants some rice cake with sausage toppings since she's been craving banana tree seeds all week, but she's refused entry, forced to wait 10 whole minutes. As everyone else waits for the duel to finish, Mu ends up offering Yeoni some tea, and so she finally relents and takes Mu up on his offer. Now back to the action, Herring's heart starts to beat super fast and loud while he shadows Ara from behind. But it's literally love at first sight, as Ara feels the exact same way, almost fooling me that this wasn't a cultured masterpiece. Suddenly, Ara grabs Herring's hand, telling him that they should go together instead of him following, as she makes an excuse that's her first time as well. As such, Herring's heart stops as soon as she let him forward to the end of the hallway, probably busy thinking it's rice cake popping time. Upon reaching the end of the hallway, the two take a moment to open the door, as Ara explains that from here on forward, the real puzzle will unfold. Much to their surprise, as they push on, a girl appears, curiously asking both of them if it's their first time. It's then revealed that the girl's name is Hannah Lin, and she will be the one taking care of Ara. Shortly after, with no explanation, a man appears by the name of Dongi, explaining to Herang that he will be the one in charge of taking care of him. And so apparently, Puzel has servants for those here to duel, so they start showing the two lovebirds around the beautiful palace. The servants then remind the two of the rules, where they can only choose one room, and they must stay inside until the allotted time has finished. Ara then wastes no time as she instantly picks a room, ready to rumble and tussle. So she's basically putting the pants on in the relationship with Herring just being a yes man. The two then enter the room, but Herring gets fixated on all the lovely decor, only for him to not realize that Ara has already gone missing. As he's too busy amazed at the grandeur of the room, Ara comes flying in with a surprise attack from the top of the room, catching an unsuspecting Herring. Nonetheless, the story continues with Ara ganking Herring from the sky unsuspectingly, as Prince Behemoth thought Puzel was a sacred place meant for elite foxes to extract seeds from them. Luckily, Herring has the reflexes of Faker, so he's able to successfully dodge the surprise attack. Herring then fails his attempt at defusing the situation, since Ara is trying her hardest to cosplay Angelina Jolie as Mrs. Smith. But surprisingly, unlike Karim, Herring is able to withstand all her blows with ease, almost as if Herring should be the rank 1 swordsman for the wolves instead. Regardless, Ara continues on with her onslaught of attacks, telling Herring that winning over her collar has intended consequences, but our boy is too slick with his moves. With Herring continuing to dodge every single attack, we discover that Ara has been testing his power level, since she expected him to be much stronger than everyone else thought. As such, Ara stops attacking and pins him near a wall, asking Herring if he realizes who she truly is as no man should be able to keep up with her attacks. She then claims that no one can fool her, so she questions Herring why he allowed her to easily attack him days before. Of course, Herring deflects the question, responding by turning his mouth into the forbidden hole and replies by saying he has zero idea to what she's referring to. After calling the Prince Behemoth a terrible liar, the two decide to restart the ordeal, since they forgot to flip over the hard glass inside the room. Meanwhile, the servants from outside the door begin to think that the lovebirds are some kind of rough couple, as they constantly hear things break. At the same time, Blondie barges into the doors of Puzel, with Eden, the turtle lagging behind. Now this is a couple looking ready for the true plot, as everyone else gets seemingly baited by the author, as we were all expecting Herang to throw down with his Prince Behemoth, Regardless, it's revealed that Blondie is no unfamiliar sight to the Palace of Puzel, since this isn't her first time giving an elite member of the Wolves her color. However, Dongi, on the other hand, has never seen the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle before as he watches him nervously pace around the room. Blondie then interrupts Dongi, trying to explain Puzel to Eden, as she starts ordering the two servants to reveal which room the first couple ventured into. 
But her questions get swiftly answered after she starts hearing more things break inside a room beside her, so Blondie starts getting super excited. And so the second couple quickly picks a room, ready to rumble and tussle, as it's finally time for some banana tree seed extractions. As the two groups get in on inside Puzzle, the elders from the Crimson Foxes and the Black Wolves congregate peacefully to drink some tea. But this is all a ruse as both sides attempt to gain any useful information from the opposite factions. The Wolves want to know if Herring was potent enough to successfully allow two of the strongest Crimson Fox elite to actually get pregnant for the first time. But the Foxes refuse to disclose the information, so they clap back, revealing that they know that the Wolves' population has been in steep decline enough to be in a very dangerous situation. But then things take a turn as one of the Wolves' intelligence officers start hinting that the Wolves might offset the balance of the world relatively soon. At the same time, Moom has a private conversation with Yoni, telling her that he truly believes that Ara and Herring are about to bring a big change to the world. With all the foreshadowing, we need some action, so back to Puzzle, where we find Blondie busy trying to listen in on Herring and Ara. However, she gets frustrated after hearing the two lovebirds go quiet again, still not able to realize the two are fighting, not extracting banana seeds. Nevertheless, Eden, like a true Sigma male, starts bouncing on the bed, causing Blondie to get distracted with her chosen man. But as Eden uses the bed as a trampoline, he starts calling out Blondie, telling her how bad she must be craving bananas since she gave him her collar. With Round Boy spitting facts, Blondie actually gets insulted, so she starts regretting her decision for choosing Aiden to be the chosen one to explode with her. Meanwhile, inside the other room, Herring and Ara are busy staring at each other in absolute silence. And that's literally all they do. But time to time, they hear Round Boy bouncing from the other room. With the biggest teaser ever in culture history, the Blondie says she's had enough, so she starts walking towards a tired Eden. She then takes the boring matters into her own hands, but she starts comparing Herring to Ara, telling Eden that Ara is going to be king of all nations one day. 68 days later, Eden finally makes a move, so he starts complimenting Blondie about her great perfume choice. And so Blondie finally attacks, so she rips open the packaging for Eden's ice cream cone, ready to use it properly. Eden then blinks once, only to realize that all his packaging disappeared in an instant, almost as if Blondie is a true pro at rice cake smashing. With Blondie and Eden getting the show started, we discover that Future Queen is busy interrogating Herring, wanting to know more about the day he let her attack him. But all Herring does is simp for her, claiming on that specific day, he was awestruck at seeing the legendary Ara, since he's never seen a girl prior to their encounter. Herring then continues on, busy complimenting her prowess, explaining from that day on she was carved into his heart. Regardless with the wholesome encounter, Ara tells him that he can't live a normal life anymore, so she brings up Yeonji and Chil. It was at this moment he discovered that he's going to be a dad, confirming to everyone that he's potent as hell. Ara then reveals that this is the first time ever that two elite members successfully completed their life mission, and it was all done by the same person. With the onset of the surprising new information, Herring starts bawling his eyes out, unable to hold in how happy he is. So Ara gets slightly scared, wondering what's wrong with Herring, unable to fathom how a wolf could be so happy knowing that he now needs to pay some child support. While Herring is busy being a proud father, his squad mate is busy watching Blondie turn into a menace, as she starts playing around with him. As she attacks, she realizes that Eden needs some help growing the banana tree, as all her insults accidentally made cold air shrink his plantation. Luckily, Blondie pulls off her special Twin Dragons reveal move, causing Eden to start growing rapidly. With just one special move, our turtle admits defeat, allowing his primal senses to activate, all because she used bed mass in her calculations. Meanwhile, back to the boring room, Era orders Herring to keep the information she just revealed top secret, as if word gets out, both Yonji and Cho will be put to eternal sleep in a bottomless pit. As Herring gets shocked with the revelation, so did Eden as he's unable to believe Blondie was able to slurp up all the Slurpee in one gulp. With Eden experiencing sensory overload due to the elite Blondie, he doesn't realize that Herring is busy taking in only information. As Herring gets shocked with the revelation, so did Eden, as he's unable to believe Yangji was able to slurp up all the Slurpee in one gulp. Instead of experiencing joy and satisfaction, Herring receives the reward of finding out that the royal foxes will attempt their hardest to kidnap him, due to his potent seed. However, with the wolves still in the dark, thinking the herring is just some ramen rookie, Arad explains that it's highly likely the royal foxes will attempt a secret transaction with the unsuspecting wolves. If they do end up getting hold of him, herring will become a seed slave, forced to live a life in captivity. Luckily for our boy, Ara offers to teach him a way out, and so he instantly accepts, not wanting his banana plantation to be invaded. 
With Herring's life on the line, his Garimbi squad member is busy going ham in the other room, enjoying every moment at Puzel, especially with Blondie at the helm, as she's one of the most experienced out of all the elite, for both genders. Era then reveals that the only way out for him is that he needs to become king. Now our boy was expecting an easier way out, but he does indeed realize that him becoming king will be a surefire way to get out of this pickle. But then Herring shocks the sussy world, as he finally decides to become king, and not because he's a simp for a Ra. Instead, he's doing it for his kids since he doesn't want to be separated and forced to pay child support. Afterwards, the moment we've all been waiting for might actually happen, as he chads up, telling Ara to hurry up as it's time to make their own kids. Unfortunately for our confident Herring, he gets rejected, since Ara tells him that today she won't be doing the sussy sussy. Luckily, Herring decides to activate his trap card as he starts almost looking like he's about to cry, causing Ara to really question him. With his trap card activated, it still fails with the strongest girl on the planet explaining that she can never take in a seat, as it will be a setback on her becoming queen. With Herring being ultimately baited, she tries to gaslight him, telling him that this isn't fair at all, even though they are literally in a room meant for rice cakes smashing only. As such, I start to shed water for our boy as he begins to cry as well. But then the turntables turn, as Era finally crumbles at the sight of Herring bursting into tears, so she says fine, let's clap. With Era finally accepting responsibility, she tells Herring that he has exactly one minute of fun, and that's it. Meanwhile, a mysterious figure looking like Karim speeds through a forest with all his might looking like he's either escaping or chasing someone. But then we discover that the black serang is trailing behind him, struggling to keep up with the speed of his captain. Eventually, he gives up chasing after him, so he starts questioning his life, since if he can't keep up with his captain, and his captain can't keep up with the Ra, then who can keep up with the Legend 27? But since the Black Sharang is a kind soul, he starts thinking about Herring, hoping that he doesn't get destroyed by Ara at the Battle of Puzel. However, as he's busy catching his breath, another mysterious man speeds by out of nowhere. The Black Sharang is able to catch a glimpse of the man, causing him to tremble slightly, since it turns out there's actually three of them. And so the story continues outside the promised land of Puzel, where the elite swordsmen from both nations congregate to do some rice cake smashing. With Karim unable to win over the rice cake of Ara, the number one swordsman of the wolves is busy slashing his way out of the woods, trying to escape some mysterious men chasing him. But then the Ultra Simp stops in his tracks, going from 69 to 0 as quick as possible, as he knows he can't outrun those pursuing him. And so Karim chooses to stand his ground as it's time to activate his Ultra Instincts, since he is the rank 1 man within the wolves after all. However, instead of activating Ultra Instincts, he tries his hardest to cosplay Zoro from One Piece, since he wants to be on a list of the best swordsmen in anime. With just the blink of the eye, he's able to defeat four of the masked men without breaking a sweat, but the battle is not over yet. After easily dispatching four, round two begins with a boss battle, as a huge man comes out of nowhere with a gigantic swing. Now it looks like some kind of battle relative to sword size, but Karim loses that battle again, just like when he lost to Herring's Prince Behemoth. Regardless, Karim is still able to parry the blow, but surprisingly, it seems as if he actually knows the man who just attempted to destroy his life. After a quick exchange of words, the two both step back, but the boss man starts talking about he was worried that Karim's skills would not be up to par after being stationed at a rural town. It's then revealed that the mysterious man is actually the captain of the royal guards for the wolves, who goes by the name Jin Young. Karim then discovers that this old man was just passing by, but then he decided to stop by and test the powers of an old friend, after not seeing him for a while. However, Jin Young reveals that he's also on a mission to escort a royal representative, whom starts showing himself in the background. After getting closer, we find out that it's the same bad man from the palace that gave the former rank one of the wolves the sussy serum to make her crave banana trees. His name is Samunsol, and he's the head of the research department for the royal family. Meanwhile, Ara finally decides to let Herring show his banana plantation to her, so she tells him he has exactly one minute with her going starfish. She then says that during the entire one minute, Herring is free to do anything she wants, so she asks if the terms are good enough. For most boys evolving into manhood, one minute is more than enough, but this is Herring, the owner of the Prince Behemoth. However, Herring learns that when she meant anything, she meant that he can do anything, except sliding in the actual banana tree into its soil. So he decides to counter offer like he's on Shark Tank, trying to negotiate a two-minute timer instead of one, since Puzzle is meant for rice cake destroying, not for turning banana trees blue. After hesitating for a few seconds, she ends up accepting the new terms, so now our boy has exactly two minutes to siege the gates of Ara. As such, he takes the opportunity to get as close to her as possible, without violating any terms of the deal. 
And so he attacks, first starting with a romantic kiss and proceeding to continue further on. Surprisingly, the most important woman on the planet reciprocates his advances, almost as if she's hiding her true self. Suddenly, Herring abruptly stops, causing Ara to ask why he just randomly stopped. Unfortunately, Herring discloses the fact that two minutes are already over, and like a true gentleman, he sticks to his words. But maybe our boy might get lucky today since it's Lucky Day 7, so Ara starts wondering what the heck is the noise she's hearing. Eventually, she it dawns on her that it's actually her heart beating super fast, so clearly she wants to break the terms of the deal. And just like that, Ara pleads for another moment, just like when you're on a win streak, so you tell your friends you can't stop now. Before Herring could reply, Ara unleashes her true self, so she starts aggressively progressing their romance. Now truth to be told, I thought we were going to get baited until the end of the series, but it's actually starting to unfold right before our eyes. At the same time, Eden is busy in the other room with the blondie, as he's plowing the fields of the blonde wolf with his banana plantation. Eventually, Eden's machine gets tired from doing farm work all day, so his machine explodes, causing milk to start splattering everywhere. With Eden and Blondie basically finished, we head back to the other room, where we find Ara taking charge of the entire situation, like a true queen. After pinning Herring to the ground like a savage, she orders him to not move a single inch, but lo and behold, something else starts to mature. With the unexpected turn of events, you can hear the collective shout of the audience screaming that finally we get to witness Herring x Ara. Eventually, her face disappears as she whispers to Herring that she was right, the sound she was hearing earlier was the sound of her heart beating for him. She then rips off the armor of Herring, as if he's just some kind of defeated wolf after an intense battle, causing him to mutter the words, Wait. With Ara now looking like she desperately needs some water since she's thirsty, Herring starts getting worried for her, telling Ara that her words are totally the opposite of her actions. But Herring closes his forbidden mouth real quick once Ara tells him to shut up, claiming that he's the wicked one instead, almost as if she's astral projecting. With the turntables rapidly turning, the future queen begins to proclaim that her one-minute deal is now officially revoked. And much to Herring's surprise, he witnesses Ara with his very own eyes quickly disassemble her own armor in front of him. She then starts talking in a slightly more provocative voice, telling Herring that they can do other stuff, as long as he does not explode with her. After over 12 episodes, let it be known that today is the day Herring got to witness the twin dragons of Ara. With the dragons exposed in plain sight, Herring can't contain his rocket from blasting off into space and growing larger, so she starts wondering what the heck is rocketing into the gates. At first, she thought it was his arm being speedy, but in actuality, it's actually Herring's rocket blasting off inside its cage. With the banana plantation going crazy, Ara finally realized why they nicknamed Herring the Prince Behemoth, as it is indeed like Goliath. Things then continue to escalate as Ara is totally captivated at the sight of the Prince Behemoth, so I guess we have to call him the man now instead of my boy. Shortly after, Ara decides to gank Herring by instantly losing to her intrusive thoughts, catching Herring by surprise again, since she just instantly entered the rocket ship. Without any indications of her wanting to start riding the bike early in the morning, she sits on the rocket, asking Herring if this is the proper way you send girls into space. Before Herring could even respond, she decides it's time to try and engulf the rocket with her city, and somehow she instantly succeeds. With her city gates finally breached, she starts warning Herring to make sure she doesn't explode within the city gates or else she will personally make him perish into the abyss. Unfortunately, it seems like Herring might actually make his first fatal mistake as he can't handle how narrow the city walls are compared to every other city he's wandered into. With a few seconds after, he makes the oofsie face where he starts shouting that the cavalry is about to arrive unannounced since he couldn't hold the line. Now today must be a glorious day for the Crimson Foxes, as they made Mount Eden and Mount Herring both erupt unannounced. Meanwhile, right outside Puzel, Moose starts falling asleep, but he knows it's almost time for the couples to leave the Palace of Destiny. Eventually, they hear some noises coming from the doors of Puzel, and it turns out that Moose's assumption was correct. The first ones out of Puzel is actually Blondie and our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, with Blondie leading the way out. And right behind these two is the esteemed lovebirds, the power couple that everyone on the planet is super invested in. All eyes then shift to Herring and Ra, since it is the first time ever that the number one swordsman on the planet finally gave up her collar. After taking a closer look, we can see that she definitely left a mark on Herring, and the girls can tell whenever other girls enjoyed some nice rice cake destroying. With her lipstick on display on Herring's face, a blondie starts getting excited, wanting to know more tea about what happened inside. Blondie then starts going crazy, as she can't believe that Era is actually making the sussy face right after a rice cake duel. She then attempts to look behind her to see how Herring is doing, but the captain of the Black Thorn orders her to keep on looking forward. She explains that whatever happens in Puzel stays inside the gates of Puzel, 
so she needs to leave behind any lingering attachment. The higher-ups then smiled on, telling Ara to hurry up as they need to get back to headquarters first. With a surprised look still imprinted on one of the administrative heads of the foxes, she orders Ara to buckle up, as today will be a long day for the strongest blade within the nations. However, Ara does not conform to tradition as she decides to ignore everything said to her by looking back at Herring anyways. Herring then catches her stare as well, pretty much shocking both Kuravans as traditions never get broken. After taking a good look at our boy, both Herring and Ara refuse to mutter a sound or a word before heading right back to their respective Kuravans. Yemi is then unable to fathom that their strongest blade just had to be smitten by Herring, just a random boy plucked from the country against his will. Meanwhile, Mu looks on like a proud father that didn't leave to grab some milk, telling Herring that it's okay to enjoy and take everything all in. The two intelligence officers also can't remove the smile off their faces since Herring did not let down the entire nation of men. In fact, Herring achieved the opposite as he will probably return back home as the hometown hero of all the guys. Fast forward to later in the evening, we find ourselves back at the palace of the Queen of the Crimson Foxes. A black thorn appears before the Queen, revealing to her that she has urgent news to deliver personally. And so she's allowed to relay the information, where the Queen discovers that the wolves have sent the official list of men coming to attend the Gomage. However, one person on the list just happens to be a man on the Crimson Foxes' black list, whom happens to be Karim. Not only is Karim included to attend the Gomage, but much to the Queen's surprise, Herring is also supposedly attending, catching most of the Queen's attention. With the Gomage coming up, an event allowing girls to get rice cakes smashed by the elite wolves, she deviously plans a way to get rid of Ara, the strongest female, on the planet. As such, she orders the head of the Black Thorn Guards to allow Ara to partake in the Gomage as she probably wants around two after yesterday. And so she happily looks into the night sky, hoping that something bad might happen to her challenger to the throne. Elsewhere, Herring the Prince Behemoth is busy sneaking around the wolves' headquarters, thinking it's a bit strange that he hasn't heard a single drop of noise. With him still unable to find anyone nearby, he starts scratching his head, making some of his dandruff fall off since he needs some head and shoulders. However, as he attempts to sneak a gassy fart since no one's nearby, he suddenly gets grabbed out of nowhere into a nearby room. The mysterious man that grabs him then explains that the day after you return from a mission always ends up being a temporary holiday, as all the elders get summoned to the main headquarters. The man's face is then revealed to be one of the lowly members, asking Herring if he feels something unusual today. But Herring nervously looks at him, unable to figure out what to say since it's only been a week since he joined the elite Garimbi squad. Eventually, after getting hold of his senses, he realizes that the entire room is full of other lowly members, all busy staring at him, probably jealous that he got to destroy the gates of Ara. Herring then stands there frozen, still failing to realize why the heck everyone gathered in this sussy room, only for him to finally relent and ask what he means. Suddenly, another impatient man pipes up, asking Herring what color was it. However, our boy still has no clue, so he starts trying to speak French to attempt getting out of the weird situation. Finally, a frustrated man brings up the fact that they are all talking about Ara's special catacombs, revealing that they all gather here today to find out about his experience at Puzel. With it finally dawning on Herring, everyone starts to get flustered as they are all eager to find out more about Ara's special rice cake. The Soy Boy army then attempt to gaslight him into spilling the tea, claiming that it's his duty since he's the only one to ever experience the legendary Ara. Unexpectedly, Herring chads up, explaining to everyone that he could spill the beans, but he's not sure if they can handle it all. And so the boys start to get nervous, yet their curiosities get the better of them, as they need to know what a legend looks and feels like. As such, he starts trolling the entire room, but they all eat it up like gospel, unable to believe their ears. The boys then start panicking as Herring starts to explain how the gates of Era is riddled with a huge forest full of tall grass. Apparently, it never got to experience a lawn mower. Eventually, the group gets enough as they almost run away after hearing that the gates of Ara supposedly smells like my feet, especially when they get soaked after a rain day. Regardless, upon hearing the entire ordeal from Herring himself, the entire group start pacing around the room, yelling at Herring, claiming that there's no way that could be true. Meanwhile, the Legend 27 herself is called to the office of her Black Thorn official, as they want to interrogate her about the day before. We then discover that Ioni cannot fathom how she was unable to extract a seed from Herring, so she brought over the head of the health department to confirm her report. The health department head instantly confirms that Ara's report is 100% true, as they even used the most updated and latest seed securing equipment, yet they found nothing. However, Yoni still has her suspicions, since the two previous girls that encountered the Prince Behemoth ended up with the highest amount extracted ever. 
And so, Yoni comes to the conclusion that she either hit the climax of the mountain first or she couldn't get the behemoth to show up that day. But Ura tries her best to deflect the questions only to fail, so she learns that in accordance to Fox rules, she must receive disciplinary actions. Now imagine getting in trouble since the boy she was with wasn't able to explode. Now that's paradise for a man for real. Anyways, Yanni reveals to Ara that she won't be able to partake in the upcoming Go Mage now as her punishment will force her to be busy that day, as she is tasked to keep an eye on a person of interest. Upon asking who it is, she discovers that she must keep an eye on her own Ultra Simp Tier 3 sub of hers, the legendary swordsman, Karim. Yendi then continues, telling her that the game plan has to be adjusted, due to Karim being on the blacklist of the Crimson Wolves, so Go Mage Day is going to be a nuisance. Furthermore, the future queen learns that her prince behemoth is coming to join the fray, so her lips instantly start puckering up almost as if it's natural instinct. With the unraveling of classified information, Ara learns that they partnered up three girls for lucky boy Herring, and one happens to be the first ever to experience the behemoth. The head of the health department then steps in, claiming that Danby happened to be unlucky one, since they plucked her out of the behemoth's grasp right before Herring exploded. And so she gets given another chance by the universe to extract the most potent seeds of all. And this woman also gets a chance to participate, all thanks to Cow Lady. Nevertheless, Ara perks up, busy wondering why she has to share her prince with literally everyone on the planet, since all the girls fancy the boy. As such, Ara leaves the room after getting dismissed, but she shows emotion for the first time by slamming the door behind her in front of Yanni. With jealousy now seeping in the air, our boy needs to watch out since some crazy ones might take down his prince behemoth. The next day back at the headquarters, a black serang is called in for a secret and super classified mission. The commander then reveals that he's been ordered to infiltrate the heart of the Crimson Foxes on the day of the Gomage ritual, and he must do so without any question. Now this is the face of a man looking like he wants to destroy someone after finding out he won't be able to do some rice cake smashing the next day. Nevertheless, the commander debriefs him more on the mission, explaining that he needs to transport a special item to a designated location and to return in one piece. With the commander unable to really help one of his main members, all he can tell him is that he thinks the king is planning something big, and it's not Herring's behemoth. The Black Serang then leaves the headquarters to partake in his mission. But it turns out that he only made his face earlier, giving him worrying about Karim and not the girls. And so the Black Serang is a true bro, as he will always have your back no matter what. As he goes on a tirade inside his own mind, the Black Serang ends up running into Herring heading into his room, but Herring stops him in his tracks. The two then point at each other like the Spider-Man meme where both of them simultaneously tell each other that they need to talk. And so they decide to talk outside, but the Black Serang wants to know why he came out of the other room. So with some brotherly love, he checks inside the previous room. Upon peeking inside, he sees an entire squad losing their minds, where they are too busy repeating the color of the supposed rice cake of Ara. Regardless, the two continue on outside to exchange some vital information, as they want to know where the rest of the elite Garimbi squad could be. The best Herring could come up with is that maybe they are busy playing Roblox or Minecraft, but their theory crafting leads to nowhere, so he asks the Black Serang if he's ever attended the Gomage instead. Serang replies by claiming that the Gomage happens rarely, so this one coming up is the first one he's ever been invited to. He then reveals that only the top 10 squads of the Elite Forces is invited, but rookies are not allowed, so Herring's an exception. He also tells Herring that the strongest swordsman gets to pick who goes, so for the one upcoming, Karim decided that he's going to attend as it's time to destroy some rice cakes. As he starts explaining more about the history, Herring zones out as he can't believe that he got invited so him and his behemoth is super excited. Elsewhere, the elite Crimson Foxes go over and finalize the list for those participating, and it turns out most of the gang is allowed to come. However, this time, Yoni sternly reminds the girls that they really need to make sure they knock the boys out of the ballpark as their life missions are on the line. Yemi also reassures them that the security will be top-notch with Ara and Blani part of the defenses, so she slams the desk and orders them to stop being a sissy and to get ready. So without missing a beat, Mira chimes in asking if they can choose their partners as she probably wants time with Hipster Womb. Shortly after, Yemi actually allows them to choose their partners, so she does them a favor, before ushering them out of her office. After leaving her office, the 1000 Step Squad calls in the Pebbles Squad next, but Alita Battle Angel starts talking about how the atmosphere now is full of excitement. The girl from Hunter x Hunter then brings up the fact that she can't believe Karim decided to participate, so she wonders who could be her partner. As usual, the girls enter Gossip Girls mode as they start wondering who the prime candidate could be, since Prince Behemoth took the girl he simped for an entire lifetime. In the end, they all get flustered as they all can't wait for some amazing rice cake destroying, 
since everyone wants it bad. Elsewhere, Blondie is busy complaining that she can't attend since she's a demon made for bike riding all day and all night. But her team captain tells her to shut up, so she does so hesitantly. A bit insulted, she has to keep her mouth shut. With the countryside black foreign members on patrol for the first time in the main city, all the children start to get awestruck with their presence. Eventually, one of the kids realizes that she's actually a Ra, so they begin following her and swarming her, unable to believe their eyes. One of the team captains of the Black Thorn gratefully show her appreciation to her Ra, as she's happy she's here to help defend, since she is the rank one of all swordsmen. She then hopes that everything should be smooth sailing, but with Karim entering the event, everyone feels a little bit anxious. To ease some tensions, the captain asks Arad if she actually plans to challenge the throne after graduating from the special forces, in which she confirms. The captain then winks back as the blondie looks on, claiming that the Black Thorn are all rooting for her to uproot the current queen. In the end, the captain reveals her name is Nobum, as she hopes one day Ara will remember her face and name, so Blondie looks on amused. Afterwards, they return from their sightseeing tour of the city, as they need to hurry to finish preparations for tomorrow's gomage. Unluckily for Ara and Blondie, they can't get the rice cakes destroyed at the gomage, as they will still be stuck under defensive duties. Instead, they are busy taking in their surroundings, as these elite crimson foxes have never really spent much time within the castle walls of the women-only city. Suddenly, as Arad is busy patrolling around, a young girl comes up to her with a picture of a legendary swordsman in hand. She then starts screaming for her mom, unable to believe the first sword of the Crimson Foxes is literally right in front of her own eyes. Afterwards, the girl starts screaming that it's Ara and quickly points at her, causing everyone to stop in their tracks and look in awe at the mythical legend. It was at this very moment the Black Thorn knew they screwed up as every woman within earshot starts running to crowd Ara. In amazement, they stare at her like how I stare at Justin Bieber or Miley Cyrus, since she's the hero of the Crimson Foxes. Regardless, everyone wants her autograph, so it's basically the real-life equivalent of an Amaranth meetup, except the fans don't smell, and they happen to be girls as well. Eventually, Ara gets enough of the famous life, so she picks up the girl and flies off into a distant area to get away. However, she picks the wrong area to land at, as she lands in front of a statue depicted of her apparent reincarnation as the destined ruler of the Foxes. As such, more girls from afar join in on the hectic crowding, as they get awestruck at the insane similarity to the goddess named Aria. Elsewhere, Blondie is surprised that some of the city girls even know of her heroics, but little do they know, she's also a menace to men's banana plantations. In the end, the trio are forced to retreat into hiding, due to more and more people appearing from nowhere to try and get their autograph. Meanwhile, back at Wolves' territory, Herring the Chad meets Karim the Simp once again, so the atmosphere is tense due to our Simp being the head Discord mod for the Ara fan club. With the rest of the elite Garimbi squad arriving to meet up as well, Karim continues to hold his death stare at Herring, still salty like my tears that Ara chose Herring over him. As Karim still refuses to say anything, Herring decides to just walk away, as it feels too awkward for him having his soul pierced constantly with the eyes of another man. But as Herring almost fully disappears, Karim finally speaks and reveals that the palace offered him an offer that he could not refuse, so he tells everyone that something big will change after the gomage. Karim then drops a nuclear bomb, telling everyone that none of them will never get back to wolf territory, and they'll even be lucky to survive. He continues on explaining that he can't really reveal any more details, but know that he will try his best to survive for the week. Afterwards, the captain dramatically walks off into the sunset as if he's trying to be the main protagonist of this super family-friendly story. Anyways, with the sudden change of everyone's demeanor, Herring starts to think that the rice cake experience at the Gomage must be so crazy that it has made the entire Garimbi elite speechless. After a while, no one else from the squad says a word, so Herring ends up coming to the conclusion that Karim must still be mad that he got to destroy Ira's precious rice cakes. Fast forward to everyone back at headquarters, there we find Hipster Wong explaining that everyone participating in the Go Mage will get a special one-week vacation. And so, like a true bro, Herring's roomie tells him to not mind what the captain said and to just enjoy life, since he is armed with a Prince Behemoth. But our boy is unable to sleep, as his Prince Behemoth accidentally got fully charged by the thought of all the girls available at the Go Mage. And so, he looks on into the night sky, thinking to himself that it's worth everything to destroy rice cakes, so at least he got to experience that. Eventually, he falls asleep as his towering behemoth goes limp due to the cold air seeping into his dreamlike state, busy dreaming about Ara. Inside his dreams, we discover that our boy is actually such a Sigma male as he takes on multiple girls at once that has previously ganked him for his banana seeds. He then puckers up as Danby, the OG fox that got to experience his other machine first, appears as well although things quickly take a turn. 
Danby then goes crazy, as if she's the star of a random Black Mirror episode and whips out a weapon, furiously asking why she was the only one that never bowed to bear a child from the Prince Behemoth. Shortly after, Danby tags in a Ra who looks possessed by some kind of evil spirit as she's enraged that he was not able to control his oil spill within her garden, as she did not want a loose hose exploding everywhere. So then he wakes up totally exhausted and terrified, but at least he got to avoid the mystical oofsie that happens when you dream about girls too much every night. Never mind, it still happened as he accidentally spilled his banana-flavored milk during his dreams. After having to clean his pants off due to the untimely explosion, he heads shamelessly into the kitchen, since he's hungry now from all the sieging he's been commanding during his dreams. However, he notices his dad missing from his room, so he ends up attempting to stalk him in his own self-made stealthy mission. He then catches his dad looking all cool and suspect in the middle of the night, so maybe he's trying to pull off the I'm grabbing some milk, but I'll be back later move on herring. He then interrupts him as he tries to leave, exposing him by claiming that he didn't know his own father loved taking midnight strolls trying to look like Kakashi. As such, Chad Dad replies by saying that he's just washed now, exactly like Sentinel's tens as he didn't expect Herring to be home right now. Nonetheless, the two take a moment to eat good, right before Herring starts interrogating him on what the heck he's doing during the middle of the night. His dad then starts sending dad jokes flying relentlessly into Herring trying to avoid having to spill the beans as he does not want to unleash his pods. Eventually, Milkbomb reveals that there are two secret groups that have formed within the wolves and the foxes, and their goal is to reunite the world. He then continues on, telling Herring that the people he meets at night are actually the most ruthless traitors in Black Wolf's history, and he's secretly one of them. Afterwards, Herring furiously finishes his soup, but finally understands why his dad always told him that he's destined to be king, as it's all probably part of his secret plans, Regardless, the conversation turns to Mukbum asking Herring if Karim really didn't reveal anything to him, only for him to retell the fact that Karim thinks none of them will be able to get back home. With nothing substantial leaked by Karim, Muk supposes that not only will their steamy volcanoes erupt during Gomej time, but an uprising will occur as well. Now I bet Herring is a bit sad, since he just wanted to plant some seeds into foxes. Instead, his dad wants a real uprising and not the one the boys will experience during the Gomej. Elsewhere, the King of the Black Wolves cosplays Batman as he overlooks the capital of the wolves while crouching down, ordering his men to make their move. He then shouts that the time has now finally come for the men to reclaim the world as the true rightful power, and they will make the foxes their slaves. Fast forward to the day of the Gomage, we get introduced to a director of the foxes and a branch manager inside the royal palace of the foxes. It turns out that these two are actually part of the secret group that Mukbum is in, so they are basically the female equivalent. Regardless, the two are most worried about what the wolves have planned in regards to the blue columbines, as they still have no idea why the wolves are so fixated on them. But before they could continue on with sharing more intel, they get interrupted by Edo Niren, the captain of the palace guards. If these two were able to win her over to their side, then undoubtedly, they will have more power over the current queen of the foxes, although they don't want to risk it all. Nevertheless, we find the current queen of the foxes busy practicing her skills, as she's hell-bent on destroying the future challenger to the throne and she actually looks super skilled with her attacks, so maybe she has something up her sleeve. Unfortunately, she's never experienced a true prince behemoth. As the queen takes off her mask and with rice cakes on display, Naren debriefs the queen about the two underground organizations, where the group of men are called Lotus Roots, while the group of women are called Water Hyacinths. The queen then scoffs at the aspect of a united world where men and women live together, since everyone deserves rice cake smashing and not just the strongest. Anyways, the queen is such a savage as she wants to capture every water hyacinth and release them to the wolves in the middle of their try-on halls. Basically, she's a crazy sussy becca, and if I explain what she wanted done to the traders on YouTube, then the channel will get banned. Regardless, Naren instantly figures out that the queen wants to target Ra and pin her as a traitor, since she's the only threat to her throne. As such, Naren walks with two of her commanders to reveal that from this point on, the Black Thorn will be officially at war. But first, their number one priority is to secure the Gomage, as rice cake destroying and seed extraction is the utmost priority for the Crimson Foxes. Elsewhere, Herang's hometown throws a massive party for our Prince Behemoth, as every single man wishes him the best since they all probably want to be in his shoes instead. And so they all start yelling at Herang, telling him to clap the Crimson Foxes for them instead, and to make sure that the Foxes explode first before he does. As such, the Prince Behemoth gets flustered as he's forced to watch his village cheer him on as the caravan taking him to the Gomage departs. With Herring heralded as one of the lucky chosen ones to attend, his hometown village bids farewell as he will be allowed to destroy some rice cakes at the capital city of the Crimson Foxes. However, Herring is part of an elite squad called the Garimbi, 
and there seems to be a peculiar wind blowing in the air on this very sussy and specific day. Nevertheless, he gets escorted back home to the special headquarters, but the rest of the lowly special forces are still going on about him destroying the legendary swordsman Ara Yunsu. Upon entering the Garimbi Elite open area, Herring is surprised to see that no one is back yet from their vacation. Out of nowhere, Maru startles our boy by sneaking up on him undetected, where he proceeded to blow air into his ear and neck. After trolling Herring, Maru orders him to follow him quickly, as he's got something special to show him. Herring then finds himself following Maru outside headquarters, where he discovers Wom here as well, and now both of them begin to arm themselves with a weapon. After handing Herring a wooden sword, the other two Garimbi members start circling him, as they want to test his ability to defend himself since something feels off about the upcoming Gomage. And so Maru and Wong ambush Herring, ordering him to fight like his life depends on it, as he could actually perish in the hands of the Crimson Foxes. Now stuck in the middle of two swordsmen ranked within the top five of the wolves, Herring finds himself in a sticky situation. However, Herring channels his inner Tanjiro and activates his water rice cake pounding technique, allowing him to enter flow state to counter easily. After landing a quick counterattack, Maru is sent flying back as Herring makes him look like an F-tier gacha pull. After making quick use of Maru, Herring turns around and finishes off Wom as well with one single strike, as if he swiped left as fast as he could on Tinder. With both now laying helplessly on the ground, our boy decides to mock them by telling them that it looks like they are trying hard enough to beat him. As such, Maru gets back up on his feet quickly, only for him to start maniacally laughing like an evil villain, so Wong joins in with a smile, claiming that the trio may now talk after his display of power. They then reveal that the Black Serang is not attending the Gomage this year as he left for an unknown mission in the morning. Elsewhere, Ara is busy sitting on top of a roof with some pants missing staring off into the sky, so I bet those rice cakes are cold as heck. Fast forward to the day of the Gomage during dawn, Two leaders show up on horseback alerting the city lookouts that it's time to ring all the bells as the Gomage will soon begin. The city gates then open, the Black Thorn leader ready to welcome the caravan of the Black Wolves into the capital city of the Crimson Foxes. With news spreading quickly that the wolves are to arrive at any moment, everyone in the city hurriedly lines up to see a boy for the first time ever. As they begin passing through the city gates, every fox looks unflustered as each and every single one of them always wish for a rice cake smashing, just like the boys. Audible gasps then begin to erupt as they get a closer look at the wolves with Baek Mu, leading the charge forward. Silence then ensues as the first-timers from both sides finally make eye contact, so the tension between both genders must be through the roof. Soon enough, the entire city of women will be glistening as half will no longer be labeled as immaculate maidens after their city walls get battered through. Suddenly, the city guards order every wolf to get off their horses and caravans, commanding them to walk on foot from here on out. Herring then discovers the site that the Gomage is going to take place in, so he makes a remark that it looks eerily like a prison. The Black Thorn leader hears his remark, so she tells him that he's absolutely right and all they need to do is place a lock on all the doors for it to quickly become one. She then grins as she continues on as she recognizes the Prince Behemoth, asking him if he's actually Herring. Upon uttering the name Herring, every single person within earshot instantly turns to look at him as he's basically Mr. Beast, but gives away unlimited banana tree seeds instead of money. His riz level is so high that upon hearing his name, every single girl gets flustered while they all instinctively attempt their best duck face pose to appease him. Even some of the guys get flustered as they all know him as the legendary Prince Behemoth, but the rest of the boys are super jealous of the amazing gift of Herring having the largest banana plantation in the world. With all the commotion now surrounding his mystical presence, Herring catches a glimpse of two familiar faces far off in the corner of his eye. After activating Eagle Eye, he notices Blondie and Ara standing guard alongside other Black Thorn members. Upon realizing and seeing Ara once again, Herring instantly smiles and continues on staring at the future queen, just like me when I see ice cream cake. Blondie is then shocked to see Herring's face, as she now knows her bestie has captivated the heart of the Prince Behemoth. Ara then tries her hardest to not melt under the pressure of Herring's presence, but she gets distracted by him as she can only stare back. With the Black Thorn leader realizing Ara is distracted, she orders her to snap out of it as she's tasked to keep an eye out on the blacklisted Karim. Unlike every other wolf within the Crimson Fox City, Karim is the only with multiple Black Thorn members trailing his every move. They then surround Karim, worried that the blacklisted man might have something up his sleeve, as it's unheard of for a rank 1 swordsman to willfully enter enemy gates with his guard down. Even Blondie and Ara are surprised to see him, since they think Karim is the future of the wolves, 
and there's no way they would ever risk him falling into captivity. Regardless, Karim the simp is the first one to enter the building destined to help both populations prosper. Unfortunately, Karim will get his banana seeds extracted by someone other than his only love. With Herring lining up as well, Ara is forced to look on in jealousy as she can't do anything to stop her true love from rice cake destroying some other crimson fox. And so Herring gets escorted to one of the many rooms inside, where he must stay for the entire day to fulfill the wishes of anyone coming in. In just two weeks, he went from never seeing a girl before, and now he's the most prized man due to his prince behemoth, and he also already conquered the first sword of the Crimson Foxes. Meanwhile, his captain is busy laying down on a king-sized bed dejected, as he knows Ara will not be coming through his door at any point during the Gomage. On the other hand, Herring has mixed feelings about all of this since the place is totally different than Puzel, although the bright side is the fact that he got to see Ara again. As he's busy daydreaming about Ara, he is interrupted as he hears someone open his door while the person quickly closes it behind them. With Herring now on high alert about this aggressive woman coming in, he prepares for the worst or maybe the best, since it is time for some rice cakes after all. However, the girl swings into the air like Spider-Man, and upon closer look, he realizes it is none other than the OG Danby, the first of her kind to experience the behemoth. As soon as she lands on Herring, she begins to cry tears of joy, asking him if he missed her at all as she can't believe she gets a second chance in life. Of course, Herring will remember the first girl he ever encountered as Danby was the gateway to the promised land due to her discovering his prince behemoth. After a quick kiss, Danby cries even more as she thought Herring would have already forgotten her name, but our Chad can never forget his conquests. So moral of the story, just grow your banana trees and no girl will ever forget about you. Plus, they will always throw themselves at you even if they know other girls have visited your banana plantation recently. Anyways, with a long time reunion coming, the two are quick to get started as they both instantly get rid of their armors so they can get the show on the road. As Herring and Danby partner up, to the right of their door is Maru, and the first one into his room is actually Alita Battle Angel. And the first thing these two do is insult each other, as their bond is stronger than ever and soon they'll play in Connect 2 instead of Connect 4. Then, for the first time ever, Maru admits that he's actually in love with Alita, so he literally sweeps her off her feet as he cannot wait any longer. Now let's not forget about Hipster Wong as we all know he's eagerly waiting for Mira to show up. And guess who shows up? Mira herself ready to rumble as she too have been waiting all this time to reunite with Wong. With everyone from the Garimbi elite already happy with all the girls coming through their door, only Karim looks dissatisfied so he lays down on his bed while exuding no emotion at all. Eventually, a girl walks through looking a little bit like a Ra, so Karim finally moves to take a closer look at who actually came in. But he's not the only one disappointed as some green-haired nerd has walked through the door, and it seems like he got the short end of the stick, although he is the captain after all. Karim then makes a remark about how she doesn't look like a civilian at all, so he asks if she's a member of the Black Thorn. Meanwhile, Edo Naren takes point at the nearby observatory tower, ordering the rest of the Black Thorn to make sure they report to her every hour about Karim's status, and she asks them to call forth Ara to see her. With the start of the Gomage, Naren begins to think to herself that this year's Gomage is more quiet than usual, so she wonders if there's going to be anything happening after all. Anyways, back to the action, Danby goes ham as she unleashes her true fox form, devouring the available meat inside their room. With the prince behemoth more experienced now, Danby hears herself accidentally echoing throughout every hallway, as she did not realize his battering ram has evolved tremendously over the past few weeks. As Herring fulfills his duty the best he can with his siege attacks, other wolves looking like the Anby Black Ops begin to appear all over Crimson Fox territory. Thus, the invasion of the wolves have begun, and it looks like the wolves might actually have the upper hand this time as they have already infiltrated deep within enemy lines. However, they patiently wait for a signal coming from the capital city of the Crimson Foxes, so they hide like some new bush campers. Now these guys are smart as the entire female population is busy distracted with the Gomage, and a huge number of elite Crimson Foxes are busy partaking within the event. So now the Crimson Foxes are understaffed with some of their strongest members busy without any armor and with their weapons far away from their hands. Nonetheless, the guards within the Gomez site continue to get even more jealous, as they get distracted by all the sounds piercing the thick walls, wishing it was them that got to partake in the legendary event. And since the Gomez happens only once every few full moons, the guards lose hope as they know the next one will happen once they get old as heck. Anyways, back to the action, green-haired girl faces off against Karim, where she's busy asking why he actually showed up to the Gomage. To her surprise, he actually answers, where Karim claims that he's only here to make sure that someone will be carrying his bloodline on in the future. He then continues on by saying that he thinks he might not have much time left in the world, so he's here to implant some seeds as a backup. 
Instead, the first one up is Jin Yanwa, who is revealed to be the second strongest Crimson Fox behind Ra. True to his duty of being the rank one for the wolves, he instantly dismantles his armor and readies his rocket to destroy Yanwa, just so she could extract his seeds to further his bloodline. But before she enters the race to help repopulate the world with Karim, she decides to apologize for being his second choice. As such, Karim apologizes as well as the feeling is mutual for both of them. And this just happens to be business as usual in this world. Elsewhere, Black Thorn leader, Edo Naren, finally gets to meet Era after ordering her to meet, as she had a burning question to ask her. But before she asks her question, our Komi look-alike gets lectured for choosing Herring, the Prince Behemoth, instead of Karim, the King's Simp. Regardless, Naren asks if her plan is to reunite the Kingdom of Men and the Kingdom of Women if she becomes Queen of the Foxes one day. Without an ounce of hesitation, Ara confirms her plan that she wants to tear down the walls of division and one day reunite the wolves and the foxes. She then continues on by explaining that she believes that the two can actually coexist, and the foxes are strong enough to make sure that happens. Ara reasons that the wolves only get more violent the more desperate they become, as women are the only ones that can control humanity's population. With the wolves becoming more and more desperate as the days go by due to their dwindling population, Naren asks if she's actually willing to negotiate with the North Wind. Ara then shakes her head and says no, catching Naren by surprise as she reveals that she plans for the wolves to have a new king. Now shocked and confused by what she means, Naren asks if she's referring to Karim after all, he's the only one Naren thinks is capable of dethroning the current king. Unbeknownst to Naren, a new challenger for the throne has arrived and he isn't a simp or a soy boy. But instead, he's the Prince Behemoth that has taken the world of women by storm. Every crimson fox that stumbles onto Herring always somehow gets their rice cake destroyed, especially if they underestimate the meek-looking boy. Anyways, with Dambi being the first fox to arrive at Herring's room, she realizes that our boy has transformed in more ways than one. Not only has he become more experienced after beating multiple elite foxes, his banana tree plantation apparently also grown more mature than before. So Gamby tries her hardest to get his rocket to explode after liftoff, but her efforts are futile as she's the one being sent into the realm of no return. As she continues to try her hardest to channel her inner Royal Canadian Mounted Police experience, Herring softly tells her to just relax and take her time. Now Herring is a true gentleman as not only does he really care for Gamby, but he even allows her to climb Mount Climax before he does. Shortly after, he gets up with a fox mounted on the tip of the rocket, letting Gamby know that she's one of the reasons he wants to now be king. Herring is actually big brain, since if he becomes king, then he can literally have as many crimson fox wives as he wants, and he can even watch his children grow alongside him. Anyways, he continues running his machine into the caves of Danby, but he reminds her that this time, he wants to make sure she can fulfill her lifelong mission of becoming prego like my egos. Meanwhile, Wong is relentless in his duel against Mira, telling her that he's been waiting all his life for the go mage to finally happen and he always wishes her to be his partner. Now that's cube and all. But then we have Maru cosplaying a jackhammer while Miss Alita Battle Angel tries to squeeze information out of him to why Kareem attended the Gomage. Maru claims he has no idea why he chose to come, which is actually true, so the two end up continuing to insult each other like usual. Nevertheless, outside the walls of the capital city of women, a storm ominously rumbles through the jungle which is a telltale sign that something is lurking on the horizon. Nearby city guards then get scared as the storm looms over as they don't want their socks to get wet while on duty, since they'll smell really bad like my bathroom after I drop a number two. As such, every girl now on guard begin to enter their homes to shelter themselves from the rain, while the rest hope for the best. However, a new face enters the fray as the girl looks like trouble, due to her looking eerily like the female version of Karim. Nevertheless, she scouts out her surroundings and proceeds to smile right before she puts on her hood to become a sussy and mysterious menace. Heavy rain then falls down upon the city, while the mysterious lady escapes into a nearby alleyway with a hidden weapon on her back. Elsewhere, men in black cloaks begin to pour through the neutral jungles of the Black Wolves' territory straight into Crimson Fox territory. Luckily, some Crimson Fox sentries hidden throughout the border is able to spot the men on the move, but the sheer amount of soldiers begin to worry them. It's then revealed that there has always been a truce between both nations every time the Gomage was going on, and for the first time ever, the Thirsty Wolves have broken the truce. With something large looming on the horizon, and we aren't talking about the Prince Behemoth, one of the sentries leave to relay information while one stays back to keep watch. Unfortunately for the brave one, she gets ganked by a Black Wolves intelligence officer, leading to her demise with a quick back attack. With first blood now drawn by the Wolves, war has now been officially declared while multiple elite special force members are happily busy destroying rice cakes. 
Back at the capital city of the Foxes, Ara looks on from a window as Blondie hopes the two don't have to stand guard while it rains. Blondie then sighs as she wishes she was partaking in the Go Mage right now. Instead, rain will help her get wet instead of our teenage mutant ninja turtle doing the job. Meanwhile, Karim looks emotionless as Yanwo flops around trying to play whack-a-mole with the rocket of the strongest male swordsman. Eventually, as every other elite Garimbi member looks like they are about to explode simultaneously, Karim finally makes a face although not much, signaling to everyone that have finally completed their duty. With time almost up for the first batch of foxes to switch with round two, Herring notices how hard it's pouring outside. Suddenly, a voice is heard in every room within the Go Mage urging all foxes to quickly get ready to leave their rooms within the next 10 minutes as time is now up. Miss Alita Battle Angel then reveals to Maru that her and Mira have rigged it so both of them will be their only respective partners the entire Go Mage. Maru even Wong is happy to hear the news as both of them feel the same way as they all actually like each other even though they are all arch nemesis. On the other hand, Karim finishes up Rocket exploding as well, but upon learning that he has other women waiting for him, he tells her no. He then claims that there will only be one woman in his life like a true Chad, so he asks for her name and Yanwa that he will remember her always. Next door to our evolved simp, Danby tells Herring to not forget her, but Herring reassures her that he will never ever forget her and promises to always remember. Now this is actually pretty wholesome, as Herring hugs her goodbye plus who knew King Simp would actually devote his future to the first one that took his blossom. Anyways, after 10 minutes have passed, all girls begin coming out of their respective rooms, all looking flustered, hopeful that each one of them will be lucky enough to fulfill their life-long wishes of becoming a mother. Meanwhile, Blondie and Ara try to hurry to get to their posts inside, but they get scolded as they were late to their shift. Ara then quickly notices a girl coming out of Herring's room, but all she could hear is Danby crying while vacating the premises. This causes her to get distracted, as she's probably thinking he made her cry tears of joy with how good Herring is when he wants to use the battering ram to its full effect. Yanwo leaves next, much to the surprise of everyone as Karim's mysterious partner was a hot topic amongst the guards. Regardless, as Yanwo vacates the room, she stares and looks at Era intently, as if she's jealous that she was the second choice because of the future queen. With the two giving each other the side eye, the Blackthorn supervisor interferes and yells at Ara to make sure she keeps an eye out as the men behind those rooms are some of the strongest on the planet. And so Ara goes, are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain. And behind the door right beside her, Karim stares out of the window and into the rain, almost looking like he wants to jump through wearing his birthday suit. Elsewhere, Yanwa, Murray, and Alida are called into questioning by Naren, as she wants to know if any of them were able to gain some valuable information from the useless wolves. As such, S-tier Yanwa without her glasses claims that Karim said nothing and uttered no words the entire time they were doing some rice cake smashing, likewise with Mary and Alita. With no useful information gathered, Naren asks if all three girls were able to extract seeds, but each and everyone gets flustered as they all confirm mission success in gaining milk. Upon asking all the questions she needed, she orders the three to get out and to remember to report for duty tomorrow as she will need them. After being left alone, Naren heads to the nearest window and makes a remark how rain always come with some misfortune. All of a sudden, a member of the wall patrol sees something from afar, but it's hard to distinguish due to the rain. As such, the two decide that it must be nothing as they probably got something in their eye or maybe just saw some fog instead. However, misfortune indeed comes with rain as the guards get ganked and knocked out by a mysterious figure. And it wasn't misfortune from League of Legends. It's then revealed that the mysterious figure is actually the new girl that looks exactly like a girl version of Karim. After clearing out an entire wall section by herself, she beelines straight to the outside of Karim's window, looking on as if she needs a signal to pursue further action. So now we go from Attack on Titan to what seems like Assassin's Creed in literally less than one minute. Meanwhile, Herring heralded as the Prince Behemoth is busy laying down on his bed, feeling a little bit helpless as he feels like something bad is about to happen. But then it turns out the only reason he's feeling bad is because him and his Prince Behemoth is busy wanting to know where Era could be, as he misses her and her wonderful rice cakes. Luckily for him though, the legendary Era also feels the same way, as once you experience the Prince Behemoth, you can never turn back as your world has been turned upside down. Elsewhere, the mysterious girl ends up pulling out a crossbow and aims straight at the window of Karim. However, it's revealed that the mysterious brown riding hood is armed with no ordinary arrow, as she's actually armed with an explosive arrow. So let's just watch as we let her cook, because it seems like Karim is either planning to escape or this girl is trying to get revenge at Karim for whatever reason. With the thundering explosion rocking the entire area, Edo Naren and every other Black Thorn member stationed to protect the area get shocked at what they just heard. 
At the same time, Ara is unfazed since she's part of FaZe Clan. But in reality, she's currently stuck in a dream state dreaming about our boy Herring. Shortly after, she snaps out of it and instantly breaks open the lock on the door, as she's the one tasked to make sure Karim does not escape. As the door breaks open, she finds Karim standing on top of the rubble right by the opening looking like he's contemplating if he should leave right now. And so he stands there posing like he's some kind of man transformed into a demon ready to start his villain arc. He then jumps as Arai yells at him to not do it, since if he jumps there's no going back past the point of no return, but he ends up finally deciding to go through with it. Suddenly, Ara hears a flying projectile steaming towards her, but she's able to dodge last second and avoid the direct hit allowing a blast to send her flying into a bed. With the second explosion, the intruder alarm is finally activated but the Black Thorn are busy calling for support from the nearby wall archers, but none are to be found standing upright. As such, the Black Thorn leaders order Ara to take charge in finding Karim, since he is the number priority for the Crimson Foxes after all, while the rest pursues the intruders. The commander then commands everyone to make sure they block every and all exit, as they cannot let Karim escape the city. Unfortunately, normal city guards are no match for the king's simp, as he's too agile and too powerful for them to even stand a chance. Thus, Ara chases in pursuit with two other Black Thorn members assisting her, but as she chases she wonders what his motive could be since this would ruin his chance at becoming king of the wolves. Back at the Gomage, the elite Garimbi members watch on from their windows as they witness their own captain make a run for it. So they start thinking if Karim left them in a battle royale where they must play last man standing. But let's be honest here, the boys are shocked only because they finally realize with Karim escaping, they will now be unable to continue rice cake smashing as round two has been cancelled. Anyways, with Attack on Titan vibes filling up the entire atmosphere, Yamu is surprised to see Edo Neren is actually here in person to command the entire Black Thorn squad herself. As such, Yamu begs Neren to allow her to help in any way or form, especially if she's allowed to pursue the man that will be the future father of her kids. But s tier Yanwo without her glasses gets utterly rejected by the captain, so Marin tells her she has no time to argue with her so she must follow Black Thorn protocol before barging out of the room. Meanwhile, Karim continues on his mad dash to escape the city of girls, but the mysterious girl is able to catch up allowing her to yell for his attention. Upon garnering his attention, she perfectly throws a sword over to King Simp like some kind of medieval dry bee so he catches it with ease. The two then make some dramatic eye contact with each other. But this is basically Karim's way of saying he's grateful for the pizza delivery. Regardless, she's also star 1 and level 5 herself, so she needs to hurry up, but she's able to perfectly dodge every arrow sent barreling towards her. She then proceeds to scale down multiple city walls like an absolute unit, proclaiming that from now on, every action of hers is of her own free will. Meanwhile, Ara locks in her flow state, so she's able to catch the king's simp to deliver a quick attack, but now she's mad she has to chase him, as this will ruin her chances of spending time with Herang. However, much to her surprise, he's able to block her attack as Ara thought he was unarmed the entire time. And so the two face off again against one another, but we all know Karim has never once won a single battle against the reincarnation of Arya. Suddenly, Ara stops in the middle of her charge and decides to pull a big brain move by channeling her inner e-girl persona, so she basically gives the king simp the chance to simp right now. But for the first time ever, he decides not to simp and instead stares her down like a true evolved Sigma male. But then, as he continues staring at her, the two Black Thorn members assisting Ara blocks off his rear exit, so they attempt to order him to not make any sudden foolish moves. Now cornered and trapped, Karim turns back to Ara and he finally mumbles some words by telling her to make sure she holds her breath, but Ara is utterly confused to what he means. Out of nowhere, a gust of wind erupts like some kind of bomb has been set off, so Karim stands there all cool in front of Ara. She then tries to hold her breath, but Karim ends up showing his true colors as he hints to her that it's important she holds her breath in the future. With Ara still unable to decipher the true meaning of his hidden message, she is forced to watch on as he escapes through the man-made fog. As the target has now been lost, she starts to sigh and says out loud that they have actually lost sight of Karim. Elsewhere, some of the Garimbi boys begin banging on their doors and attempt to follow suit, just like their captain. But Blondie looks on in glee as she knows if they do anything stupid, they will instantly get punished, so that means she finally might be able to join in on the fun by playing with some rockets potentially. Eventually, the one in charge and protecting the Gomage site gets absolutely irritated, so she orders all archers inside to get ready to fire at the door. With everything escalating faster than a man can get their banana tree plantation fully grown, all the guards ready their crossbows and prepares to fire once the door breaks open. Mere seconds later, a barrage of arrows coming flying straight at the wooden door, 
as the Garimbi refused to stop any of their advances. However, not a single arrow went through the wooden door, so Wong sighs and peeks out to see what awaits him if he decides to escape. Suddenly, he decides to activate the signature skill of Shield Charge, causing even more frustration within the ranks of the Black Thorn watching from afar. As such, Blondie spins into action like a Beyblade, telling Moon to allow her to send him straight into the pits of hell. Thus, Blondie sends him falling forward with his shield still intact, but since the Black Thorn supervisor is in front of him, she accidentally moves backwards, causing a recruit behind her to accidentally cause friendly fire. Now that even more commotion is caused due to teammate damage, Wong takes the chance to quickly check nearby rooms and search for the other Garimbi members. After successfully finding the room containing Maru, Wong throws him a sword that he stole from a nearby recruit and proceeds to sit on top of a balcony overlooking the entire area. The guards then hesitate to make a single move as they get flustered at seeing two men in action, due to these new recruits never seeing boys this close before. Eventually, one of the new recruits snap out of it, and she orders everyone else to fire. Unfortunately, they all end up being total nudes as most forgot to reload after their initial fire, and some are still too distracted due to the sight of the two boys. While the girls attempt to stop Maru and Wom, boss music begins to play as Herring, the prince behemoth, stands firm right by his door, awaiting for his extract to happen. Now, if I were these girls, I would be scared of Herring coming out of one of these doors as Bro is actually able to wield his prince behemoth as his ultimate weapon as he can literally send people flying with it. Eventually, the time has come with the door creaking open, but then Maru asks him if he's coming with them or if he wants to stay here as the only elite Garimbi in captivity. Herring then decides to walk out of the room, causing every girl to abruptly stop in their tracks, even Blondie and the supervisor stops what they are doing to stare at Herring. With everyone now stunned and in disbelief to see the Prince Behemoth, the boss music stops due to Herring looking at Blondie with some regret, telling her that it's quite unfortunate that they find themselves in such a pickle. She then responds by asking what the heck he's doing here, but Herring only replies by claiming that it's a good question. Regardless, Herring decides to move to the balcony, when the rest of the guards begin to whisper to each other that they can't believe Herring is the Prince Behemoth. With Herring distracting them all by accident, Mung and Maru take the initiative and proceed to clear a path forward to the exit. However, Herring does nothing to help his two squad members, instead he goes being chilling with Blondie as she's busy telling him that she has a really bad feeling about all this. Regardless, Blue Boy Herring decides to join his comrades in battle by jumping straight into the action from the balcony. With him jumping, he's still able to captivate the Blondie and some of the girls, mainly due to his mystical aura of wielding the largest prince behemoth on the planet. Unfortunately for the girls, with Herring joining in on the fray, three of the strongest wolves are able to withstand the onslaught of girls running straight into them, as every single one bar two are mere recruits. But since most blondies are lacking something in their brain department, she makes up for it by being super brave and determined, as she wants to take on the elite Garimbi by herself. As such, Blondie proceeds to track them down from behind as Wong and the boys continue charging through, looking like a bunch of dudes after hearing from their girl that her parents aren't home anymore. Eventually, Homie Squad ends up running straight into a bunch of girls ready to fire arrows towards them, so the girls release a fiery barrage as soon as they come into vision. It was then, at this very moment the trio knew they screwed up as Wong is somehow able to squint harder than the people near me when I sneak attack them with my silent but deadly farts. But this is anime after all, so the boys pull out some miraculous defensive maneuvers by hiding behind the makeshift door shield held by Wong, since they now have plot armor on their side. And so the girls end up helplessly looking on as the trio continue making their run for it. As they are flabbergasted that a single wooden door was able to withstand such a show of power. Elsewhere, Karev is back to being his usual King Simp self, so he channels his inner waterbender powers allowing him to successfully continue evading his Black Thorn pursuers, as the girls cannot find him due to the storm. Eventually, Ara and the Black Thorn are forced to report to Edo Marin. So, Ara reveals that three of the elite Garimbi members have escaped as well, and Mr. Solid Snake Karim is nowhere to be found. Upon hearing the unfavorable news, Naren instantly face palms as this is the ultimate S-tier disaster class the Crimson Foxes have ever faced in her entire lifetime. So, Naren starts to scold the nearby Black Thorn members, where she ends up calling them a bunch of nudes for hilariously losing to just four dudes. Thus, she personally calls over one of her most favorite underlings to help lead the recovery mission, ordering them to personally split up in two teams. It's then revealed that they have no idea who exactly the girl was that helped Karim escape. That he speculates actually a special forces dude that wore a wig as his disguise. Nevertheless, with not much information to go from, Niren commands the rest of the Black Thorn to check the nearby canals as they could have anticipated the rain to come. 
And so they end up tracking all the canals within the city to no avail, leaving Nera no choice but to contact the royal palace to notify them what just occurred. Since this takes place in Asia, Naren claims she will put her life on the line to successfully recover the lost prisoners, as she would never bring shame to her family or the Black Thorn as the Supreme Commander. Meanwhile, we discover that Herring, Maru, and Wong were able to lose their 5-star wanted level by using some cheats codes. Unluckily for them though, as soon as they lose their wanted level, they end up getting ganked from a nearby trap door with a mysterious figure staring right at them. However, the girl does not instantly blow their cover or attack them, Instead, she asks if they are coming to follow her, so it seems like she's a sussy Baka apologist, ready to save them all. With Moore and Maru hesitant to follow the girl into the trap door, Herring ends up becoming the Sigma male to lead them forward. He then activates a little bit of his leadership skill, so he reasons with the boys that they have no other choice, as the three of them cannot withstand at battle against the Black Thorn. And so Maru is the second one in to follow suit as he knows if he ever wants to see Alita Battle Angel ever again and taste the rainbow with Alita, then he will have to take his chance to risk it all. Eventually, Wong joins in as well, so all three enter the catacombs hidden underneath of the capital city, but a girl comes flying in from the rooftops. The one is revealed to be Blondie, however, it looks like this girl is no ordinary blonde as she seems to be in cahoots with the lady leading them down the trap door. As such, Blondie the fake blonde allows them to go on with their escape, whilst busy wondering why she's rooting for them deep down in her heart. She even goes as far as to buy them time as a decoy by misleading other recruits chasing them down, so it's clear as day she loves nothing more than getting rice cakes smashed. Elsewhere, Karim has remarkably escaped into the outskirts of the capital city without any Black Thorn members nearby. After getting his bearings, the king simp proceeds towards an area full of rocks and stops abruptly to stare, almost looking like he's having some inner conflict within. Nonetheless, he continues to rummage through some rocks and ends up pushing one boulder over, where he discovers his attack on Titan gear ready to go already fully prepared. Meanwhile, the main city gates open at the capital city looking like some kind of Wall Maria reenaction as it dramatically opens with girls shouting open the door. Shortly after, a bunch of Black Thorn members on Saddleback end up following Commander Erwin Smith's charge forward, so now we know things are about to get even more real. As the Black Thorn members plow on forward, we need to pay some respects as it's been more than a moment since these girls have had their fields plowed by a wolf. Anyways, back to the mysterious girl and the trio still stuck inside the capital. The girl ends up being a dwarf, but she leads them to a hidden storage room. Inside the hidden room, a woman clouded in all black comes out to greet them, looking eerily like a man from afar. Luckily, she removes her hood to reveal an old woman that we saw a few episodes ago. Although with her name still unknown, she's currently sits high up in the Royal Crimson Fox Council. She then disarms the trio by letting them know she has no intentions of harming them since she instead starts telling the same story that Mookbaum told Herring, when he got caught meeting up with the underground organizations. Long story short, since Mookbaum is part of male version of the underground organization, this Afro lady is part of the female version of the same organization Mookbaum is part of. Elsewhere, a full Blackthorn squad continues on their search for Karim, but they actually find some of his fresh tracks, leading towards some nearby mountains. However, Naren thinks this might be a trap card as there's no way Karim would be so sloppy to leave behind his own tracks, so she tells them to proceed with caution, as this feels very sussy. Now speaking of sussy, the storm looms on, but Karim has decided to stop running away, so he stops eating Apple to watch some more anime recaps from us, so make sure to subscribe. Meanwhile, a bunch mega chads from the Special Forces Delta of the Crimson Foxes begin to arrive where Adom Naren requested them to be at. Now these girls are led by none other than the Silver Beauty Haiyang Siolhoi herself, and these monsters are the elite of the elite for the Crimson Foxes. So now Karim is totally screwed as he's being chased by two Black Thorn teams and the entire Delta Squadron ready to destroy him. But before Naren continues her search with her own team, she gets ganked by the leader of the Preparatory Command. With the royal leader appearing before Naren, the White Rogue girl orders Naren to return back to the Royal Palace ASAP, but Naren instantly refuses. However, the white leader claps back and tells her to shut up and continues on with her message, so she alerts Naren she needs to return now as she must prepare for war as the supreme commander of the Crimson Foxes. With the turntables turning as much as the tables in attack on Titan, Naren stutters by saying she understands causing all attention and confusion to run amok. Thus, the all-out war between the girls and boys are about to begin, so now every single girl feels unease, knowing that they won't get the chance to experience rice cake smashing anytime soon. I feel extremely bad for the girl from Hunter x Hunter, since she's the only one within the one-step squad to never experience a battering ram siege, so it's totally okay for her to cry.
At the same time, the Garibi trio sits helplessly on top of a boxes and barrels as they explain their situation to the Water Hyacinth members. Upon revealing why they chose to escape, due to them not wanting to get locked behind and to be loyal to their captain, Wong and Maru gets taken aback when Afro Lady tells them they just want to escape alive as well. Confused to what she meant by that, Herring asks if there's going to be a war, but Afro Lady grins and tells him that it has already started. However, the plot twist is the fact that if Karim perishes, then there will no longer be an ongoing war. But then she begins to send the plot twist into overdrive, by hinting that Karim should perish by attempting to usurp the throne from the current Black Wolves leader, instead of helping the North win with his conquest of the Kingdom of Girls. Maru then gets irritated that the Afro Lady is talking in some secret code, so he tells her that he thought this was supposed to be cultured anime, not some kind of advanced attack on Titan foreshadowing. Anyways, with the trio still fidgeting to escape, we find out that the dwarf girl is named Miryong and Afro Lady has tasked her to show them the way out. And so she bids farewell to the trio wishing them good luck, but Herring notices something peculiar about her. As soon as the Garimbi close the door behind them, another woman has entered the fray, but this time she looks like she has some silver hair exactly like Hang Sili. With so many rats now being exposed to us, I can't keep track of them since it feels exactly like New York City. Regardless, Afro Lady tells Hang Sili, she will be keeping a close eye on Herring and Karim herself. With the Black Wolves and Crimson Foxes now stuck in an all-out war, the Black Thorn members combined with Delta Squad are still hurriedly chasing Karim. However, the Silver Beauty named Haiyang Sili knows that if they do not retrieve Karim in time before the Black Wolves arrive, the Crimson Foxes will be in deep, deep trouble. And let's just be clear, we are not talking Subway Sandwich 6 inch deep as it'll be more like two full footlongs. Anyways, with two full Black Thorn teams and an entire Delta squad chasing Kareem the King simp down, they are miraculously able to actually make headway against the Wana, the son of Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid. Though the men have the King simp, the women have their own weapon. A goddess reincarnation in the form of the Komi look alike named Ra. Regardless, the reincarnated goddess is finally able to sniff out his location, shocking the rest of the crew. It now seems like Karim has refused to keep on running, as he's decided it's time to face off an army of girls, since what kind of man would run away from their destiny of paradise? And just as if it's like he's about to enter the gates of Valhalla, every woman nearby begins to charge at the one-man army. But Karim is unfazed and chooses to stand his ground, looking absolutely like a mega chad as he does not even budge a single inch. However, he disappears like the Flash as soon as some of the girls get near him, making the Crimson Foxes look like a bunch of iron noobs trying to take down a Radiant player. However, as Kareem activates his 100% evasion skills from Roblox, it's revealed that he's actually not alone as the Black Serang is watching from afar. Elsewhere, underneath the abandoned passages of the Royal City, as Miryong shows Herring and the Garimbi boys the way out, she advises them to run as fast as they can back to their kingdom, if they want to live as the all-out war will be absolutely brutal. Upon hearing her advice, the boys stop in their tracks and claps back by saying they ain't no wimps, so instead they ask Miryong if they can lend them a few weapons. Surprisingly, Miryong agrees to their demand, so she reveals to them that this specific passageway has an abandoned forge where the trio might be able to find some makeshift weapons. So with the possibility of the boys actually being able to fight on slowly increasing, Miryong leads them to the end of the passageway before wishing them the best of luck. After she closes the hidden passageway behind them, she winks at Herring and calls him Prince Behemoth. This causes Maru to be an ultimate sussy beka as his curiosity gets the better of him, so he actually asks Herring if he can display his Prince Behemoth to him later, which Herring actually agrees to. Meanwhile, Ara is able to catch up to the king's simp leaving behind the rest of her crew, as she is the only one that's faster than him in the entire planet. This time, Ara looks like she's super focused on actually taking him down as no one ever gets in the way between her and her Prince Behemoth. With Ira right behind him, two more elite Delta members appear out of nowhere and attempt to take him down. Unfortunately, they make the major mistake of taunting him first before delivering their blows, so the two end up decommissioned in battle. Now that Karim has drawn first blood in front of the girls, Silhi and Ira now realize it really do be like that during war, so Ira takes the lead to make sure she takes down her own number one simp. Ira ultimately catches up, so she instantly forces his attention onto her by trying to gank him from behind with a direct attack. With her plan working flawlessly, she's able to buy time for two more Black Thorn members to catch up and provide assistance to her. They then surround him, causing Karim to stop for a brief second and yell out that he's lagging, so this isn't all fair. Luckily, Karim gets saved by the bell as an arrow comes blistering through the forest. 
In an instant, the tide turns as the arrow is actually Sova's ult, so Sova is able to land two direct hits with a single arrow on two Black Thorn members surrounding Karim. Suddenly, the first arrow is followed by another super fast and accurate shot straight at Ara, but since she is the strongest woman on the planet after all, she's able to perfectly parry the unseen arrow last second. Mere seconds after, she uses her keen senses to catch a glimpse of where the arrow was shot from, allowing her to discover that it's actually the Black Serang supporting Karim from afar. Now that the girls know there's at least two enemies, the Delta Force gets tasked to chase down the Black Serang, while the rest of the Black Thorn must continue on going after Karim. With all the commotion surrounding the squads, Ara takes a moment to stop as her Ultra Instincts activate, alerting her that something feels super off and it ain't the watermelons. Suddenly, a rain of arrows falls straight at her, as it's the Black Serang trying to slow down the only person stronger than Karim. Seal Lee then makes a remark that she has a bad feeling about all this, as it seems like they are deliberately being led on a wild goose chase by the Black Wolves. Regardless, with everyone continuing on their mission, Ara stays back again to gather some of her thoughts as she apparently cannot multitask. She then starts talking about how ever since Herring appeared in her life, both the King of the Wolves and the Queen of the Foxes have achieved what they wanted by scapegoating Karim as the main reason for the war. After collecting her thoughts, she begins to continue her journey to chase down the most wanted man on the planet. Unfortunately for her, she finally realizes that with her continually being distracted by her thoughts, she has now actually lost and forgot which direction Karim went. Elsewhere, the three musketeers find themselves super soaked due to the intense rainfall, so they decide to shelter up inside a nearby abandoned house to warm up. The boys then start complaining about how one is super hungry, while Wong is very cold and Herring is sad that he didn't get to destroy the firm rice cakes of Ara today. So they end up combining their brain power to try and figure out how they can find the captain as they are all too miserable stuck in Fox territory as one of fugitives. As such, they realize that the only thing boys long for in the kingdom of men, other than rice cake of course, is to meet their actual mothers, so they figure that that's what the king's simp is attempting to do while given the perfect opportunity inside their territory. Now back to the action, the Black Serang looks like he's about to be defanged as more and more Delta Force members catch up to him as they slowly regain the upper hand. But jokes on them as the Black Serang has multiple things up his sleeve as he's able to buy a bit more time by quickly throwing some hidden darts close range, catching a few of them by surprise. And just as he thought he was able to get away with everything, the pink girl from Hunter x Hunter arrives and she is able to swiftly land a direct hit and it was super effective. She then continues to combo her hits into another attack, allowing her to successfully destroy his crossbow, so it's basically like she powered up using the souls of her fallen brethren. Shortly after, Silly appears out of nowhere and delivers a finishing blow to the Black Serang as he couldn't detect her rising up from the shadows. After falling to the ground in disbelief, the Black Serang stares at the ground defeated, knowing that from now on there will be a very high chance he will be living the rest of his life in captivity. Hera then watches on, looking like she wants to help the Serang out, as she probably is in love with him as these two are the last ones left to never experience rice cake destroying from their respective elite groups. Nonetheless, the Black Serang risked his entire life for the King's Simp, and now Kareem is able to finish his mission as it's revealed that he was ordered to bait the Black Thorn to an old and abandoned Delta Barracks. And just like the Black Wolves planned, the Black Thorn have unknowingly stepped on Kareem's track card, as they were too busy fixated on reclaiming him at all cost. As such, an entire group of Black Thorn members continue on their chase into the abandoned barracks without suspecting it's a trap, since what kind of Chad would just allow himself to get caught hiding in a dead end? Regardless, the girls only leave two to stand at guard at the entrance, while the rest rush in like a bunch of ninjas from Hidden Leaf Village. Upon their eyes adjusting within the dark, the girls stop as they find Kareem standing there with his back turned to them, looking quite ominous. Now me personally, if there was only one exit and your target just stops there without him dropping a single hint of nervousness, I'd be the one expecting something sussy Baka to appear. It then turns out that Kareem is indeed hiding something sussy Baka, so he whips out some kind of advanced contraption while slowly turning to the army of girls. He then makes a remark in front of all of them, claiming that his job here is finally done. As such, he swiftly drops the item, while the so-called elite Black Thorn did nothing the entire time Karim was busy doing his supervillain speech, and I'm sure all of them could have stopped him from using the item. Unfortunately, due to them literally not making a move the entire time to stop him, Karim was able to instantly slice open the capsule-looking item while channeling some of his air-bending skills. Just mere seconds, the entire building was engulfed by a mysterious fog causing all the girls, bar Karim, to start coughing uncontrollably. With Karim unaffected even though he's also breathing in the same air, 
He's forced to watch as every single Black Thorn member begins to turn red and looks super flustered. After a few more seconds pass, every single one of them start to fall on the ground, so it's as if some kind of female only few has been unleashed. It was at this very moment that I knew all my homies would hate Kareem, as this man has single-handedly used up all his plot armor, just so the author would let him live up to his name of being the ultimate menace to society. With an entire Blackthorn squad now on their knees after smelling my boy pop smoke, they are unable to move as their bodies begin to uncontrollably shake as it's being taken over by an unidentified feeling never experienced before. Suddenly, the, the entire Cat Suki clan shows up after Karim has finally completed his mission, so they start hyping Karim up as the future Hokage. So now the masked ninja starts ominously whispering to Karim that they'll take it from here, which totally means it's time for the Supreme Sussy Baka adventures to begin. Now this feels like the Hunger Games all over again, but this time we are stuck inside District 69. And it's all thanks to Karim always wanting to be the top simp whenever Ara starts streaming. However, it's later revealed that the captain of the Garimbi elite sold out his squad and the nation of girls just because of a mysterious location he always wanted to know. Now this place better be some kind of fountain of youth or a special time chamber to help grow his smaller banana tree plantation, so he can match up with Herring, as this bro has committed the most atrocious betrayal so far. Karim then leaves leaving behind an entire squad of girls to the mercy of the Supreme Sussy Baker gang, as their special weapon is super effective against the female type. As the Black Thorn members continue to feel the strong effects of the concoction, the captain makes a remark of how she's going super crazy due to her now being absolutely thirsty. It's then revealed that the Black Wolves have successfully created a formula that allows even the most elite of all elite within the Black Thorn members succumb to be uncontrollably thirsty for banana tree juice since it makes them burn inside. As such, the Akatsuki clan begin whipping out their bottles full of whipped cream ready to explode at any time causing even the captain to instantly cosplay a water fountain full of leaks. Now I feel bad as the only thing left for the captured Black Thorn members is to mutter the words, I want it. Now in a real 5 vs 5 custom match, we all know the Black Thorn would whoop these losers with a score of 13-0, making them all to rank in a single ranked match. Anyways, the leader of the loser ninja gang orders his henchmen to proceed, as they can now experience the best rice cake smashing in their entire lifetime. And so I would call these guys an absolute menace. But in reality, these guys are total monsters as they start putting fuel in their battering rams to siege the walls of these girls over and over. With the Black Thorn unable to do anything as their minds have now separated from reality, the Black Wolves add much salt to the injury as they start insulting the girls. In the end, the true colors of the Black Wolves were the ones that actually came to light as the Sussy Clan could not handle the rice cakes of the elite Black Thorn, so the men ended up becoming boys after being able to siege with only just one pump. Elsewhere, Ara notices some footprints that she knows does not belong to either Karim or any of the Black Thorn or Delta Squad members, so her sussy alarm starts ringing. With the ring a ding going through her head, she decides to zoom like the Flash to follow the tracks as she has been feeling that this is exactly like a good omen ult from the enemy team and someone has already infiltrated Spawn. Now back to the loser gang, the leader of the cheaters looks absolutely terrified as none of them can handle packing the heat, where we discover they couldn't even make the Black Thorn climb Mount Climax. As such, all of them decide to put their ninja clothes back on, only for them to commit the unthinkable to the vulnerable. With the special ops of the Black Wolves actually going through with their sad actions, we get reminded that this is a dark and cruel world. But at least more members of the Delta Squad of the Crimson Foxes are starting to figure out what's unraveling before them. But then things get even worse when the Hunter x Hunter girl tells Suli to quickly look at where she's pointing. And from the afar, the two girls are forced to look on at a fire tornado, still unsure of what the heck happened to some of their friends and family. Eventually, as Ara hurriedly followed the tracks forward, her wraith-like senses prove to be correct as she stumbles upon the fiery mess that has overtaken their old abandoned special headquarters. Upon finally arriving close to the entrance, Ara is forced to stop her Roblox charge as she gets ganked by a sight not even Karim would wish upon his worst enemy. It's then revealed that her profound emotionless face is being fueled by being petrified at the sight of her longtime friends and idols slowly burning away, with some even stuck on a stake at the front door. Me personally, I never expected this cultured anime to take such a turn, but here we are, avoiding some scenes that it's more graphic than most horror movies releasing in 2023. But if anything, this is going to be the turning point for Ara, where we must find out if she's able to handle the sight before her, or will she become an absolute menace gunning for revenge. Anyways, as Ara helplessly watches on in shock, the girl from Hunter x Hunter and Suli shows up as well. 
But those two did not fare as well as Ara. Regardless, Ara cannot hear the girls calling her name as the only thing she can hear is the roaring flames coupled with the resounding beat of revenge. As such, her true power level looks like it has finally been unleashed. So she activates her super speed to charge forward while guided by her ultra instincts. At the same time, Seely bids farewell to her best friend, telling her that she will for sure be back to send her off properly as the black wolves attempted to roast her like a corn dog. Eventually, more and more of the Delta forces begin to arrive at the site with varying reactions from sadness and all the way to absolute madness fueled by rage. However, Seely, like a true leader, musters up some energy to show some strength by commanding all of the girls to witness and never forget the sight before them, proving that men are actually scum. Meanwhile, the Sussy Baker gang rejoice in letting off some whipped cream, unable to believe how much damage a single few did to an entire squad of Black Thorn members. Luckily, we learn that the Black Wolves were only able to produce two of these super high-dose perfumes capable of dismantling elite members of the Crimson Foxes, so they only have one left in their inventory. Although they only have a single dose of the super concentrated formula, the special ops leader decided to bring along multiples of the smaller dose mass produced ones just in case. Just as they were laughing and smirking at the thought of some more rice cake destroying, the boys realized that they are being stalked by someone within the shadows. Upon further investigation, they discover it's none other than Erai Yunsil herself, but our girl is looking like she's a little bit possessed by a demon with her eyes glowing purple. Panic then ensues within the special ops of the Black Wolves, but Ara does not give them another second, so she activates her female breathing style and instantly teleports forward. Now I wish for the worst fate for these dudes and I would hope that Ara would personally cut off their battering rams inch by inch, then grilling it on a slow burn fire. Nevertheless, although outnumbered by an entire squad and unlike Karim, she takes every single one head on. She then calls forth on the powers of Alice and Asuna from Sword Art Online to join her in battle, but she doesn't even need them as she dispatches multiple within a blink of an eye. Now that she's in demon mode, she cuts through almost everyone's single one like butter, where it's revealed that the Sussy Baker gang consists of only commanders from the Shadow Ops. In the end, only three are left from the rear flank of the Special Forces, as their battle is sped up due to the arrival of Seely and Hunter x Hunter Girl. After eliminating the rear guard, the three musketeers charge on forward to the rest of the Black Wolves Shadow Ops gang, as the girls target the Supreme Commander of the group. You might as well call him the Supreme Loser, as he has to order his men to use the Forbidden Formula as he becomes a scaredy cat at the sight of just three women going after him. Unfortunately, the Black Wolves have been busy practicing their aim and aim labs, so they successfully land a direct throw, causing all three girls to get hit. Although they attempted to hold their breath in, they still have no idea about the Black Wolves' special weapon as no one lived to relay the vital information. Even Ra got stuck inside the explosion, so it does not bode well that the Rank 1 Swordsman and two of the top 10 members of the Crimson Foxes find themselves in a very sticky situation. Luckily, Ara remembers the one thing Karim told her to do right before he disappeared, and it was to make sure she held her breath the entire time. As such, Ara activated her Beyblade powers to power through all the smoke, allowing the Supreme Commander to squeal like a girl, thinking that the mass-produced perfume is too weak against the three. And so the commander runs away while the rest of the Black Ops stay to stall the girls, so he ends up not figuring out that the smaller doses is actually affecting the other two girls. As such, Seely screams for Hira, still trying to make sure she's still alive, since she's a true captain and would risk her life for any of her members. Unfortunately, Hira is frozen in place as her twin pyramids have decided to be more pointy than usual, so she's unable to move even when she's facing a sword right beside her. And so the Shadow Ops member starts monologuing for a few seconds before sending Hera to the afterlife. But Hera is actually Doctor Strange in disguise, so she looks through a million futures and remembers that anytime a bad guy in anime takes too long to finish their job, then they're about to get clapped out of nowhere. But since the women are much stronger than the men, the Black Wolves have crafted a special weapon that makes every Crimson Fox instantly fall to their knees, due to their body instantly heating up like my hot pockets which can only be cured by a man's banana tree plantation. Even this girl named Hira, ranked within the top five of the strongest girls within the elite Delta Force, finds herself before a man looking like he's ready to go to the butcher's shop to claim his fox meat. Unfortunately for the wannabe ninja, our Hunter x Hunter girl is able to swiftly muster some strength to put the Black Wolf special ops member at the end of her pointy stick. Although her body is unable to control itself due to its wanting impulse of sticking a battering ram deep within her catacombs, she counters her hardship by remembering her homies is waiting for her to avenge them from the Gulag. 
As such, she powers through the secret weapon and takes control of her own functions, including her own farts, allowing her to stand up and fight against the evil men. The Black Ops then receive the wrong clapping they were dreaming of as one by one they disappear into the afterworld. Even Siuli is able to fight against the special perfume as she's going to avenge her best friend no matter what, even if her twin dragons and rice cakes are dripping like a loose faucet. But Siuli, the silver beauty, understands that if this is what the Black Wolves have been hiding for so long, then they are in deep trouble if they produced it in mass quantities. Suddenly, a man cosplaying John Cena comes out of nowhere, so he jumps at his target and yells out, You can't see me. Luckily, Ara the goddess saves her right on time as she's able to dispose of him straight to the garbage can, just like the warriors when the Lakers win 4-1. Anyways, now that the effects have begun to subside, Ara reveals to the girls that everyone has been defeated, but the supreme commander of the Black Ops ran away like a sissy. Regardless, Siuli is still fixated on the fact that the Black Wolves would stoop so low just so they could get their battering rams all oiled up for the first time in a while. Now speaking of someone that actually got their siege weapon oiled up once during the invasion, the Supreme Commander finds himself all alone as he makes a remark on how humiliating his defeat was. He then blames it on Ara as he never expected her to be this strong even though she's unanimously the strongest person on the planet. Nonetheless, as he laments on his defeat, he ends up finding a mighty surprise when he notices that the King Simp Karim is standing from afar, looking like he's been waiting the entire time. Karim then turns around and stares at the commander with a sussy look, and proceeds to not say a single word like a true mysterious side character. The commander then breathes a sigh of relief, knowing that he can rely on the strongest swordsman of the Black Wolves to help him escape, so he orders him to release the carrier pigeon to send a message. Unfortunately for the supreme sussy commander, Karim has become even more sus than him, so he starts ominously staring at him, looking like he's about to go through his anime villain arc part 2. It was at this very moment the commander knew he screwed up, so he instantly unsheaths his sword, but it's too late, as Karim decides to clap the supreme commander with a single swing. Now that the tables are finally turning faster than the plot and attack on Titan again, all my homies have stopped slightly hating on Karim as he deals with the last man standing himself. After destroying the last commander of the Black Ops, Karim channels his inner Naruto skills so he starts Naruto running away from the scene, as it seems like he's become a double-double agent. Nevertheless, as a new dawn rises, another masked man appears and begins to investigate the fallen brethren, only for him to realize that it's actually Demu John Chien, the supreme commander of the first assassin's Creed Valhalla unit. It's then revealed that mysterious Sherlock Holmes is actually Herring's father, Mok Bum, looking like he's leading a unit of his own. Now that Karim has helped eliminate an entire Black Thorn squad earlier, Mokbum starts to wonder if Karim is trying to reveal his true intentions after destroying the Supreme Commander. Regardless, with no time to waste, Mokbum and the boys activate their Naruto body flicker technique, allowing them to seemingly teleport to their target destination. Meanwhile, back at the Black Wolves King's castle, unease and suspicions begin to rise up in the North Wind's head. With no words yet from his special ops group, and with no new additional official reports coming through since the night, the Black Wolves came giggles as he takes the matters into his own hands. And so the North Wind smirks as he heads for battle, where he tells the captain of his palace guards that tonight will mark the day where everything will actually begin. As North Wind continues his walk forward, we discover that he's finally summoned the entire army of the Black Wolves together. So the real invasion will now commence. But before he sends the official orders to destroy the Kingdom of Girls, he takes a page out of Darth Vader's playbook and proceeds to give his army of clone lookalikes a pep talk. After telling his boys to get their Pepto-Bismol ready, he shouts for them to prepare for war as his voice booms and echoes throughout the Kingdom of Men, especially since he looking like my boy Waluigi right now. Elsewhere, a bunch of old grandma-looking geezers from the royal round table of the Crimson Foxes receive urgent news that an entire squad of Blackthorn agents have been wiped off the map, causing them to panic in disbelief. But since all of them are old as heck, they channel their inner Karens to start blaming Addo Naren for what occurred, pestering the captain to do something instead of standing before them. However, she claps back by telling them that all intruders have been destroyed and dispatched of, but continues on to make the point that the Black Wolves have made it clear that this was an official declaration of war. The Queen then makes a timely appearance as she backs up her Supreme Commander, letting the old women know that she will not allow any debates as they must act quickly to deploy and secure their livelihood in times of war. And so the Queen and the Crimson Foxes officially declare war in front of her royal cabinet with no opposition as she scares every single old geezer into thinking what the Black Wolves would do if they stepped foot onto their land. With chaos now amuck everyone's head in both kingdoms, one of the directors on the royal council sneers how wars are just a way for the queen to reinforce her royal authority. 
As such, she thinks to herself that she needs to somehow make sure that this ultimate war does not happen, as she knows peace will never come during her lifetime if it does. The queen then shyly looks around her palace as she knows she has successfully orchestrated a war by scapegoating the king's simp, exactly what the North Wind wants as well. Elsewhere, at a random female-only village within the walls of the Kingdom of Girls, light goes on as usual, due to them having no idea to what's going on at the front lines. However, our missing elite Garimbi trio have successfully snuck into the village but all three get surprised when they eavesdrop on the girls, since all they could talk about is herring and how mystical his prince behemoth must be. The boys are clearly shocked upon hearing them gossip, as they can't believe how a random rural town has heard of herring and his escapades. Nevertheless, they start cosplaying some monsters from Maple Story, as they still need to make sure that they do not get exposed or else face being absolutely dominated by the entire kingdom during wartime. But then, out of the corner of Herring's eye, he notices a man speed through like a bullet from afar, so he tells the other two that it looks like they are in the right place. Margo then urges his comrades to not make any dumb moves, as it's better for them to continue hiding inside the hay bales, so they can gather more information as to why their captain is really here. As such, the boys watch on as Kerem eyes a woman with a black headband, busy doing her laundry by hanging up her clothes in the open. After finishing her first line of clothes, she ends up realizing that a man has randomly appeared before her, but she's not terrified of him. Instead of running, she slowly walks towards him as Kareem stands there doing his signature do-nothing move. Upon getting a closer look at him, she instantly smiles while her eyes shimmer red from the sunshine above, looking exactly like Kareem's eyes, but the first words out of her mouth is, Hello, son. Kareem then continues to look emotionless as her mother joyfully asks if he recognized her at first glance, while also busy talking about how much Karim has grown. With Karim still not saying anything, his mom continues on by claiming that he looks exactly like his father, but then she says oops as crimson foxes are never allowed to reveal information about their offsprings. Eventually Karim talks when she asks if something's wrong, so Karim mentions the fact that he's absolutely fine, but claims how it's abnormal that he's not allowed to be with his own mother. Now that Karim has finally fulfilled his lifelong mission of meeting her, the mom reveals to him the forbidden information of who his father is. To his surprise, the king simp learns that his father was exactly like him, as he was once the first sword of the Black Wolves, where he went by the name the Black Tiger. But then for the first time, Karim actually shows some emotion as he discovers from his mom that the Black Tiger is actually Mukbum, making him stepbrothers, I mean half-brothers with Herring. Unfortunately, as he takes a moment to take in the realization that his own little brother stole his lifelong muse from him, he gets ganked by an army of Blackthorn members. After blinking once, more Blackthorn members appear, where Karim finds himself surrounded again by a bunch of girls, so he tells himself that he's feeling like Faker in Korea. His mom then starts to look around her surroundings, wondering why there's an entire platoon of Blackthorn members surrounding her, totally aloof to the fact that no man is allowed in, especially during times of war. At the same time, Silly enters the circle, looking like her demon horns have begun to sprout, due to what Karim has done with him baiting an entire squad. As such, Silly unleashes some wrath behind her words, where she calls out Karim's name in anger, just to tell him to be ready to perish in the most gruesome way ever. Of course, Karim is surprised at how angry Silly is, so he ends up making the best face in all of anime, when his parents realize they've been watching anime recaps. Anyways, his mom gets super surprised too as she didn't know her son has been named the infamous Karim, the number one blacklisted man on the planet. Nevertheless, a flashback occurs showcasing what happens when a boy is born in this world, since it's common sense girls can only give birth unless a guy is having a food baby. Anyways, what happens is that a special envoy is notified that a boy has been born, so the black wolves come to take them away as soon as they are born. If the boys somehow make it past four years old and they graduate the childcare institution of the Black Wolves, allowing them to finally get a real father that will one day tell them he's going to grab some milk from the groceries. And so Kareem got adopted by the commander of the palace guards for being strong AF, but his father is basically Askeladd from Vinland Saga only for him to be more like an evil villain. As Kareem grew older, he never really talked to his dad much as the only words that came from him was to make sure Kareem never touched his royal sword. But then one day, fake Askeladd perished in battle after trying to defend the North Wind's throne against some chads wanting change. And so Karim basically grew up without having any real father figure in his life, so that's why he turned to watching King anime recaps all day instead. But then as soon as he turned 18, he became part of the elite Delta Force for the Black Wolves, and unbeknownst to him, his captain at the time was his own real father. Back in the present, his mom bids farewell to him by telling him it's been nice meeting her long-lost son. 
but she knows he has to get going if she doesn't want her son to drop the soap behind bars. As such, Karim unsheathes his sword ready for battle, as Ira is still nowhere to be found which means that maybe he still has a chance to escape against the elite women since he can use his doe fruit to clap them all. However, this time the girls are prepared and ready to thwart his shenanigans as Seoli is determined to avenge her best friend and fallen brethren. As such, Karim the King Simp says goodbye to his mom as well, telling her it's time for him to go back to the sausage fest within the Black Wolves' kingdom. Meanwhile, Seoli decides to interrupt the very wholesome moment by channeling her inner Irwin Smith, so she orders her forces to charge forward and capture Karim with any means possible. She doesn't even care if he comes back without a heart pulse. Instantly, more than a dozen Black Thorn members attack simultaneously with all their might. But before Silly joins the battle as well, she orders his mom to go inside her home revealing to her that a royal investigator will arrive soon as Karim is the Black Wolf's declaration of war. Nevertheless, as the battle goes on between Karim and the Black Thorn, he's somehow able to survive all their attacks with some plot armor on his side, but he begins to get in all over. Silly is then forced to enter the battle frenzy as she notices a couple of the Black Thorn members begin to go down, as Karim begins to activate his sussy bending technique to full effect. With Seely matching Karim's swordsmanship blow by blow, it turns out that the King's Simp has not even been pushed to his full power. But then Karim abruptly stops, as it turns out he was actually waiting for his beloved Ara to show up in battle, so he tells the girls they stand no chance against him. But his words effectively cut deep within Seely's feelings, allowing her to get distracted which gives time for Herring to surprise her from behind. She then swiftly attempts to send Herring to the afterlife, but she misses and fails horribly as she gets her first taste of the Prince Behemoth's powers. With the appearance and showboating of his absurd quickness, all the Black Thorn members, including Silly, begins to gawk in disbelief that Silly could get ganked just like that and not get caught. Even Karim is shocked at the sight of Herring popping up, since he's probably still super salty that this dude is actually his lil bro and he already got to destroy Ira over and over. Now that Herring has popped into the battle and with the rest of the elite Garimbi joining in soon and the girls stand no chance as Herring is basically pre-nerf chamber, as the dude can one-shot anyone and instantly disappear in thin air. Unfortunately, Seelie is still fixated on her revenge as she reorders her squadron to attack without holding a single inch back. So now like true brothers, they face their backs against each other, ready to dismantle and destroy everyone in their way, unless of course, Ara shows up since both of them are mega simps. However, as time passes, more and more Black Thorn members begin to drop like flies, causing the battle to slowly turn its tide against the Black Thorn as they receive no reinforcements. Eventually, both Karim and Herring get a bit of time to breathe and recoup, as they find most of the Black Thorn already on the ground, but the funny thing is that Herring is bossing everyone with just a wooden stick. Regardless, Silly gets even more frustrated as she finally notices that Herring is clapping all of them while only using the back of his weapon as he doesn't want to hurt any of them since they could all be part of his future rice cake gang. Speaking of which, as they get enamored by Herring's fighting skills, they forget that he's part of the enemy force, so he successfully uses his sussy jutsu to his advantage. In the end, only a few Black Thorn members is able to muster up enough strength to continue standing, but Silly knows she needs to buy more time for reinforcements to arrive. Suddenly, the wind picks up causing the battlefield to be full of smoke, exactly like the current Alberta and California wildfires after the Lakers and Oilers win. The girls then get confused as they have no idea where the fire could be from, but then it dawned on them that two missing Garimbi are still yet to be found. As such, Sildi orders a mass retreat as the smoke gives her bad flashbacks to what happened the other day, so now she's retreating to make sure there's nothing hidden in the smoke screen. Moments later, Wong comes barreling through on a caravan, looking exactly like a god from the Roman era as he steams towards his other elite Garimbi members. Shortly after, Maru shows up and finally makes his appearance, whilst busy telling Herring and Karim to get on whenever they are done trolling around. With Karim and Herring instantly hopping on to make their escape, Seely orders all Black Thorn members able to stand to start firing at the escaping Garimbi members. However, although every single shot fired is 100% accurate, Herring is able to deflect every single arrow using his max level agility skills to save his gang and the horse. At the same time, Wong seemingly looks like he's taken a portal to learn from Madara, so he ends up showcasing his new skill. Fire Release Great Fire Annihilation Jutsu, success. The boys are able to get away from the army of girls, but Seelie reveals that they can't get away too far as every single road within the kingdom has been blocked off to prevent any intruders. Elsewhere, Ara and the entire 1000 Step squad makes their appearance on top of a hill, as the Queen has ordered them to put an end to the elite Garimbi once and for all. 
Everyone knows that the number one squad of the Crimson Foxes can easily destroy the number one elite Garimbi as they have a Ra, but not all know how strong Heron really is. Nonetheless, the boys continue back home with their carriage, but things are looking grim as the air surrounding them is full of uncertainty with the event of this all-out war. Maru then brings up the fact that if they do make it home back into Black Wolves' territory, will they even be welcomed back home as they were the ones that got abandoned at the Gomei site? But Karim scoffs at Maru's good point, so he replies back by saying those who are destined to live will carry on, while the rest will just perish. After Karim's such amazing profound speech, the king's simp decides to intently stare at Herring once again, still unable to believe that the blue-haired boy is actually his little bro. This causes our boy to be a little sussy Becca as he starts feeling flustered, so he tells Karim to stop, still aloof to the fact that Karim is his big stepbro. But then the turntables turn once again, as Karim finally speaks up, asking Herring if he's really willing and ready to actually fight for the throne, as he can't turn back if he pursues it. Unfortunately, right before the two brothers were able to finally have some bonding moment, Maru notices an entire squad of girls waiting patiently at the end of the road. He then proceeds to yell at everyone to hold on tight as he needs to activate some fancy evasive maneuvers as a ray of arrows start flying towards them. But Herring is able to come to the rescue again as he's able to block and deflect multiple arrows due to him temporarily borrowing his Roblox fruit skills. Now that the boys can continue living another day thanks to Herring's heroic moves, Maru realizes that his detour leads to even more soldiers waiting for them at the end of the road. Thus, the elite Garimi get pelted again only to be saved by Herring, as our boy is trying his hardest to survive for Ara, so they get forced off the road and into the forest to evade the blockade. Unfortunately, as they continue on traversing an uncharted territory, they end up forced off their carriage as they hit a dead end, with no way for the horsey to pass through unless it somehow transforms into Pegasus. And so Kurim orders the squad to roll out like the Transformers, so they could attempt to cross the behemoth of a mountain before them, as Maru might be able to figure out where they are using a map. However, as the group continues to venture on forward, they realize they have stumbled upon the legendary Mount Gurujim, so if they accidentally fall, they'll find themselves featured in another recap titled Reincarnated in Another World. Luckily for them, this is exactly the landmark Maru was looking for, so he claims that as long as they follow the canyon, then there's no way they would ever get lost as it will lead them towards no man's land. Shortly after, Wong pipes up to tell them to keep on moving as he doesn't like the idea of constantly stopping since it allows for the Crimson Foxes to slowly catch up to them. But as soon as Wong finished his sentence, the boys turn around as they feel a sudden burst of energy appearing behind them. And just as Wong expected, the entire 1,000-step squad caught up to them with ease as this is in fact their home territory so they know their way around. Without wasting much time, Ara speaks up and tells the boys they only have two choices, either quietly give up or else face the consequence of death. Surprisingly, Korean claps back the first time ever against Ara by telling her if she had the ability to do so, they would have already sent them to their demise. As such, right before our eyes, the king's simp has actually transformed into the very rare and unique Sigma male. So he whips out his sword and proceeds to tell the girls to bring it. Herring and Maru instantly get surprised as they don't really want to fight like savages against the very same people they just rice cake smashed literally a day ago. But it's okay, since you guys know what they always say, make war not love, as the Crimson Foxes must be super desperate to break the rule of the Gomage stating that participants must be sidelined during Gomage Day. Nonetheless, the epic final battle between the Crimson Fox No. 1 and the Black Wolves No. 1 is about to begin. Now the first to draw her sword on the elite girl's side is none other than Ara, but she seems more happy than usual as she has finally made contact with the Prince Behemoth again. Regardless, she looks super intent on destroying everything in her path like a true goddess of war, even her boy is a little bit anxious as he doesn't want to hurt anyone including Princess Peach as he wants those rice cakes for later. However, things get even more intense just like camping, as every other person follows suit by unsheathing their weapons ready for the first charge. Mere seconds after drawing their swords, Herring gets confused as he can't believe that the girls he knew before now all look like a bunch of monsters ready to go on rampage. Nevertheless, Kareem the Chad orders the boys to make sure they force the girls to surrender sooner rather than later or else they'd have stand no chance in winning. Suddenly, right before Karim finishes his small speech, Ara wastes no time and instantly interrupts them boys with a swift charge forward, almost like she's in a hurry to grab some chicken nuggets from McDonald's. At the same time, Miss Alita Battle Angel comes flying through and makes illegal contact against Maru, even though these two were literally rice cake smashing together less than a day ago. Even Wong has to face off against a serious Mira, looking like she's ready to chop the hipster in more ways than one. With three out of four elite Garimbi members already facing off in battle, 
Herang is the last one left, but our girl from Hunter x Hunter looks a little peeved after revealing the fact that if they didn't declare war, Herring could be smashing some pink-looking rice cakes right now. Upon the small revelation, our boy takes a small step back as he secretly wanted those pink rice cakes himself, but now, due to the north wind and the black wolves wanting all-out war, all of his wishes have just been washed away. Nevertheless, Herring looks past Hira and starts staring at Miss Blondie, where it dawns on Herring that he needs to fight both of them at once, even though he's just a rookie. Luckily for our boy, Hira tells him to calm down as they have more pride than ganking him two versus one, so he doesn't have to worry about taking on two 1,000 Steps members at the same time, even though we all know he can easily take them all on. Unfortunately, just as Herring was about to partake in the battle, he notices a billion other Black Thorn members show up out of nowhere, including Silver Beauty Seely. With Seely arriving with her squad, she gives no warning for the boys as she orders both Black Thorn members and normal soldiers to ray their crossbows. After everyone takes aim, Hira reveals to Herang that they have already captured the Black Serang earlier, so there's no point for him to hope for backup and a saving grace as the Black Serang is being kept in their basement. Elsewhere, at the secret location of the Kingdom of Girls' basement, we start hearing a bunch of slapping, which usually means some clapping is about to go on. However, it turns out that the sound ain't actually slapping, but it's more like a dragon whip as a bunch of girls are interrogating the Black Serang through some intense means. We then discover that the Black Serang has been deprived of his eyesight, while they also tied him down to a cross-like beam. But the weird thing is, one of the girls is tasked to taste his pepperoni pizza every couple seconds, as part of the investigation process is to make sure he feels pain by making his machine oil spill over and over. Apparently, this interrogation technique is so successful that no man in the history of the planet has ever survived more than three days, as every banana tree plantation got their banana flavor sipped dry like the Sahara Desert. Regardless, it's now time for the most crucial part of the interrogation phase, where the Crimson Foxes get to use their rice cakes as the ultimate weapon. As such, every guard on duty quickly runs over to see the epic reveal of the Black Serang's Nether Dragon, as no one has ever been graced by his weapon. The girls on duty then get excited at the prospect of being next, as it turns out they will all take turns, until our boy spills the beans about the secret he's hiding. Upon discovering what's behind the Black Serang's plate legs, the girl currently in charge feels personally attacked as all her efforts have been futile in attempting to make the Black Serang show its fangs. So now that she has utterly failed in making sure his banana tree plantation becomes fully mature, instead of being stuck as a small seed needing some watering, she tells herself to keep calm and go through the playbook. Now, the first thing the playbook orders her to do is to make sure she uses their own secret weapon through a sussy vial full of mysterious liquids, where she places it on her armor so she could successfully apply it using body jutsu technique. Unfortunately for her, even though she's trying her best, the Black Serang does not even react a single bit from the use of the Kingdom of Girls' secret weapon, since our boy truly is a menace. With the girl continually failing to do her job, all the other guards on duty begin to gasp and gossip upon one another, where they start talking about how important the Black Serang must be to be able to withstand all the firepower being thrown at him. As the girls continue on watching the procedure, they instantly hear someone clear their throat behind them, causing all of them to realize they just got caught on the job slacking off by someone looking very important. It then turns out that the old lady is actually the head chief warden, so she orders the guards to move aside since she wants a sussy peek as well. After taking a look for herself at what's going on, the old lady looks not amused at how they haven't broken through the black serang yet as she probably thinks she could have done the job better. Nevertheless, right before she goes about her business as usual, she commands them to do a better job before ordering the nearby captain to find the strongest and best 50 sea creators. But since there are hundreds of black wolves within the basement still, she tells the captain to get rid of every other wolf not found in the top 50, as it's time for them to perish. So now, all these normie black wolves are screwed over even though they weren't part of the war, as they weren't even aware that an all-out war between the two kingdoms have occurred. Meanwhile, back at the Black Serang's center cell, the current girl in charge is still unable to do anything about him, so she starts thinking about the rumors about how he might not be even into girls at all. But she refuses the notion of him not being into girls, instead, she convinces herself that the Black Serang just has a lot of pride in himself, unlike every other man she's faced off against. As such, she takes the matter into her own hands, or shall we say her own mouth, as she proceeds to continue like a relentless dog wanting some treats. A flashback then occurs back to the time when the Black Serang was still a rookie, where we learn that not a single Delta Force member was able to defeat him, even though he just recently joined. Bro was so strong and undefeated that Baek Mu even allowed for the duels to be as lopsided as 3 versus 1 against him, but the Black Serang always prevailed. 
Eventually, the only other person that was willing to take him on in a duel is another Delta Force rookie, who happens to be Karim the Chad. At this point in time, Karim was already dubbed the Rank 1 Swordsman within the Black Wolves, even though he's been in the Elite Forces for less than two years. Anyways, long story short, this was a duel between the up-and-coming Rank 2 versus the unanimous Rank 1, leading to one of the greatest training battles of all time. In the end, the Black Seren got utterly destroyed in a few seconds, and from that very moment on, he became the greatest simp for Karim due to how strong he was. So after adding up all the pieces together, it all makes sense now that the Black Seren is actually a secret simp for Karim, which explains why he keeps risking his life for him. Anyways, back to the present, the head guard finally feels a little bit of relief after the banana tree plantation has grown, but unbeknownst to her, the reason why it became a footlong is because the Black Serang started thinking about his past with Karim. With the Black Serang finally showing off some of its ferocious fangs, the captain orders for the rest of the guards to instantly get ready for battle, as they are about to fast past each other through the line. Now instead of just one person handling the Black Serang, three more showed up to help, as they planned to go in groups of four to bring the Black Serang to his knees. Since the Black Serang is the most formidable opponent they have ever faced, they plan to force a reaction out of him using the training they've been training their entire lives for. So one mounts the wheel while the rest attack every weak point. With the all-out attack proceeding forward, even a captain gets flustered at the sight of a fang fully evolved, but the one mounting the wolf begins to erupt in glee. The girls then describe him as a super magnet for their catacombs, where they can't stop moving once the magnet is in place, due to its enormous gravitational pull. However, due to the Black Serang being an absolute behemoth as well, the first girl loses her battle so another one instantly takes her turn, so our boy gets zero chance of a relief. Unfortunately for the Crimson Foxes, every girl taking their turn are the ones instantly defeated, while the Black Serang is left literally standing as no one so far can match Battering Ram to their wall. As such, the frustrated captain starts yelling at other guards to get ready, as every other Crimson Fox so far has let her down, so she's hoping for the best. After a couple more foxes get sent to the battle, the girls eventually realize that the time for the Black Serang to lose is almost here, since what kind of man can withstand a relentless attack for days on end? After a couple more hours, our boy finally loses his battle, but he does so in the greatest manner ever, as he was able to explode during a switch, allowing him to successfully waste their time. The entire point was for one of them to successfully extract a seed so they can capture the future Black Serang, but they fail to do so, causing the captain to get absolutely furious to the point she starts punishing her own crew. Meanwhile, back to the battle between the Garimbi and the 1,000-step squad, Herring finally makes his move. Even though the girls are stronger, our boy Herring is the secret weapon for the kingdom of men as he's forced to turn on his serious mode. As such, his blistering speed overwhelms Hira from Hunter x Hunter, allowing him to gank her from behind using teleportation jutsu. In a blink of an eye, Herring appears behind the rice cake, he was supposed to destroy today, but now he has to obliterate her in battle using only the back of his weapon. However, Hira is able to counter by using her signature defensive move she had to learn as restraining orders weren't effective enough for the top 5 ranked member of the special forces. Success, Herang is forced back as her defensive torrent of swings is able to stop any Chad from approaching her, but our boy has something up his sleeve. Since Herring is not just an Ultra Chad, he also happens to be the biggest Sigma male of all time giving him an advantage against the anti-Chad attack, allowing him to find the one single weak spot in her seemingly unstoppable defense. Within mere seconds, Herring is able to destroy Hera's weapon where our boy then proceeds to channel his avatar airbending skills to swiftly close the gap, allowing our boy to activate his special bad breath attack to knock her out. With the unexpected attack being super effective, Hira finds herself already on the ground, totally defeated and unable to procure any more moves, as our boy is able to fully disarm her. Now that our Hunter x Hunter girl totally got destroyed in front of the entire Blackthorn army and her own peers, everyone looks on in shock as Hira has never lost a battle before, let alone a single one versus one. Regardless, Herring stays true to his nickname of being the Prince Behemoth as he takes a quick moment to ask Hira for her collar, as Bro still wants to secure some rice cake smashing for later like a true man. Unfortunately, right before he's able to retrieve her collar, he's forced to dodge away due to his Ultra Instincts activating, letting him know that Blondie is on the move. Now let's be real, Blondie is probably jealous our boy asked for Hira's collar first, so that's why she had to interrupt and insult Herring for being like Solid Snake. Anyways, Blondie smiles on even though her perfect sneak attack failed, so she starts making a remark about how something feels off with Herring, since the dude is showing no signs of desperation at all even when facing impossible odds. Nevertheless, Herring stands and waits for Blondie to make her move, 
so she ends up showcasing her true powers by instantly disappearing using her supersonic speed she learned from the Hedgehog. Although Blondie is lightning fast, our boy is still able to keep track of her, while successfully baiting her to strike him out in the open. With Blondie actually taking the bait, Herring finally activates his trap card by breaking his spear into two, effectively transforming them into some sort of nunchucks. Using his quick thinking, our boy is able to dodge every single attack without even having to face her as Bro got that main character type of power. Now with Herring fully tested to the best of Blondie's abilities, she's able to finally confirm the reason why Ara picked him as the chosen one to clap the irresistible cakes of the goddess. However, after being distracted for literally only one second, our boy takes the opportunity to instantly land a direct blow on Blondie, rendering her absolutely useless. With her finally defeated with a single blow, Herring looks back and starts calling her out for being part of the water hyacinths, whilst busy putting his spear back in its original form. He then takes his time to thank her for helping the boys get out of the city, so in return he reveals to her that if a war actually breaks out and the Crimson Foxes will find themselves totally wiped out by the wolves. Herring then continues on by claiming the fact that he's not ready to perish in battle, so he apologizes if he needs to play a little dirty to make sure he's able to survive. Meanwhile, Silly watches on as Herring makes his Chad speech to Blondie, but upon finishing his speech, Silly surprisingly orders all the archers to stand down from their positions. She even goes as far as threatening her entire army, and if anyone accidentally fires, then they will get clapped by her very own hands. As such, this gives time for Herring to run off while both Blondie and Hira try their best to get back up on their feet to chase down the legendary Prince Behemoth. This time, however, both girls decide they need to drop their pride as they can't take down our boy one versus one, so Kira asks for help to take them down together. Elsewhere on the opposite end of the battlefield, Maru finds himself having an unusually hard time against Alita Battle Angel as she's fighting, with more tenacity than usual. Although they've been fighting off against each other for literally the entire time both have enlisted as part of their respective Delta forces, Maru the nerd knows she's about to obliterate him into Reese's pieces. You might as well call them Nostradamus as he's able to successfully predict his demise mere seconds later. Luckily, Right before Hina is able to land her finishing blow on Maru, Herring shows up last second and saves him by knocking her out with the back of his spear. Unfortunately, Herring had to stop for a few seconds to help out Maru, allowing Hina's sister to catch up to him to land a strike of her own from behind. Right before she thought she had him right where she wanted him to be, our boy instantly turns around and channels his WWE skills to bring her back down to where she belongs. After landing on the ground again, our boy quickly apologizes right before he fully sends her to a dream state, but he's also able to swiftly remind her that she's due for a rice cake smashing with him in the future. Nevertheless, after defeating both Hira and Hina, Herring drops the bomb on Maru that it's all up to him now to support Karim since Herring needs to do the heavy lifting to make sure they all come out of this ordeal alive. Now, right before Maru could even reply back, Herring literally disappears off into the sunset causing Maru to double check if he's seeing things as Bro literally teleported forward. Now that Maru is saved, we discover that Hisper Wong is also having a hard time with his partner as Mira is delivering the strongest attacks he's ever faced. Although these guys are literally lovers, even though Mary do be double dipping on both men and women including Wong, she's actually about ready to send him six feet underground without any hesitation. But just like what happened with Maru, Wong gets absolutely saved in the nick of time by Herring as he's able to one-kick man her into the sunset. He then instantly combos his kick with a self-inflicted whiplash, allowing Mary to go take a quick nap while Herring tells Wong he has a plan for everyone to escape out of this hell hole. However, as Herring is busy telling Wong they need a hostage to make the plan work, Blondie appears from behind with a gentle smirk and continues to gank our boy with her double daggers. The turntables then turn while the two face off in battle once again as Blondie takes the opportunity to talk to Herring while looking like she's trying to win the Best Actress Award at the Oscars. She then reveals the fact that she tied a hidden rope to the end of the cliff behind him, which is marked by a pointy rock just so no one else can see from above. Blondie then continues on by telling our boy that she's ready to act as the hostage, as the boys will need to move ASAP if they want to get out of this place alive, as more and more reinforcements are coming to make sure the elite Karimbi see their end. However, Herring being a true gentleman declines her offer and tells her they don't want to drag her along with this, so Maru sneaks up from behind and sends her to her nappy time. Now that the boys are all united bar Karim, the three musketeers hurry to enact the plan they originally made with Maru telling Wong to stop diddle-dallying as they don't have much time. Unfortunately, Wong refuses to move as it turns out he's the biggest simp of them all, as he wants to say goodbye to Mary as he knows this might be the last time they will see each other again. 
Meanwhile, Seoli stands firm with her decision and orders her army to make sure no one makes a single move as her eyes are glued on to Herring like a true supreme sussy baka. As she watches Herring make a mad dash toward Ara, she starts thinking to herself that she needs to confirm if Herring is actually the real deal against Ara, as she can't believe Mukbum has been hiding such a monster all this time. Regardless, Karim is actually able to hold on to his dear life against the goddess, even though she's no longer holding back against her former number one simp. Now the crazy thing is that Karim had to ask Goku to lend him some powers so this time he's able to, to take more hits than usual as he knows he needs a miracle to survive the oncoming onslaught waiting for him. Nevertheless, for the first time ever, Ara compliments Karim telling him that he's changed, so she asks him outright if his mother actually means so much for him to gain so much power in so little time. She then continues on by delivering a heartbreak telling Karim he actually had a chance to destroy her rice cakes if she held her mother in the same regard as other women, but it's too late now. With Ara ending her talk by claiming that men always seem a step behind, it turns out that she's been playing with him all along as she forced him to the edge of the cliff without him even realizing. Ara then shows off her crazy girlfriend look to Karim and the boys as she turns around to Herring only to angrily tell him that he ruined everything. But then it eventually dawned on her that she's surrounded by the elite Karimbi, so she gets surprised as she finally noticed all of her squad mates have all been knocked out and defeated. Upon learning that it was solely Herring's doing, she starts to look even more crazy as she begins to repeat herself by saying, Our boy ruined everything. Elsewhere, as the goddess talk it out with the boys, a bunch of hooded figures are revealed to be hiding around the mountain overlooking the battlefield, where they plan to take out Ara as soon as she starts combat with the Garimbi. It then turns out that these women have been sent by the current queen to make sure they dispatch of Ara, as it's a perfect opportunity to take her out while she can place blame on the elite Garimbi. Luckily, not a single soul dares to make a move as the entire army of girls are busy getting ready to watch their first sword in action against four elite Garimbi. Regardless, Maru informs Ara that they plan to use her as bait as they know Sili won't order her squad to take a shot which could endanger her. However, Ara claps back by claiming that she has zero intentions of becoming bait for them so the only way they could ever use her is to take her down and send her to the afterlife. With Ara's true Chad powers pulsating through her words, she points her sword at the boys and tells them that she's ready to take down at least two with her to the next dimension. She then continues on by switching her stance towards Herring asking the rest of the boys if they're even at all curious to see how strong Herring actually is as this Prince Behemoth came out of nowhere. As such, she ends up successfully baiting them to leave her on a one versus one against Herring, since she personally calls out Karim being the most curious out of them all. Even though Herring looks at the rest of the boys for some of support, each one look away and tell him that they're actually super curious to see how strong Prince Behemoth really is. Even Karim refuses to say anything as literally every single one left on the battlefield wishes to see if the Prince Behemoth really do be packing in more ways than one. And so we leave off with Herring happy to duel Era in front of everyone, even though he never expected this outcome. And so the greatest anime duel is about to begin, but Era instantly asks the boys how long they think Mr. Chicken Nuggets can last inside her sweet and sour sauce. However, our boy is not even remotely deterred by his queen's attempt in trash talk as he knows things are about to get super fun, especially with an entire audience from both kingdoms watching, ready to see his ultimate reveal of his chat powers. Meanwhile, for the first time ever, the elite Garimbi have finally witnessed the rank 1 swordsman of all time smile so things might get super sussy real quick. Regardless, our boy readies his defensive stance looking like a super sigma male since Herring knows this is a do or perish situation and he really wants to live another day as he promised Blondie and Hira a rice cake smashing appointment in the future. Elsewhere, Sildi watches on while still on top of the mountain overlooking the duel, but it finally dawned on her that Ara is a genius since she probably planned this all along to make sure Herring gets an audience in front of the masses to showcase his skills. And out of anyone else in the world, the only person that can confirm how overpowered Herring really is is actually herself so she's actually super mega brain bro. Now the crazy part is if Herring is actually able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ara in front of everyone, then they will all know that our boy is strong enough to challenge the North Wind for the throne. Regardless, the battle finally starts with Ara making the first move as she's the best Stacey of all times, so within a blink of an eye she made headway within Herring's attack range. She then attempts to deliver a strike, but her blow barely misses due to our boy's insane Matrix dodging abilities even in the face of blistering speed. However, Ara is unlike any other opponent he's ever faced before as our girl instantly reappears like an upper rank 6 demon giving Herring no breathing time as her attacks are relentless. Luckily, our boy is somehow able to perfectly parry all the upcoming blows from her, almost as if his ultra instincts is on another level compared to the goddess. 
But again, within another blink of an eye, Arad disappears like my silent farts within the wind, leaving her totally untraceable with the naked eye. And within a second, she swiftly reappears from behind and attempts another devastating blow, exactly just like when the enemy jungler happens to be a pro Shaco. Fortunately for our boy, his intense focus allows him to literally dodge last second leaving just an inch between her final blow and his body from making contact, so Herring knows she's not holding anything back. Meanwhile, Ara's oldest and richest oil simp can only watch on as he starts getting more jelly than my belly due to him being unable to comprehend exactly how Herring's power level is over 9000. With the battle heating up and becoming more intense as the seemingly infinite seconds pass, Karim realizes that his younger brother really is the real deal. As such, Karim begins to get flashbacks to the time when he first encountered Ara in the wild where she absolutely destroyed him to pieces like a honey badger against its prey, and there was not a thing he could do to prevent his first loss. Now I don't blame our bro for forever simping for Ara as her short hair totally hit different back then cause she looking like a true goddess here. Anyways back in the present, Karim's eye widen even more as he watches Herring continually keep up with Ara, and unlike Herring, it took years for him to even last more than a minute against her in battle. Nevertheless, both the Prince Behemoth and the Goddess Reincarnation start smiling like absolute menaces in the middle of battle, as no one up to this point in their life has ever kept up. And just like that, Herring has started to think playtime is soon over as he's secretly finished, downloading Ara's entire skill moves so he readies to go on the counter. Ara, however, has other plans so she tries her best to keep Herring from the offensive as she wants everyone in the world to see this boy should be the future king. But the turntables turn in just a few seconds after Ara thought she had the upper hand, leading to Herring taking the prime opportunity handed to him to trip her to the ground. Surprisingly, Ara is so strong that right before she hit the ground from getting tripped, she instantly levitated and recoiled back on her feet without her even touching the ground. With just a single blunder in battle, the Blackthorn members start looking a little bit worried as they are absolutely gobsmacked that their first sword has not yet dealt a finishing blow to Herring. Instead, the boy is still up and running, and this time he's looking like he's finally got the chance to take the upper hand, so he charges on forward like a madman wanting free chicken sandwiches from Popeyes. Now that Herring has his best foot forward, his first strike leaves traces of an enormous air blast showcasing his tremendous strength and power. The offensive blow is so strong that it left Karim in the dust thinking about how Wukbong was right the entire time. It took him too long to realize that his own father has been hinting to him that his lil bro must be hiding something special, but he was too distracted by Ara's scrumptious rice cakes. Regardless, Curran finally stops being an emo Levi Ackerman, and flashes a smile for the first time ever, just like Ara. With every minute slowly passing by, the Black Thorn and the army of girls get even more flabbergasted as they witness Herang keep up with Ara, but to also do so while barely receiving any scratches. At the same time, Seelie is astonished to see that not only is Herring keeping up with her, but she's the only one that notices that our boy is actually making Ara fall behind. Now, this isn't the only time Herring has ganked and surprised her from behind, as his prince behemoth has already greeted the papayas of the goddess beforehand. Anyways, as the duel waged on, Herring was able to make headway by continually forcing Ara back due to his immense expert skills he mainly learned from Roblox. However, Unlike most people losing a battle, Ara starts giggling and begins to wonder why she's having so much fun, since she's always used to smurfing on some iron noobs and one-tapping them while being the rank 1 radiant player. Nonetheless, while totally distracted by a feeling she's never experienced before, she realizes too late that Herring is forced to the edge of a cliff without her ever noticing. And our boy was able to do this all while using some trash weapon he picked up from a local barn while Ara was using the best sword of the ages, but as she gets cornered to the edge by Herring, it dawns on Karim that he can no longer stand aside and watch his younger brother take all the spotlight. As such, Karim's inner demons come out and take over his soul, convincing himself that there's no such thing as honor in an all-out war, so he lunges forward like a maniac. In just a matter of just a few minutes, he went from believing in his brother to save them all, to losing to his intrusive thoughts as he wants revenge on the one woman that broke his heart. Even Wong and Maru get absolutely shocked at their captain's actions as they know no one ever breaks the dual pact unless you are a mega soy boy. However, right before he lands the finishing blow to send the oblivious goddess to the other realm, Lady Karma calls him a mega baka and claps him with an arrow last second. As Karim falls towards Era due to the impact of the shot, she notices behind him that another blinding light is fast approaching looking like she's the target this time. And since Arav had a small glimpse of the speeding arrow coming right after her, she's able to luckily stave off the attack last second by deflecting it with her trusty sword. She's then able to instantly find out where the arrow was shot from. 
so she ends up seeing two archers set up directly opposite of the mountain. Unfortunately, she couldn't see who exactly was the culprit as she only saw their shadows, so Seoli comes to the rescue and swiftly orders the Black Thorn to catch the fugitives. With chaos now amok due to the attempt on the lives of the future queen, Seoli comes to the conclusion that it must be the wolves behind this or else it must be the current queen. Meanwhile, Karim dramatically falls off the edge of the cliff looking totally unconscious due to the arrow, even though Bro has taken worse hits in his life before and came out unscathed. Regardless, Arabi and Nice actually tries to save him while he falls to the deepest depths of Gurijim, but she barely makes it on time so she's unable to catch his hand. With her turning into an angel by attempting to save Karim, she ends up accidentally taking a step too far forward, so she ends up finding herself in a sticky situation. Luckily, Harang the true Mega Chad comes to the rescue and grabs her hand to catch her from falling. To Harang's surprise though, instead of Arab being grateful, she instead calls him stupid for risking his life to save her as he's just going to end up falling as well. But here's the thing, even though Harang has a massive banana tree behind his armor, he's also hiding a big brain so he's already planned to catch them both using the rope Blondie he hit earlier. Simultaneously useless Maru and Wong try to catch both of them before they fall since apparently no one cared about Karim. Unfortunately, the other two elite Garimbi members missed out on the Sonic the Hedgehog speed classes, so they were too late to the scene to be of use. Instead of being helpful this entire time, the boys just decide to strike a pose so they can look cool in front of the army of girls. Silence then echoed throughout the entire valley as every single person alive stopped in their tracks, unable to believe what they just witnessed as both rank ones of both nations just fell off a cliff, no one ever survives. Eventually, Silly breaks the silence as she too could not believe what just happened so she raises her arm in retaliation signaling to the girls as time. Now outraged that the hope of the kingdom of women have been taken out through despicable means, Seely yells like Erwin Smith and tells her army to obliterate the Garimbi. A hail of arrows then swiftly illuminate the afternoon sky, leaving both Maru and Moon to fend for themselves, 1 versus 6900. But in the face of all adversity, Maru the nerd can only watch on as he knows his and Wong's chance of surviving is slim to none with both Herring and their captain gone. Meanwhile, Herring tries his best to become the most legendary anime hero of all time by making sure he secures another rice cake smashing with Ara, but it looks like his luck is about to run out. With only having a few seconds left to react to save both of them from imminent splatter, he luckily remembers that Blondie from earlier has left a rope nearby just in case. As such, he's able to brute force his Batman flying ability by successfully swinging in the air leading him to actually reach the rope with one hand. Unfortunately, his left hand slowly becomes Swiss cheese as it gets graded by the rope with him trying his hardest to make sure Ara and himself can be saved before the two reach the end of the rope. Eventually, Herring is able to fully stop their descent with sheer force, so he's able to complete his mission of securing another rice cake smashing by saving both of them literally inches before the end. But then things take a non-sussy turn as Ara somehow slips from Herring's hand, but you'd think someone as legendary as her would have already been able to swing onto the rope using her overpowered skills. Regardless, as she falls into the mystical gorge where no one ever recalls back to base, she looks as if she remembered she ate some bean, burritos, and things are about to get ugly. Ara then disappears into the mist that was quickly created by the outcome of her eating her bean burritos, so she ends up looking like she's about to make an appearance in the Splatoon series. But like a true Chad, a king never leaves his queen behind, so Herring decides he ain't going nowhere with Ara, so he lets go and follows his destiny. Elsewhere, things don't look too hot for the elite Garimbi boys either as Wong commands Maru to hide behind him as his shield is their only chance of making it through. And as the unlimited arrows begin pelting two of the top six ranked boys, they oddly start hearing black pink in their heads going hit you with that do you do do. Nonetheless, with every second passing feeling like an eternity, Wong turns around like a true Sigma male and yells at Maru to do whatever it takes for him to get out of here in one piece. He continues by claiming that since he has such a much bigger brain than him, then he has his utmost belief in him being able to make it out unlike his boy Rengoku. Nevertheless, Wong ends up simping till the end even with his end screen flashing right before him, so he tries to ask Maru for just one last favor. Unfortunately, Bro failed to fully deliver his message to Maru as he accidentally got one shotted right before he could finish his sentence. With Wong finally seeing his defeat end screen, the elite Garimbi lose their first ever member in battle, so Maru is only able to pat his old friend goodbye while saying there will be another time when they can all meet again. Mere seconds after, Maru scans the battlefield looking for Alita Battle Angel making sure she's okay. Since it seems like every member of the elite Garimbi are mega simps in one way or another. Regardless, he bids farewell to both and tells them to sleep tight right before he activated his amazing disappearing jutsu. 
Shortly after Maru disappears into the fold, Sully makes her way in front of the fallen Garimbi member looking a little bit sad. While she receives news that the Black Thorn have been unable to find the source of the arrows that targeted the future queen, she continues to be quiet and is unable to utter any commands. Eventually, with her back still turned away from her entire army, she looks on forward while ordering her captains it's time for them to withdraw. She then commands everyone by telling them their pursuit ends here, and for everyone to return to their respective units while they await further command from her. Now with the entire girls' only army beginning to disband to head back to headquarters, Silly subtly scans her left, and to her left she finds both Hera and Blondie totally stricken with disbelief as they can only watch on from the top of the gorge, feeling full with regret as they weren't able to protect the strongest woman on the planet and their best friend. Elsewhere, Mira finally regains consciousness and upon learning about what happened to her beloved womb, she instantly collapses to the ground. Now for the first time ever, the girls begin to cry as they can't handle both their lovers being gone and their best friend gone with them as well. With the twin sisters and Mira still taking time to digest what just happened, Blondie and Seelie make subtle eye contact, looking like they both want to say something, but it's too public to do so. After continuing their staring contest for a couple more seconds, it looks like the two girls delivered a message using their telepathic abilities they learned from Anya, allowing Silly to finally leave. As Selly steps away from the aftermath, Ira finally speaks up asking Blondie what's next since she's never imagined for this to ever happen. With Hira still stuck in the past and stuck looking into the bottomless pit before her, Blondie responds by telling her it's useless to keep thinking about the past since from now on, they won't even get the chance to think. Meanwhile, at the bottom of Mount Gurijim, an ominous blue darkness begins to engulf the first sword of the Crimson Foxes. Ara is then able to open her eyes, somehow still alert and animated even after the major fall, but she starts seeing the purple-blue darkness close in on her with weird sounds emanating from afar. Trees then come alive, looking a little bit hungry for some prey, so this is giving me flashbacks to our boy clapped a tree series. Regardless, with the rank one of the Crimson Foxes surviving the epic fall, she tries to move but is unable to do so. Suddenly, as she keeps trying to get up, she sees from the corner of her eye another tree looking like an evil sussy warrior. And upon closer inspection, she realizes that the sussy purple tree man has taken the form of a human looking eerily like Captain Karim, ready to enact his revenge. Suddenly, as we scroll, I yell at our editor to make sure to do overtime work, as purple things not looking like tree branches start to ooze from Karim, and let's just say these things look super sussy. Let's just act like this is sword art online again and tell ourselves that this is super extendable tree branches ready to rumble. Anyways, the rest was history as the purple tree branches begin attacking and sieging Ara in more ways than you can imagine. As the planet of Ara is ravaged by weird branches, our hero Herring appears out of nowhere and interferes by ordering his captain to nicely take a few steps back from his queen. However, Karim infused with the evil soul of Garaj and refuses and continues his attack while he stares at his younger brother ominously. Suddenly, in Karim's point of view, Herring is turned into a boy looking like a happy pumpkin ready to destroy his bum. Of course, evil Karim looks like he ain't want no one to be happy just like himself, so his inner rage starts to boil as he gets ready to go on his war path. And within mere seconds, the two strongest black wolves clash against one another, leading to Ara getting dropped on the ground. It then turns out to be some kind of dream for Ara, as she had her armor totally shredded by Karim earlier, and now it's all somehow back together in one piece. Regardless, she becomes war focused and aware of her situation, still unable to move much, but at least she's grateful that she's still kicking. Then out of nowhere, she hears some growling to her side, so she attempts her best to scan the area to no avail. It's then revealed that the sound she's hearing is stemming from Herring fighting something fast and mysterious. And in just a blink of an eye after Herring goes on his defensive stance, he gets sent flying just from a single blow of Karim still looking like he's infused with evil power. Our boy is then left shocked as he can't believe his brother randomly got so strong even though bro is littered with injuries. It's basically like if Karim turned into a zombie and now no amount of physical damage can stop him from giving his best while infused with the mysterious energy. As Herring continues to try and make sure he doesn't do too much damage to his brother, it dawns on him that if Karim is unable to snap back to reality, then there's no way for him to save them both at this rate plus he has no idea how to get out. Eventually, Herring convinces himself that he can't keep this up, so he needs to charge up his Rasengan as Karim is gaining more speed and power by the second. As such, he drops his sword and instantly disarms his brother mid-attack, baiting him into swinging allowing him to take the upper hand. Herring then swiftly combos his attack into an effective takedown, all thanks to his cousin John Cena, allowing Herring to send his brother flying off like Team Rocket. 
Upon finally destroying his brother using all his might, Herring rushes over to where Karim lands and tells him to stop being a woozy oozy as it ain't time for Karim to join Wom in the afterlife. Luckily, Herring's efforts lead to Karim actually snapping back to reality but he barely has any energy left so he passes out while only seeing the faint outline of his lil bro. Nevertheless, after soundly defeating an evil Karim in battle, Herring heads straight to Ara to make sure she's okay and apologizes for stealing her sword for just a couple minutes. And like a true Chad, he picks her up from the ground and puts her on his back, allowing him to easily carry the dead weight on his team just so the two can both reach Radiant together. Unfortunately for the two lovebirds, they ventured off into the maze that is Mount Gurajem literally right before Mukbum was able to rescue them. It's then revealed that Muk went after them secretly, but the only thing they found at the bottom of the gorge was Karim totally unconscious and with Herring nowhere to be found. Muk then tries his best to search for his other boy, but to no avail, as they were only able to find Maru hanging on a tree branch for his dear life. Nonetheless, knowing that they only have a few more minutes before they are forced to resurface back up the mountain, he screams as loud as he can hoping that Herring can hear him, but all Muk is met with is resounding silence. Eventually, Ro gets a tap on his shoulder, so he tries his best to yell the loudest he could but still he's unable to hear any kind of response back. And so Muk is forced to turn around, totally gutted as he knows he can endanger his entire squad just for one person even if it means leaving behind one of his sons. Meanwhile, back in the headquarters of the Kingdom of Women, the current queen stares outside her window while receiving news that both future queens and kings have fallen into the depths of Mount Gurijam. Of course, she's totally elated as this was the best outcome she could have ever imagined, allowing her and the North Wind to continue on with their reigns unopposed. Fast forward to the evening, the North Wind waits on top of a hill in total darkness, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike into the heart of the kingdom. He then disappears back into the cover of darkness, while Seal is busy debriefing the top brass about the special weapon that the Black Wolves have conjured up to make sure any Crimson Fox is left useless during battle. Regardless, with news that imminent danger looms over the horizon, the Supreme Commander, Edo Marin, orders all the girls stationed at the border to turn on and activate their eagle eyes. She then slams her hand on the table, telling Seal Lee she also has something planned for her squad as the Delta forces will not be partaking in the defensive operations. Mary then scolds her for not only letting the king simp escape from the Gomage, but she's also responsible for the Crimson Foxes losing their first sword in a Ra. Instead, Naren tasks the Silver Beauty to do everything in her power to make sure she destroys the Black Wolves' poisonous fog. As with it, there's not much they can do to counter the boys. So without any hesitation, Silly takes it upon herself to channel her best SpongeBob imitation and goes, I, I, Captain. Elsewhere, the girls tasked to defend the outskirts of the nation start to get scared as ominous fog begins to roll in during the night. Now coupled with urgent news that the Crimson Foxes have dispatched the reserves to reinforce them, the girls are more anxious than ever as they can't believe that the Black Wolves really are trying to invade their homelands. Suddenly, one of the squad captains notices a billion lights pop up from some torches just a few yards out. Unfortunately, she doesn't think much of it as she thought, it's just a bunch of her own scouts. However, it finally dawned on her that it's way too many lights just for her own scouting group. Eventually, she realizes she screwed up for staring too long as she's forced to watch a bunch of fire arrows illuminate the night sky. Luckily, these girls don't skip leg day so a majority of them were able to raise some gigantic shields on top of them in an attempt to block the Fire Nation from hitting their target. Shortly after, the girls were finally able to sound their alarms, alerting the rest of the city that they are fully under attack. But just like the Boston Celtics, they were too late to extinguish the Miami Heat. Now here's the thing, right? Normal fire arrows don't really do much if you can successfully block them. But here's the problem for the girls, those arrows weren't just any normal ones as they shortly discovered that each one had some fireworks ready to blow. And within just a few seconds, those stationed on top of the walls found out what's it really like during celebrations on Independence Day, and let's just say their experience was the bomb. Initially, the girls thought it was some kind of smokescreen exploding, but then the Sussy Baka army arrived to show them a true lesson. Mere seconds later, every single girl began to fall to the ground, unable to handle what the heck is happening as their papayas seem to be more active than usual. Nonetheless, as the secret weapon gets unveiled, the Black Wolves' Delta Force show up near the wall, spearheaded by the one and only Ninja Turtle himself. With Eden being gone for a very long time since he wasn't invited to the Gomage due to Blani being on guard that day, he was the only elite Garimbi left behind without a rice cake smashing partner on the fateful day. So now our fat boy is the strongest person in the Black Wolves' Delta Forces, and he's still totally down to destroy the Kingdom of Women. As such, he's the first one at the walls of the city, still looking like he's been eating a lot of McDonald's every day and hasn't stopped since. 
However, upon smoothly landing on top of the walls, we finally get to see his eyes open as Bro starts to look around a little bit disgruntled. Meanwhile, the Crimson Foxes all look like they want to remove all their armor due to the Florida heat, unable to stand guard even with the wolves right in front of them. A grandma then appears, who happens to be the general of the city, but she looks totally unaffected, so she pieces one and one together to equal eleven, and realizes that the wolves' secret weapon barely has an effect on the oldies. But then, like an absolute menace to society, Ian became Miley Cyrus and turned on his wrecking ball and decided to clip the grandma in charge without any hesitation. He then proceeded to take his weapon back from his target and without any remorse, started leveling up his experience by finishing off everyone else as Bro wasted no time as he really wanted to play Diablo 4 on release. After leveling up his dark phase, a couple more Black Wolves Delta forces poured in behind to follow him, all calling him to lead the way as the new first sword. However, Mr. Ninja Turtle scoffs at his underlings and orders them to stop calling him the first sword, but the boys clap back and tell him that no matter what, he's officially head of the Delta Forces with the rest of the elite Garimbi missing. Nevertheless, out in the courtyard, another squad captain urgently commands for someone to release the carrier pigeons and to retreat orderly, as they are basically facing impossible odds. Unfortunately for the Crimson Foxes still trapped within the city, their front gates begin to be breached as some Black Wolves have overtaken the gate controls. With the gate slowly opening up, some do looking like a jacked roof from Despicable Me readies a flare to indicate that it's time for them to charge in. He then yoinks the flare straight up into the sky, turning the darkness into morning in an instant, but the girls could only watch on confused. Now with the night sky totally illuminated, the girls start hearing some rumbling from a distance, but it only gets louder and louder as dark specks from afar begin to close in on them. Eventually, the entire army of men come crashing through the front gates with shields in hand, ready to take down any crimson fox as most of these guys are extra virgin olive oil bottles ready to rumble. And so the first all-out battle begins inside the territory of the crimson foxes, but surprisingly not a single girl dares to run away which showcases their true chadness in them. Instead of running away, the girls charge forward like a bunch of Amazonian girls ready to smash some brain-damaged wolves, even while knowing their advance is absolutely futile due to being totally outnumbered and without any reinforcements. Unfortunately for these brave heroes, the boys decide to be a bunch of woozies, and instead of taking them on with numbers greater than 20 to 1, they instead pull out their secret weapon. And just within a blink of an eye, all the crimson foxes within range fall to the ground as they can't help but be overrun by their papaya's thinking for them. After seeing their opponents fall down, the wolves rush forward gleefully as these guys ain't no men, so they start leveling up their experience one by one, but some decide to tie up some foxes to take home as a prize. Luckily, these menaces to society get too overconfident, so they end up getting ganked by a bunch of old chads, totally unaffected by their secret weapon. Now it's no wonder the kingdom of men was previously clapped by the women, since even the grandmas can single-handedly destroy a bunch of black wolves in their prime. So with a bunch of grandmas charging forward like true men, most of the front line of the black wolves get absolutely decimated while some begin to run as they are afraid of planet Uranus closing in on them. And with every minute passing, the Crimson Foxes slowly make headway against the evil forces, all thanks to the ones that bake us cookies all the time. Elsewhere, Harang continues to carry the goddess Ara deep within the legendary Gurujum depths, hoping to find an exit, but these two have been wandering around for ages. However, while traversing through the impossible terrain, more and more ominous purple glows start to shadow and follow Harang unbeknownst to him. Eventually, he loses his voice while trying to talk to an unconscious Ara due to him constantly talking to an unconscious Ara, but at the same time, Herring doesn't notice the purple aura has gotten real close behind them. Suddenly, Ara wakes up after getting jolted awake from the purple spirit entering her body, almost as if she's been taken over by a mysterious entity. Eventually, Herring notices some incomprehensible whispers stemming from Ara, so he turns around only to discover his queen has transformed into an otherworldly being. He then falls down after getting jump scared from playing too much Outlast Trials, but Ara begins to cosplay a cowboy and aggressively straddles the horse in front of her. Mere seconds later, she starts to be engulfed by some kind of purple flame looking like she just came out from the Dragon Ball Z universe, whilst totally keeping silent while on top of Herring. Our boy then begins to think he's hallucinating for being inside the danger zone of Mount Gurujum for too long, so he attempts to figure out what he can do to go back to his senses. Unfortunately for Herring, he isn't hallucinating at all, so out of nowhere, he starts feeling something holding down his arms to the ground, looking like some kind of hairy octopus weapon you totally see in some very sussy anime. We then turn into Sussy Street as Ara starts to attack Herring all over, while she simultaneously holds onto his banana tree plantation like Gorilla Glue. 
Things then get even more intense as she starts to pour invisibility potions on her armor, looking like she's ready to partake in some rice cake smashing. Anyways, after successfully disarming her full suit of armor using some potions, she starts staring at Herring, with her twin pyramids of Giza joining in on the stare. Eventually, our boy starts to glow like a Ra, due to the mystical goddess going ham on his banana tree plantation, to make sure it's fully grown and ready to endure. And much to Hanarang's surprise, she turns his banana tree plantation into a banana milkshake and drains it like an expert by drinking it whole. Eventually, he explodes unannounced, allowing both him and Ra to go back to their senses, but his sudden action has led to him getting clapped in the face in the aftermath. Regardless, he makes an excuse that he exploded abruptly, all due to him being so lonely and bored all this time, but he's glad he's finally erupted the volcano. Anyways, the two lovebirds end up finding some saving grace by finding a random patch of grass and with a small crack inside the rocks, so they decided to check it out. Upon further investigation, they realize there's more patches of grass within the insides of the rock, so they decide to take a breather inside as it's way warmer within the crack instead of outside. As the battle between both kingdoms rage on, something else raged even more as the strongest man on the planet, Herring, has been busy getting his banana tree plantation harvested by Ara. Anyways, this common look-alike is actually the strongest woman on the planet, and the two find themselves stuck in the legendary mists of Mount Garajam after falling off a crevice during battle. Regardless, these two need to get out quickly or else they will forever face endless hallucinations just like when people think this isn't a family-friendly anime. But then suddenly, out pops the blue-haired beauty with a look that would make any man next to a girl know they have struck gold as she wants to mine his gold mine straight into her sussy gold cart. And just as we know it, our boy knows it's time to rev his engine as the choo-choo train is about to go fast and furious. So now it's absolutely clear that all these two needed was just a nap from his banana tree plantation exploding literally an hour before, just so they can do some rice cake smashing now. Nevertheless, the two ended up becoming one like me and Korean fried chicken, as Herring absolutely destroyed the piece of food in front of him, almost like he was doing an endless mukbang. But then, like all real men, he ganks Ara with some tears of joy, or so I think anyways, allowing Ara to make this a very wholesome anime moment, which is very much needed. Shortly after crying like a baby, Bro actually fell asleep with his prince behemoth, still stuck inside Ara's special target area, but she didn't mind at all. However, the two deep in slumber due to the mysterious fog end up getting disturbed awake by a mysterious figure, wondering why Herring is saying good morning to his wood. After a few more seconds, the blurriness wipes away as the two rice cake smashers are forced to stare at a friendly-looking grandma busy wondering what the heck is going on. She then grins as we figure out she's actually a sussy grandma since she starts making jokes about holes, leaving both the first swords of the wolves and foxes stunned in disbelief. As such, Herring begins to tremble, but not because he's scared but more so due to his prince behemoth shrinking by the second. But unlike Herring, Ara is a super Stacy, so she quickly whips out her sword, ordering the grandma to explain who she is. At the same time, two more mysterious figures appear, both looking a little bit flustered as they can't believe both a dude and a girl is out being chilling without their equipments on. Thus, the grandma interrupts the entire ordeal, smiling once again while suggesting to the two lovebirds to put on some armor quickly. After re-equipping their armor, the first swords follow suit behind the brand new group of people, still dumbfounded how the girls and guys are working together. Suddenly, as the group continues the trek, we learn that the mysterious people have brought a baby with them, causing Herring and Ara to eventually hear one crying. Nonetheless, Ara takes charge and avoids beating around the bush, so she straight up asks how the heck men and women are working together, especially with a baby. However, Sussy Grandma tells them that they have no time to explain right now, but if the two come with them, then they can talk about it after they get out of the area. She then continues on and warns them that if they decided not to follow them, then they will probably end up like the bones behind her, so it's up to them to decide. Regardless, the two take a closer look at the pile of bones, only to come to the realization that the mountains were actually made out of those unfortunate enough not to make it out. As both Herring and Ara continue to stare at the bottomless pits, Sussy Grandma turns around and tells the two that her group is part of the Freeborn, and now it's their turn to tell their story. Luckily, right before Herring and Ara can say a word, Sussy Grandma bails them out by saying they can do so after they get out as time is ticking. Elsewhere, the war rages on harder than my teammates flaming and raging mid-game, where we find black wolves astonished at finally seeing a real woman. But the first thing most of these dudes do is start fiddling with their captured as if it was the Barbie movie. Luckily for this one captured Pokemon, a mama bird comes to the rescue by cutting the ropes away and slabs her awake whilst destroying the one sussy baka in front of her. After destroying one sussy baka, 
More sussy backups fall as we see multiple more old ladies appear out of nowhere, seemingly due to the crimson foxes realizing that the special weapon doesn't work on older mommies. Unfortunately for them, it's going to be a tall task as they are way past their prime and a bunch of noob men keep rolling in as if they have an endless supply of fresh meat. And to make matters worse, Mr. Fat Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle is still around, including the entirety of the leftovers of the Delta Company of the Wolves. However, as time slowly passes, the Crimson Foxes are able to recover some ground since it's still like a bunch of level 1s having to compete against a bunch of washed-up level 60 pros. As such, the current leader of the Delta Force is required to intervene, and don't worry, you are right he does have such a punchable face. Nevertheless, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle holds nothing back and claps one, and I'm sure he's just frustrated he wasn't picked to do some rice cake smashing. Anyways, after clapping one, he instantly claps another with no regret, forcing the old mommy garrison to send out an all-out attack to try and force Eden to a halt. But Pro ain't no piece of Filipino cheese, so he's able to swiftly parry multiple attacks at once with ease. And so Eden Steam rolls one after another, looking like he's at an all-you-can-eat buffet with unlimited options and unlimited time. Eventually, Eden's backup arrives as more of the Delta Force show up, leading to the destruction of the last woman standing. Meanwhile, as Eden and a few other Delta Force members clear out the way versus the old mommy garrison 5 versus 100, the rookie wolves are seen glued to the ground, unable to fathom what they just witnessed. Nevertheless, after the pathway is fully cleared, a commander shows up and orders them forward, whilst calling all of them a bunch of wimps, even though Bro accidentally leaked a little earlier. Now fast forward an hour later, deep within the walls of the Kingdom of Foxes, all we can hear is footsteps running amok. It's then revealed that the women are trying to escort the young ones and super ancient ones to safety as the black wolves continue forward, but they get blocked by some formidable foes. As such, no one is able to escape within the first city limits, due to Eden, and the Delta forces blocking all the exits out the city, leaving a very grim mood within the air. Now Alexa plays some sad music as the women are forced to watch their homes and city burn down to the ground, even though they never did anything wrong other than being born with papayas. And so slowly but surely each one begin to fall on their knees, but the sound of horses can be heard rumbling through the gates. With the entire town now occupied and defeated, the king of all men, the North Wind, makes his appearance through the front gates, leaving only the sound of fire burning being heard. He then takes a moment to stop and watch the surroundings burn, smiling whilst thinking to himself that his first target has been successfully completed, so now on to the next. Elsewhere, back to the Freemorn village, the author strikes back with a clear plot twist no one ever saw coming. He reveals a blue-haired man, looking like an older herring, is busy healing the wounds of the biggest simp, Mr. Kareem himself. As Mega Simp Kareem is slowly able to regain consciousness, he looks around and finds more of the, his squad beside with a mysterious figure lurking in the background. The man is then revealed to be Mokbum himself, so Karim quickly asks what the heck is going on, only for Mokbum to notify him that he will know once the right time comes. Now let's not forget Karim finally figured out the fact that Mokbum is his real father, basically making him the older brother of Herring. Anyways, while speaking of the devil, Herring and Ara is still busy making their way to Freeborn Village, where the two get warned that if they try to escape, then the Freeborn will free knife stab them instead. Luckily, Herring has no qualms with their request, as Bro only wants to rice cake smash Ara, while also wanting free food if possible. However, as Herring makes a joke about free food, the girl who warns them to not escape suddenly blurts out how creepy it is that Herring looks exactly like someone she knows. Regardless, we fast forward to the group finally making it the Freeborn Village, where Herring and Ara get welcomed to the village called Supia. Here, men and women live happily and freely together with no strings attached, which is quite the opposite compared to the outside world. They even have one person in supreme charge, which just so happens to be a super grandma kind of looking like a nice witch in a way. Anyway, Sussy Grandma introduces our two lovebirds to the supreme old one, who's surprisingly quick to welcome them, as she smiles upon learning that the Freeborn found them doing some free armor exercises together. As word then gets out that they found the two rice cakes smashing, the entire room lights up with the newfound information, but the Supreme One continues and introduces herself as Nilsani. After introducing herself, she asks Herring and Arad to introduce themselves as well, but when Herring announces his name, the audience pipes up claiming that there's no way he's the son of Mukbum. Nevertheless, Ara ignores the commotion behind her and continues to introduce herself as Ara Yunsul, the daughter of Hasil Ran. In an instant, the room goes quiet upon hearing her name as everyone is left in disbelief that she's really a Ra, especially since they think Herring is some kind of scrub. As such, Nyolseni doubles down and directly asks Ara if she really is the first sore of the Crimson Foxes, to which she confirms. 
After truly confirming their identities, the crowd behind them begins to erupt once again, totally confused as to why a future queen is out at Freeborn Village. Thus, Supreme Grandma pipes up again, questioning Arad if she really wants to become one of them. However, a straight-faced Ara replies by saying she never agreed to become a Freeborn and states that she will come back to the Crimson Foxes when the time is right, but also promises she will keep the Freeborn a secret. After a few seconds of awkward silence, Ara continues by saying that the Freeborn have the Queen's word that she will forever keep Supia a secret, leading to the crowd being seen utterly confused. At the same time, Herring decides to piggyback on Ara's promise and claims that Supia also has the King's word, suggesting that he's planning to overthrow the North Wind. However, the Grinch just laughs at Herring's comments, but continues on sarcastically by claiming it's nice to have both rulers at the same time in Supia. With Zaddy Herring and Princess Purple Peach now fully declaring their intentions to become royals like the British, Mule Sani allows them to stay as long as they want, but a hairy boy in the back isn't so sure. Regardless, Mule Sani mentions that the two will be under watch and hopes they don't mind, so maybe this could be a super sussy old grandma wanting to witness some royal rice cake smashing herself. Suddenly, just as we thought all was well and normal, a freeborn scout pushes through the crowd with an urgent message, looking like he really needs to drop a dookie. Bro then cosplays a bomber pilot, as he drops a massive bomb on Nilseni, as he informs her that the war has begun, and that the fox's Northwain has fallen. In mere seconds, Nilseni's cheery mood instantly gets wiped off her face, unable to believe that Northwain fell in less than a day. The scout then continues on by informing them that the foxes couldn't even fight back, so now most are held captive, causing Ara to look like she's about to start her villain arc. Meanwhile, back at the fallen city of the foxes, the North Wind basks in his glory, so the first thing he does is do your typical evil villain monologue while letting his army go to pound town underneath. It's then revealed that even in anime, war is never good especially for the losing side, which is the same case here since every captured fox are now experiencing an all-you-can-eat buffet, unfortunately. They're the cakes being destroyed and eaten. The cake buffet here is so tremendously alluring that even the officers look like they are about to pass out, unable to handle the urge of unlimited rice cake smashing. Luckily for the foxes, though, most of these nudes are like you where they stay true to their nickname of One Pump Chump, allowing for the girls to have their own small victories against these monsters. Nevertheless, outside the designated vanilla milkshake explosion area, two wolves stand guard, but the guy on the right urges his partner to take his turn where he explains to him that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. However, the absolute Chad refuses to partake in rice cake smashing and tells the loser beside him that he'd rather be a virgin for life than become a monster today, as what they are doing is not something he signed up for. Anyways, back at the freeborn village of Supia, both Herring and Ara are being shown their quarters by the same red head with a choker, who happens to be looking for someone. Apparently, she's looking for someone that looks like an older version of Herring, Almost like as if the guy could actually be the real dad of the Prince Behemoth. And speak of the devil, a spitting image of an older herring ganks them from nowhere, armed with the same demeanor of the future king. Nonetheless, the mysterious man is introduced to us as Wolion, but he do be really looking like the real biological father of herring or someone super closely related like an uncle. Even Arad is somewhat convinced that something fishy is going on here and she's not talking about the planet Venus that hasn't been washed in a while down there. Regardless, Woleon is summoned by the elders, so he bids farewell for the moment while Haim, the redhead choker girl, sussy blushes after telling the two lovebirds she's going to prepare a bath for them. Now left alone to their own devices inside their new couple living space, they decide to stay quiet as they let their sussy senses take over them, even when an all-out war between both kingdoms rages on outside. However, as awkward silence fills the air, Heron catches a collapsing Ara due to her body hitting its maximum limit after the events that transpired within the mists of Mount Gurajem. Meanwhile, as Ara catches up on some well-needed Zs, the leaders of Freeborn Village are busy discussing what to do next after taking in two very high-profile members of both kingdoms. And with all-out anime war breaking out, Nilsini brings up whether or not it's time for them to finally pick a side, or will they continue hiding in the shadows avoiding everything as they have always done. Regardless, Nilseni is leaving the decision up to them, but she says it must be done quickly, since their territory will soon be revealed due to their borders collapsing faster than my ranked teammates' mentals. But she also mentions that it looks like fate is smiling upon them this time, as they have both the fox with the tightest ever papaya, and the wolf with the largest ever banana sword mankind has ever seen. Upon hearing Nelsoni mention Herring, Woolyung gets shocked at the revelation that Banana Boy happens to be Mokbum's son, not yet suspicious that Bro looks exactly like him. Now fast forward back to base camp the Crimson Foxes, Sealy is busy dispatching the Delta Forces on a mission to unravel everything about the special sussy gas the wolves are using.
Here, the Delta Squadrons can feel the pressure setting in, knowing full well that failing this mission of utmost importance will lead to the Fox's demise as they are the last hope of the Kingdom. The squads are then dismissed except the Thousand Step Squad, who are forced to watch all the other Foxes do the Ninja Body Flicker technique to instantly disappear into the horizon. Regardless, the squad gets shaken to the core upon discovering that Seelie is sending them on a separate mission to recover the first sword, as she believes Ira must still be alive. At the same time, Blondie gets singled out by the silver-haired beauty, where she orders her to come with her alone, causing her to be totally confused as to why she's the only one that doesn't get to go on their special mission. Luckily for Blondie though, Danby, like a true bestie, comes to the rescue and convinces Sully to send just her and Blondie to search for Ara, since both Tina and Hira have weapons too big for being sneaky. After completing her solid case to Sully, the Black Thorn leader begrudgingly accepts the proposition, so she ends up splitting the squad into two teams of two. However, there's a catch as Sully privately talks to Danby, where she orders her to keep an eye out on her bestie, while directly reporting on her in secret, as Sully is starting to suspect the master banana slurpee drinker. Now, I don't blame Sully for being suspicious of Blondie, since she was the one that actually tied the rope behind the rock right before Ora and Herring fell into the depths of Gurujam. Nonetheless, back to Freeborn Village, Ara is still having a hard to recovering since she apparently broke pretty much every bone in her body, but somehow she was still able to do some rice cake smashing the same night. Woyang also mentions that he can't believe that Herring somehow is left unscathed, so maybe it was his prince behemoth doing all the destruction. Regardless, Woyang advises the two be careful since it's looking like the queen of all simps is going to take at least one month to fully recover, so he's going to start applying some healing touch from now on. But right before Woolium is able to help her out, Ara stares at the two and tells them to leave, making an excuse that it's time for her to take a bath. And so the two wait outside, where Woolium reveals to Herring that Supia is only one of the many freeborn villages stuck in between the borders of the foxes and the wolves. But with the war, they will have to relocate soon, and one of their many problems includes how the Zoomers will have to go on a very long journey without their iPhones. Speaking of the Zoomers, they end up approaching and interrupt the two as they are eager to see the first sword of the foxes, only to be disappointed when they find out she's busy resting up because she has a fat bed onkadonk. Upon hearing Herring give them the bad news, one of them mentions how Herring sounds and looks exactly like the village chief, but no one has made the father-son connection yet. Anyways, with Herring now knowing that Woolyoung is actually the head of the village, you basically can't convince me that he's not the biological dad as there's too much sussy similarities going on. Nonetheless, as news spread within the Freeborn that Ara and Herring are now part of the group, the Boomers can't help themselves but gossip about how the two lovebirds came to be. Most are convinced that Herring was just a lucky boy who fell into Mount Gurujan with Ara, not aware that the Prince Behemoth has the largest ripe banana tree around. With the village Boomers distracted from all the rumors, Woolyoung takes the opportunity to talk to the two people assigned to keep watch on Ara and Herring. He then tells them to not get offended, but he's assigning two more guards to help them as they are all underestimating Herring, to which Woolyoung warns them not to focus all their energy on just Ara, as Herring is equally capable of destroying them. Woolyoung then bids them goodbye, letting them know he's about to take a nap as he's going to go on another adventure tonight. With the chief disappearing into the woods, the man wonders out loud where he's going to go this time since every time they try to follow him, they could never catch up. Regardless, with Woolyoung gone, the two fixate their eyes on Herring. Unable to believe that the village chief thinks this innocent-looking wolf can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ara, but these are the first two to get suspicious as they claim Bro looks too much like the chief. Now the real question is if Woolyoung is the real dad of Herring. Then does that mean Woolyoung is secretly hiding a massive battering ram? Meanwhile, back inside the lovebird's new house, Hwaim is busy helping Ara get into a nice warm bath where Hwaim tells her to call her anytime she needs her. Unfortunately for Huayim though, her words fall upon deaf ears as it looks like Era instantly slipped into her dream state after being exhausted all week thanks to the war and Herring's massive banana tree plantation. With Era now fast asleep, the first thing she dreams of is not Herring, but actually the king's simp Kareem, and let's just say she was busy thinking about some random octopus attacking every hole of her spaceship. Eventually, she snaps back awake when the octopus aggressively made sure her spaceship could not get some air, making her gasp for some air as it all felt too real. But the sussy turned table's turn as her octopus dream wasn't about fried calamari, instead, she thinks it's the world trying to tell her that Karim must still be alive if he's able to gank her in her dream state. Now if I was Herring, I'd be making sure Ara could only remember my banana tree exploding in her dreams, but apparently it looks like octopus is more of her style. Now this girl better not randomly pull a 180 and start falling for Kareem, because I'll be the first one to hand her over to the North Wind, since I'm Team Herring all the way. 
Anyways, after finishing her dream, Ara gets a random burst of energy to help her get outside to have a serious sit-down with Herring to talk about her dream. She then drops the Nagasaki on her boy, telling Herring how she knows for sure that his step-bro must still be alive. So now she's determined to head back to Gira Gym tonight. But before Ara leaves, she asks Herring why he chose to save her over his own comrade, since if the roles were switched, she would have picked the girl gang over him. Now I don't know why she's being such a menace right now, since Herring has done nothing wrong to catch all these random strays from her. Regardless, the Prince Behemoth does not mind her going crazy at all. So he activates his Riz Lord 9000 skills and replies by saying it's because he likes her. And just like that, all thanks to this smooth criminal, it looks like we won't have to turn on Ara as she ends up falling for our boy once again and rewards him by giving him a peck. Ara then apologizes to Herring, claiming that it's basically all her fault that they are stuck in a pickle, and that he suffered so much for being a simp for her. But Bro thinks it's all worth it. Suddenly, as the two cozy up to each other, Huayam and the hairy man catches a glimpse of the two lovebirds, making them wonder what got the legendary Ara to elope with Herang. At the same time, the people keeping an eye on the two end up joining Huayam and the hairy man to make a watch party, where they all end up getting curious to see if the first sword of the foxes really is as strong as her stories are foretold. However, the girls are a bit more curious about Herang now, and how some random boy was able to snag and dominate Ara, even if he is truly Mukbum's son. In the end, the four have decided to split the group in two, where the two guardians will watch the first sword, while the weaker patrol team looks after Herang. Meanwhile, in the central city of Jomu, the foxes have made an announcement forcing everyone on their spring break to head back to work as soon as possible, causing every fox throughout the kingdom to wonder what's really going on. Nevertheless, things are starting to get even more real now for the general populace, so hopefully they can protect their fresh papayas from the invading foreign bananas. At the same time, we get introduced to a mysterious lady who has a striking resemblance to Herring, who's busy being curious about how the frontier is holding up. She then meets up with a woman named Jerion who looks like she could easily beat you up one versus one, where she mentions how things are so serious now that she got called up to be a foot soldier. On the other hand, we discover that the mysterious lady is getting called up to headquarters since she has never had battle experience before. Fast forward to later on in the day, it's revealed that the girl's name is Harryong, and she happens to have been personally called up by Edo Naren to serve the foxes. Although it's been 10 years and Edo Naren now looks like a grandma, she compliments Harryong for being a timeless beauty since she's a fox after all. Nonetheless, Harryong joins in on the meeting where Naren explains to the top brass that the wolves' mysterious weapon seems to only work on number foxes. But the problem with the foxes is that they don't have enough boomers on their team, especially ones that were part of the Delta Forces. As such, Edomarin's plan is to slowly retreat and force the wolves to exhaust their energy, which could work since all the sussy wolves are busy partaking in rice cake smashing for the first time. Nevertheless, as Naren continues on planning with the oldies, one of the older officers come by to gang Harion to gossip about her past, since she apparently used to be the only lieutenant under the commander. However, the once feared tactical genius tells the old woman now is not the time to talk about the past, as she never imagined she'd ever come back like this. Anyways, Harion gets saved by the gossip girls by no other than Nurin herself, who promptly asks if she has time for a private conversation, causing some ladies from the room to take notice. After quickly finding a private room, the first thing out of Nurin's mouth is her revealing the fact that Harion apparently lost a child exactly 10 years ago. Regardless, after being a straight savage out of nowhere, Nurin sends Harion on a secret mission to retrieve the first swords, since the royal palace hasn't done anything. Furthermore, she specifically chose Harryong since her true identity is still kept secret, so she urges her to hurry as Naren already formed a small team for her. As such, Harryong accepts the mission knowing full well that finding the first sword is needed and is the key for the foxes to even have the slightest chances of being able to be victorious against the wolves. Mere seconds later, the turntables turn as Harryong walks into another room filled with her special small squad of which she's about to be the commander of, consisting of Jerion and two others. Much to Harryong's surprise though, not only does she see Jerian here, but also Sinarin as well, who happens to be the King Simp's own mother from a while back. After noticing Sinarin being chilling, Harryong quickly flies across the room to give Sinarin a heartfelt hug as it's been literally a decade since the two have seen each other. She then quickly interrogates her with tears of happiness running down her face after having heard that something happened to the northern region of where Naren used to live, but Naren replies by saying she's perfectly fine. Shortly after, we discover that the reason these two have a strong bond after all is not because they work together, but because they met after retiring due to both of them giving birth to sons instead of foxes. Regardless, after the big revelation and a quick high school reunion, Harion debriefs the entire squad by letting them know that their mission is to retrieve the one and only Ara. 
Now speak of the devil back in Freeborn Village, Ara is busy resting with Herring watching by her side until now, as Bro looks like he's about to head off on a mission himself. With nightfall and the moon already out, Wolyang is seen leaving the village but something feels different for him this time as he senses an unusual aura far behind him. Wolyang's sixth sense turns out to be impeccably correct as the prince behemoth randomly appears behind him after using the legendary Naruto body flicker technique. However, upon Herring wanting to join him on his trek to help out two injured wolves, Bro decides to try his best to leave him in the dust, so he teleports across the field and runs. As such, a bewildered Herring chases after Woolyum while yelling at him that if he wants to play tag, then he's totally down. But much to Herring's surprise, Woolyum is faster than Sonic the Hedgehog, so he has trouble keeping up as his own skills are no match compared to Woolyum's crazy speed demon abilities. Eventually, Herring looks like he's about to give up since Woolyum keeps toying with him by slowing down and speeding up again, so Bro starts to contemplate life after doing a Goku landing. However, Woolyong suddenly teleports right beside him to compliment a defeated Herring, telling him that he's impressed as no one has ever kept up with him for this long. The chief then pipes up and informs Herring that they just passed every single patrol officer stationed with in the area, so he finally invites Herring to join him to see the wolves. Fast forward a few hours later at an undisclosed hill, Maru the nerd gets surprised as he hears something rustling among the bushes since he wasn't expecting anyone to be coming by at this hour. Mere seconds later, Herring leaps out of the bushes aiming straight for Maru's arm like a romantic novel reunion with tears running down his face. Unfortunately for the emotional prince behemoth, he gets stopped in his tracks as Woolyum plucks him out from mid-air, cautiously warning Herring to be careful since Maru is injured. Nonetheless, after a quick heartfelt reunion with two former Delta Force members of the Wolves, Herring learns that the step bro King Simp is also with them. But he hasn't waken up yet, but he's not in the critical stage anymore. Regardless, Herring asks about how long as he wants to see the big bro to see if he's okay. But sadly, Maru informs him that he perished trying to save the boys since they didn't know the rope was around. After learning that the boys have been cut down to just the three of them now, a man who goes by the name of Mr. Chianduk appears out of nowhere and ganks Herring, totally surprised that he's still kicking. Bro then quickly pieces things together, so if Chinduk is here, then that means his father is here as well. So this whole area must have something to do with the secret lotus roots and water hyacinths. Meanwhile, we discover that Mook Bum and his gang are busy cosplaying a bunch of solid snakes while overlooking a ridge, but now they have to stop as they don't want to get discovered by sentries of the wolves. As the group watches on, they get surprised as the entire wolves' army look like they are bringing in unlimited amounts of captured foxes with them, and sadly, there's nothing they can do about it. However, on the other side of the ridge and much closer to the army itself, it's revealed that a bunch of Delta forces from the Crimson Foxes are perched up and ready to strike at any moment. Although every single one of them can take on more than a dozen by themselves, Seelie orders them to hold their urges as they can't destroy all the guards by themselves. Plus, they don't want to endanger any foxes. Seelie then tells them to focus on their main mission and to not get distracted, so they must find out everything they can about the mysterious fog and only then will they strike as hard as the Prince Behemoth during Rice Cake Destroying. Elsewhere, Miss Alita Battle Angel and the Blondie have finally found fresh tracks as they attempt to continue searching for the missing first sword. The two then quickly smile after realizing that if there's tracks here belonging to Ara, then there's a high chance she made it out alive from the fall into Mount Gurujim. It was at this very moment Hina realized that Blondie was the one that saved the boys in Ara by placing the rope when she was supposedly taking a dump longer than I do when I am on my phone. Nevertheless, Hina starts to cry as Biology won't deny that she's part of a rebel group against the royal family, totally hurt that she hid everything from everyone, including her own besties. As such, Blondie starts walking towards Hina, while confirming the fact that she is indeed a traitor to the foxes, but Hina is having none of it. Mere seconds later, Hina wipes away the tears of betrayal and activates her one-punch mode due to her loyalty to the Delta forces, so she goes for a direct hit on Blondie. However, Blondie quickly dodges and tells Hina to stop and to look behind her, as there seems to be some people coming their way through Mount Garajum's fog. As such, the two team up again like nothing ever happened to investigate further, as there's supposed to be no one here. But somehow, these coded figures all look like they come from the Nation of the Foxes. Eventually, Harryong removes her hood, causing much surprise to both Miss Alita Battle Angel and the Blondie, as they can't believe they are all women. Nonetheless, as they continue to watch on, Blondie turns around and takes the opportunity to tell Hina that she can ask her anything she wants, and she will answer truthfully. But for now, they need to keep watch as both of them want a Ra to still be alive and kicking.
With the mysterious group being revealed as the Grandma Special Task Force, they get surprised that someone was able to survive the fall and were able to leave behind battle marks all over. After closely inspecting everything, Harry Ong gets worried about her mentor after the King's Simp's mother does the A Thousand Yard Stare. She then starts questioning life like we all do sometimes and wonders if there's some ill intention in sending her in when the top brass must have known everything. Luckily for her, though, she's surrounded by a bunch of supportive women, so they try to cheer her up by claiming it's because she's super overpowered and competent, unlike most anime main characters you see nowadays. But unbeknownst to these girls, they don't know the King's Simp was one of the missing people that fell into Mount Gurijun. As such, she drops the bomb and informs everyone that Karim is her son, catching everyone by surprise, including Harriam. She then goes speechless as Naren explains to the group that the only reason she knows is because Karim visited her a couple days earlier. Eventually, a hopeful Harry Ong breaks the silence after Naren finished her story, quickly asking her what they talked about and how they knew at first sight, since it seems like Harry Ong secretly wants to find her long-lost child. Anyways, I'm expecting her to be Harry's mother since she continues to question Naren about how everything unfolded and how it feels to finally meet her son. Suddenly, the cougars get ganked from behind, but with their keen senses they inherited from the Hidden Leaf Village, they were able to instantly throw countermeasures to eviscerate the unseen threat. Luckily for Hina, though, she uses her body flicker technique to dodge last second, looking totally like an unfazed mag Me Too able to repel anything. With bows prime and ready to shoot again, Blondie and Miss Alita Battle Angel just plays it cool like a cucumber and apologizes for disturbing them and asks if they could chat for a second. But before anyone else could say anything, Harry Ong recognizes both Hina and Blondie, so she questions them for their reason being here when the thousand steps should be deployed on another assignment. So after getting their cover blown before they could even do anything, the two spill beans and offer to answer anything truthfully, as long as they can do the same. As such, Harry Ong reveals to them that they were sent on a mission to search for the first sword, causing her to offer both the girls to join in their search, since they have the same goal. Meanwhile back at the secret boys only hideout, we find Herring and Maru having a heart-to-heart -heart where it's revealed that Maru doesn't want to go back to the wolves after everything that has happened to them. They were scapegoated and used as bait, and with one less person in the squad, he doesn't want to lose any more after the wolves used their top secret mission as a weapon of mass destruction. But most of all, we all know he's a mega simp for Hina, so he ain't trying to destroy his one beloved rice cake. So he ends up telling Herring that he's joined up with Mookbum to make things right. The turntables then turn, but not the usual sussy way when Maru subtly asks him to join forces with the Lotus Roots, but Herring is indecisive like a girlfriend in whether or not he wants to join. Regardless, after some more sleeper dialogue with no action, Herring goes on a spiel about him, not joining because he would rather be Alpha King of the Wolves. Suddenly, all the King talk ends up making the actual King Simp wake up from his slumber after dreaming about Ara 24-7, catching the boys by total surprise, since Bro was supposed to be out cold for a while longer. Of course, the first words out of the Sleeping Beauty is Karim ignoring everyone and asking if his queen is still alive and kicking. After learning that Ara is still alive, Bro learns that one of the boys, ho Wong, has left the planet and entered the sussy dimension, causing him to instantly vow that he will make sure that he will personally get the Black Surang out of captivity. But when Kurim tries to get up after making his speech, he gets restrained by Herring and Maru, ordering him to rest so he could heal, but he tells them that there's no time, because there is zero chance the women will win and he's not being sexist. The three then get interrupted by one of Mukbum's men, who sides with Karim and explains that the North Wind is giving them no choice other than to be portrayed as animals but now they can choose another side and stop the war. Nevertheless, after some more Lotus Roots propaganda, Woolyoung steps in and informs the group that the foxes have finally started searching for the first sword, but the wolves don't care so this hideout should be fine for the moment. He then orders Karim to stop being a fake simp and to recover as fast as he can so he can be a true one while telling Herring to get ready. With Bolion heading out and ordering Herring to follow him back to Freeborn Village, Herring pulls off a Chad move and irks on Karim on a one versus one showdown for the throne. Loser becomes the guardian of the king, while the winner takes everything home including the glorious rice cakes of the prestigious Ara. After mentioning some plump bakeries, Herring hits Step Bro right where it matters, so we all know this guy isn't backing down anytime soon, and it's the perfect excuse for him to recover as fast as he can. Elsewhere, at Freeborn Village, Ara jolts herself awake after accidentally falling asleep, but it's too late since it's already morning, and she just basically slept the entire day away. Regardless, with a day wasted away, she looks for Herring only to find him fast asleep looking like he's making a body pillow out of his own sheets, but we all know who he's dreaming about. We think they teleported into Herring's dream, 
where it turns out that he's actually dreaming about becoming king, and it just so happens that Woolyum is there, telling him that there's someone he dearly misses as well. Seconds later, the sussy Fire Nation attacks his dream directly after mentioning to Woolyum that he misses a lot of people too, but they all happen to be girls so he ends up trying to take off his armor. It was at this very moment his dream became super spicy like how I like my soup, so Herring basically wants to be king so he can keep rice cake smashing all the girls and creating unlimited mini herrings. However, as he starts gripping Blondie in his dream, Bro wakes up with a Pikachu face when he realizes that he's indeed holding onto a real human and this time, it's none other than Ara herself. Unfortunately for our boy though, Bro gets caught in 4K dreaming about other girls since her senses were already tingling so the jig is up causing Ara to persistently ask him which girl he was dreaming of. But Bro is quick on his feet after realizing that the only reason she knew what was up was because his morning prince behemoth is currently stuck in between Ara's legs. So to avoid any more suspicion and to get the heat off of his back, Bro quickly changes the topic and drops the bomb by telling her that Commander Karim is still alive and intact. Success. His plan works in making Ara totally forget why she was angry in the first place so he starts telling her how he can barely move, so he's most likely going to need to take care of him. After alluding to the fact that he's going to be staying with the boys instead of here, saddened Ara gets up and makes the decision to head back to the foxes if she's going to stay here all by herself. But Herring is too big brain, so he ends up raising her up by claiming that if he stays any longer with her then he will never want to go back, since it's his dream after all to always be with her forever. Bro then continues yapping on and on, apologizing to her while saying it's his duty as a brother to help out the boys, but he wants her to stay here longer, until she fully recovers. Fortunately for Herring, his charm succeeds in capturing Ara's heart for this morning, so she agrees to stay because he's the man she has chosen as the one true king behemoth. Also, there's one condition for her to stay until she recovers, and that's for Herring to give her one last rice cake, smashing before he departs to chill with the boys. But before we get into some sussy action, we get teleported to another place where a bunch of arrows are raining upon a single lonely wolf trying to make his escape. Every single shot lands directly on him with perfect accuracy even when he's running 69 miles an hour so Bro goes tumbling across the floor like a world-class gymnast. With the bro unable to move and nowhere else to go, four mysterious rangers quickly close the gap and descend onto him with superhero-type entrances. But these ones are no superheroes after they end up tying the lonely wolf to a tree post where it's revealed it's actually Mr. Chinduk from earlier, busy running for his life. Unfortunately for the man who sided with Karim just yesterday, these crimson foxes have orders to figure out where the freeborn village is but he refuses to rat them out like a snitch. So with those foxes unable to retrieve any information from him after going all Guantanamo Bay on him, he gets dealt the American way and sent into the afterlife. One of the menaces then spits into the ground, frustrated that they don't have much time because they need to find it by today, so they go Naruto running to the next destination. Back at Freeborn Village, Wang shows up for her work shift in looking after Herring and Ara, but the two still need a little bit more time to recover. But jokes on them, Herring is already ready to go, and it's clear he's fully recovered because he's about to use his Prince Behemoth to destroy Era in more ways than one. So he warns her that if he enters then, it'll likely hurt, 